working together as a part of the CCI for over two years now. We have been doing this work as organizations, leaders, allies, and partners, facing issues as they arise, using opportunities to build on our efforts towards collective impact and change. But we wanted to do something together bigger than ourselves. We have built trust over the past two years, shared our work. Today, over 500 people from a across the America, across America are joining us to learn about the work we are doing and how we can do it together to build together. The challenges we face as a community in this space are vast. We are tra translating our representation and electoral prowess into policy change. We need growth and collaboration across community organizations. We want to keep our communities informed and engaged. We want to strengthen collaborative efforts to directly shape and influence the issues, policies, and impact we can make together. We need to understand our civic needs, strengthen connections, activate community voice, and co-create movement building strategies so we can make long-term cha change possible. We are honored to be here today with all of you. Lead policymakers, grassroots activists from across the nation as we tackle critiques for our MA. We have a packed agenda today and each session builds on the with a call about critical data on American Muslims that informs our work. They will set the stage for the conversation. We will delve into the importance of advocating for health equity for all Americans and policy and advocacy priorities for American Muslims in the healthcare field with AMP. AMP will lead us through a discussion on why it's crucial for us as a community to be accounted in decisions that impact healthcare access and how we are addressing gaps and potential future directions. Next, the coalition and partners will share how they are taking critical data on the most diverse faith community and building policy for all communities. Experts will discuss policy and execution of census, GOTV, impacting legislators, and building replicable systems in your own communities across the US. From advocating for our communities, Engage and Impact will shift the lens to discuss the rise of extremism, hate, and white supremacy for America as a whole and address action civil society we can take to address these real issues it, that we face. We want to explore human rights abroad and our nation's foreign policy with experts offering a dissection of the issues that exist in today's world and how we can address them moving forward. We have a packed agenda and a call to action. I, we invite your participation and we are ready to go. I will invite Dr. Ghada Khan to move us along through the logistics and housekeeping so we can start. Dr. Ghada has over 15 years of experience as a public health professional, researcher, and educator with a demonstrated history of working in government, nonprofit, and academia at state, federal, and international levels. She currently serves as the executive director of the American Muslim Health Professionals, a national non for profit focused on fostering collaboration between Muslim professionals from diverse sector of healthcare who are seeking to advance public health, social justice, and civic engagement with their other communities. Dr. Ghada? Thank you, Rima. Assalamu alaikum and welcome everyone. My name is Ghada Khan and I'm the Executive Director of American Muslim AMP. We're so excited and honored to have you all here uh, today for this collaborative effort. I would like to start by thanking our partner Mohsin for providing ASL interpretation throughout our event today. Uh, closed captioning will also be available throughout the day. So please turn, on, um, turn that on on your Zoom link uh, settings if you want access to this. You can also access closed captioning on Facebook if you are joining us on that realm. Uh, just click on the gear icon in the corner. 
We'd also like to know more about you. So please uh, don't forget to introduce yourself in the chat um, on Zoom or in the comment section on Facebook. We'd like to know more about you. Our program is divided into five one-hour sessions. This will be, uh, there will be room for Q&A in some of these sessions. So we invite you to include your questions in the Q&A box in Zoom. And if you're joining us on Facebook, you can include your questions in the comment section. Throughout the event, we'll also be sharing information about our speakers and the topics uh, that are gonna be covered within the chat. So make sure you keep checking that for very valuable information. We'll also have a half hour break for lunch or prayer um, at uh, 1230 p.m. Uh, EST. You don't need to leave the Zoom session for that time and we highly encourage you to remain connected. Um, and please make sure to come back promptly at 1 p.m. to join us for the rest of our program where we'll have the MPAC and MGAGE uh, sessions. Lastly, on behalf of the Community Collaborative Initiative, National uh, Pu uh, Public Policy and Advocacy Group, we'd like to thank you all and all our collaborative partners who are joining us virtually and in person today. We hope that this conference as a transformative and, in and intentional step towards strengthening. It is my pleasure now to hand this over to Dil Dilnaz Warek, uh, who is the president of the Warek uh, Family Fund and um, a collaborator for the Community Collaborative uh, Initiative. Uh, Dilnaz? Thank you so much, Gada. Can you guys hear me? I just wanna make sure, can everyone hear me? Thank you so much, Gada. I just wanted, can I get a thumbs up that you can hear me? Awesome. Um, so thank you so much to Rima and Gada for starting the program off today. I really appreciate it. I also just wanted to welcome everyone, um, all of you to this discussion, the National American Muslim Policy Conference. So just sit back and enjoy this day of learning. We have over 500 registered for today's learning um, community. So we will be meeting some new faces and we'll connect with some old friends, but enjoy the virtual and in-person learning community and carry these conversations on to your next learning space as well. So the values of the Ryage Family Fund are integrity, collaboration, urgency, and transparency. Over the past seven years, as the president of the Ryage Family Fund, I have found that there is a gap in funding in the Muslim-led nonprofits. The Ryage Family Fund wanted to be strategic and work with the fact that these nonprofits are creating a better America while dealing with the lack of funding innovation, time, creativity, and also Islamophobia. This is how we started working with the Indiana University Lilly School of Philanthropy to create the Community Collaboration Initiative, CCI. This is a three-year project focused on building and solidifying collaborations between Muslim American nonprofits and helping them build bridges with external organizations in 2020, CCI started, yep, right when COVID started as well, and it brought together 25 Muslim American nonprofits with a three-year collaboration in which the participants worked together to solve a common problem. CCI learned that these nonprofits had gaps in their infrastructure to engage with the larger community and through trust building between organizations, funding and leadership building, we can minimize this gap. In 2022, the groups worked on, I'm sorry, in 2020, the 25 groups that were a part of CCI, they worked on collaboration through trust. In 2021, the, work, the groups worked on collaboration through solving a project together. This is why we're here today. The public policy group did this convening. They worked all last year and they really solidified it to make this a virtual and in-person event for us here today. 
In 2021, CCI also worked with four other conveners to create something called the Year of Learning. It was better to understand the philanthropic community and how we can better learn and understand where funding is going. Please look in the chat box. There's going to be some information on CCI, the Year of Learning, and other pieces of information to help expand on what I'm also speaking about. In 2022, the CCI groups, which are currently working on this right now, are focusing on collaboration through sustainability. This was the information that we learned from the year of learning. And what we did is we took that information, we started building relationship, and we wanted open doors to the larger community for more funding and for more community and private foundations to better understand Muslim-led organizations. Inshallah, on October 1st, we are going to announce the first Muslim Collaboration Prizes winner. We have raised just about a million dollars for this Muslim Collaboration Prizes, and we are going to be announcing the winner of this um, collective effort in, on August 1st, and we, you'll learn more about that as well. In the Community Collaboration Initiative, the Public Policy Group was facilitated by Azhar Mithawala, and the group consists of the American Muslim Health Professionals, Institute for Social Policy and Understanding, Illinois Muslim Civic Coalition, Engage Action, and Muslim Public Affairs Council. Thank you to the five organizations in the Public Policy Group for having trust in this process and being resilient for the past two and a half years to follow through with co this collaborative effort. You have created a model of what collaborative discussions in the public policy world can look like. Through CCI, you've had regular conversations and you are now modeling what the next 10 years in the national American public policy arena can look like. So I challenge each of the five organizations I challenge you to continue this collaboration and have a an yearly convening to build on the Muslim American power that you have already strongly started today. I hope you can live up to that challenge because I know you can. In 2022, we started CCI with an African pro proverb that states, if you want to go fast, go alone. But if you want to go far, go together. This public policy group has led this charge and is modeling the path to success with strategic collaboration. We are here today, the Muslim American community and the larger community, to hear the Muslim American story from the Muslim American voices. I ask all of you in our audience members today to be curious, ask, ask questions of yourself, and ask questions of those of your colleagues around you. Today is going to be a day where you are going to better understand, number one, who are Muslim Americans? Number two, what challenges do Muslim Americans face? And number three, what meaningful ways through policies, leadership, and foundation funding can help overcome these challenges? We are here today to build connections and understanding to contemplate the ways in which our privilege and our access can create a better society through our respective expertise. Continue to be curious. Enjoy today's program. Love the collaboration of expert organizations and speakers coming together to share their insights within our community and our larger community. Thank you. And now I will introduce our first speaker. Dr. Dalia Mujahid. She is the director of the research of the Institute of Social Policy and Understanding, where she leads the organization's pioneering research and thought leadership programs on American Muslims. Dr. Mujahid is a former executive director of the Gallup Center for Muslim Studies, where she led the analysis of surveys of Muslim communities worldwide. With John L. Epstein, she co-authored the book, Who Speaks for Islam? What a Billion Muslims Really Think. President Barack Obama appointed Mujahid to the President's Advisory Council on Faith-Based and Neighborhood Partnership in 2009. 
She was invited to testify before the U.S. Senate Committee in Foreign Relations about U.S. engagement with Muslim communities. Her 2016 TED Talk was named one of the top TED Talks that year. She is a frequent expert and commentator in global media outlets and international forums. She is also the CEO of Mujahid Consulting. Welcome, Dr. Dalia Mujahid. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here. Uh, I, I'm, such a, I'm such a fan of um, Dr. Donaz and of the organizations that have come together to do this important work. Uh, I, as you just heard, I serve as the Director of Research at the Institute for Social Policy and Understanding. And this year, we are celebrating 20 years of informing the public and the American Muslim community on what's important to American Muslims. And it's in this, in, you know, in this spirit that I'm going to be presenting kind of the uh, foundational information that I hope that you will reference throughout the day to really ground our conversations in the facts. Next slide, please. So at the Institute for Social Policy and Understanding, our mission is to provide objective research and education about American Muslims in order to support well-informed dialogue and decision-making. And that's exactly what you all are doing all day today. We do two broad you know, areas of work at the Institute for Social Policy and Understanding. We do research and education that builds understanding and that strengthens communities. And you can learn more about our work and read all of our research free um, and open to the public at www.ispu.org. And I'm gonna go ahead and jump right in about who American Muslims are and what is important to us. First, it's important to understand that Muslims in America are the most ethnically diverse faith community by far um, of any other faith community we studied and uniquely have no majority race. There's uh, an, a pretty even breakdown of um, American Muslim uh, groups between um, people who identify as black or African-American, white, Asian, and Arab with African-Americans at 28% making up the plurality of American Muslims. 8% of American Muslims are also Latino. And, um, and then we have 5% who identify as other. It's also important to point out that one to 2% of American Muslims identify as Native American. Next slide. Next slide. Now, the other unique demographic uh, fact about American Muslims is our youth, is our young people, and the fact that they make up nearly a quarter of our community. And when I say young people, I mean 18 to 24. That obviously uh, could be even more than uh, even larger age range than that. But even if we just define it as 18 to 24, it's a quarter of our community far more than a far larger share than any other faith community. Next slide. Now in terms of immigration uh, status, a half of American Muslims were born in the United States and half were natural, a half were born outside the United States with the majority of American Muslims being US citizens, 86%. So this really tells us that uh, it's not accurate to talk about American Muslims as immigrants and only immigrants, but immigration is still very, very much part of the American Muslim narrative. Next slide. Now, we often uh, talk about American Muslims in terms of a model minority um, narrative, and it's important to understand that while many American Muslims are uh, you know, working very highly paid professional jobs. We also have a, an important share of our community that are really struggling economically. So nearly, a, actually slightly over a third of American Muslims uh, are making just at or just above the poverty line 
um, and more likely to be in that category than any other faith community. So poverty is also a part of our story and that needs to be addressed as well. Next slide. Now, what's important? What's important to American Muslims? According to our 2020 poll, um, this is a nationally representative survey of the American Muslim community. Our top priorities are healthcare, the economy, as well as social justice causes. Next slide. Speaking of social justice, I'd like to share with you some of the information that we've gathered on Islamophobia and why it's a threat to every single American, not just Muslims. Next slide. So we've designed something called the Islamophobia Index, and it's a measure of the level at which the public endorses anti-Muslim stereotypes. And these specific stereotypes that we're measuring are ones where um, other research outside of ISPU actually has found that when people endorse these specific stereotypes or tropes, they are more likely to also accept or endorse anti-Muslim policies. So what's really unique about these stereotypes is that they are linked to bad policies, to the public accepting and endorsing and consenting to bad policies. So please go back to the previous slide. The, uh, the Islamophobia index um, is from zero to 100, uh, you know, ranges from zero to 100. And, um, and we measure it every single year um, among different faith groups. Now in 2020, what we found is that among the Jewish community, that index score was 16. Among the Muslim community, it was 20. Non-affiliated was 21, the general public 27, and then you have Catholics and Protestants very similar to each other, 29 and 30, and then the highest white evangelicals. And that has always been the case ever since we started measuring. Now, one thing I do wanna point out is that Muslims themselves are not immune to endorsing anti-Muslim stereotypes. In fact, slightly higher than the Jewish community in 2020, which I think will surprise a lot of people. So there is an issue with anti-Muslim sentiment in the Muslim community. And I think we've ignored that as a concept um, for far too long. So next slide, please. So why should you care about Islamophobia if you aren't impacted by it yourself? I said it was a threat to every single American. The reason it's important to be worried about Islamophobia other than just caring for your Muslim neighbor is because it's bad for democracy and it's bad for security. Um, a higher Islamophobia index is linked to greater public acceptance of military targeting of civilians. It's also linked to a greater acceptance of individual targeting of civilians. Um, so endorsing Islamophobia is linked to being more likely to endorse violence. Uh, against innocent people. It's also linked to greater acceptance of authoritarian attitudes like suspending checks and balances and limiting freedom of the press in the wake of a terrorist attack. And unsurprisingly, it's also you know, linked to greater support for discriminatory policies against Muslims themselves such as the Muslim ban and surveillance of mosques. Now, that last one isn't surprising. We expect that if you endorse anti-Muslim you know, stereotypes, you might also agree with anti-Muslim policies. But what I think is a little more surprising and perhaps not something that people automatically realize is that it's bad for democracy. It's bad for our freedom as a people because it is fueled by fear and fear kills freedom. So Islamophobia is bad for democracy and security. Next slide. Now, what predicts Islamophobia in terms of you know, demographics? A lot of times people think that it is about religious affiliation. Now, I, I mentioned that year after year, white evangelicals come out you know, as, as having the highest Islamophobia index. But interestingly, when you account for 
um, all other demographics, religious affiliation actually is not significant. It does not predict being, you know, having a higher Islamophobia index. Um, now, let me start with what does predict it and then, and then tell you what doesn't. For Muslims, it, interestingly, and we have to dig into this so much more, experiencing religious discrimination makes Muslims more likely to endorse anti-Muslim stereotypes. Now, I think we have a lot of mental health professionals in the audience. Maybe they can you know, give us some insights why that might be. Uh, I think it's fascinating. Now for the general public, the, the factors may not be as surprising. Being very conservative is, is one, it's more political affiliation. So political affiliation predicts Islamophobia, not um, religious affiliation. So, you know, identifying as a Republican, identifying as a conservative, um, having lower education, actually even having lower income and experiencing religious discrimination in, when you're not a Muslim actually also um, is linked to anti-Muslim sentiment and then being older. What does not matter, what is not significant is your race, your religiosity, if you're devoted to your faith or what faith you, you are devoted to. And for Muslims as well, None of those things matter. Next slide, please. Next slide, please. Thank you. So what kind of discrimination are Muslims experiencing? Muslims are more likely than other faith communities to report having experienced interpersonal religious discrimination. You know, religious discrimination that you might have, you know, from your fellow workers or school students, um, discrimination in just, you know, randomly from a stranger in a cafe, school, and even interacting with family and friends is, is a possibility. So next slide, please. Next slide, please. Um, I'm not sure what happened to our um, PowerPoint. Let's see if we're going to get it back or if I should just. Okay. I think we were just about to start. Um, yep, that's the slide we ended on. And then if we could go to the next one, we're almost done. Thank you. So as I said, Muslims are more likely than other faith communities in America to experience interpersonal um, discrimination because of their faith. But where they really stand out is that they are far more likely to experience institutional religious discrimination. At the airport, when applying for a job, interacting with law enforcement, or even receiving healthcare. Next slide. And unfortunately, it isn't limited to adults. 51% um, of Muslim families say that their child has been bullied because of their faith if they um, are in school. Um, and that compares to 27% of the general public. So, you know, nearly twice as likely to be bullied because of their faith. Next slide. Now, what's really alarming for me as a parent is that one out of three of the reported cases of religious-based bullying of Muslim kids involved a teacher or an administrator as the bully. And that really um, you know, opens the door for conversations about better training and accountability. Next slide. 
Now, how have Muslims responded to some of these challenges? They responded with greater civic engagement and solidarity with other targeted communities. Next slide. First, you know, we always hear about um, Muslim, you know, registration to vote might be slightly lower than other faith communities, but where Muslims really actually stand out in the, is in the deeper engagement with their um, elected officials. So Muslims among the most likely to attend a town hall meeting. Next slide. Muslims and Jews are the most likely communities to volunteer in a political campaign, far more likely than Catholics or Protestants. Next slide. Um, if you could just go one one back. Um, so what what the slide you're going to you're about to see loading will will tell you is that american muslims are the most likely faith community to support black lives matter now it's important to obviously remind you that the plurality of american muslims are black so it's not like these are two separate you know communities by any means there's an overlap uh, however i will just also add that asian muslims for example are as likely as Black Muslims to support Black Lives Matter. And women, just Muslim women of all backgrounds are as likely as Muslims and non-Muslims who identify as Black to support Black Lives Matter. So this is something that has really come out in our data over and over is um, whether, you know, this is obviously not something that we've solved on the ground, but compared to other faith communities, Muslims are the most likely group to over and over express a support for racial equity in the United States. And I think that's something we can build on. I'm not sure if we're gonna get our, um, our PowerPoint back, but it might just be a good time to uh, switch over to our panel, um, just because I think there's been some challenges. Great. Thank you so much. And I'm, I'm so excited to uh, introduce our panel to you. All three of our panelists really need no introduction, um, but I will, I will just kind of uh, give you an overview of their incredibly impressive background. I'll start with Linda Sarsour, um, needs no introduction, but Linda is an author, award-winning racial justice and civil rights activist, seasoned community organizer, and mother of three. Ambitious, outspoken, and independent, Linda shatters stereotypes of Muslim women while also treasuring her religious and ethnic heritage. She is a Palestinian Muslim American and a self-proclaimed pure New Yorker born and raised in Brooklyn. And there's a lot more to Linda than what I just read, but I, I want to conserve time so we can actually hear from her. We're also going to be hearing from Mayor Abdullah Hamoud, the son, the proud son of immigrant parents. Mayor Abdullah Hamoud has been an unwavering advocate for his hometown of Dearborn for more than a decade. Now, as mayor, he is committed to reinventing government to deliver results for working families and residents in every corner of the city. Throughout his career, Mayor Hamoud has provided bold leadership for Michigan and Dearborn with a thoughtful, pragmatic approach to government that puts people first. And then Abrar Omesh currently serves as an at-large school board member in Fairfax County, overseeing a budget of over 
$3 billion for 1.1 million constituents in the nation's 10th largest school division, of which one is my son. So very grateful to Abra's service. She's the first Libyan ever elected in US history and the youngest woman, as well as the first Arab or Muslim woman ever elected in Virginia, earning over 161,000 votes and coming in first among non-incumbents in a six-way race. She is also the first Muslim and youngest ever elected in her role. Abrar's journey in education leadership started when she co-founded a student-led, student-run nonprofit organization that continues to provide thousands of underprivileged youth with free tutoring and mentorship across 20 locations over the past 10 years. And again, much more to Abrar than that, but um, we will stop there and you can learn more about them at their respective websites. So uh, are, are we able to bring on our panelists? Okay, I'm, I'm sorry, I'm, I'm not seeing them. I'm just seeing um, the uh, posters. So I think if we could stop sharing the screen or stop sharing the, the PowerPoint, I think that would be easier so that we can see the full beautiful faces of everyone we're talking to. Great, thank you. Linda, um, I'm gonna start with you. First of all, welcome and thank you so much for taking time out of your busy schedule to be with us today. Uh, it's always great to see you. Um, you know, it's so funny, my question to you, I wrote <laughs> before I saw your Facebook post about being so tired of being resilient. And yet here you are so resilient. Um, you know, we've learned about Islamophobia in this country and what it can lead to in terms of discrimination and even violence. And we've even seen, you know, we've also seen research about how American Muslims are responding to some of this with resilience and solidarity with other targeted groups. And as tiring as it is, and I, I hear you, I hear you sister about that. I think you do embody the spirit more than anyone I know. Uh, please talk to us about resilience and the significance of this moment when it comes to social justice. Thank you so much, Dalia. Assalamu alaikum uh, to all my colleagues here. Mayor Abdullah Hamoud, um, getting to watch your journey has been extremely inspiring for me. And Sister Abrad, we got your back and we appreciate you and all of your leadership. And to ISPU, um, you are part of the progress of our community, being able to understand and contextualize our work in social justice and the studies and research that you do has really given us the tools that we need to be able to tell our story and make our case to philanthropy, make our cases to our partners to include Muslim Americans and Muslim communities in their issues. You know, I will say that um, our community uh, makes me proud every day. Um, and for, for folks who are exhausted by our community, because my community exhausts me too. Um, so it's not just wor the world exhausts me, the Muslims exhaust me too. But even amidst that exhaustion, we have seen so much progress and the progress has come at the hands of the young people of our community, the young adults in our community, our college students, the women leadership in our community that has really figured out how to operate and engage in a country where we see our liberation and rights tied to other people, to other marginalized people. And I think why we've seen so much progress over the years, and as you um, stated, Dalia, around the kind of um, the, the increase in support, for example, for a movement like Black Lives Matter, that is because of the work of Muslim organizers, um, and Muslims who have took it upon themselves to be part, not just to go to a rally, but to really be part of the strategic responses, um, legislative advocacy around racial justice, criminal justice issues, making the connections between our immigration detention centers that have heavily impacted our immigrant Muslim communities, the incarceration system that actually also impacts our Muslim communities, seeing thing, uh, legislations around uh, strengthening hate crime legislation and seeing the plethora of a coalition that we could put together. I think for me, 
my resilience comes from my allies and from those that I have built solidarity with um, over the years. It has come from leadership in the Muslim community who has realized all of a sudden, which they should have probably 50 years ago, or maybe 100 years ago, maybe more than that, um, that living in a country like the United States of America, you cannot fight for Muslim Americans alone. You cannot fight for our Muslim communities alone. There's no fight that you could have around education, around immigration, around health care, around women's issues. There's no way that you can say, I am a Muslim leader, I am a Muslim organization, and I can only fight, and I will only fight for Muslims. I think we have become much more sophisticated and also really much, for me personally, it's not even a, a, a matter of sophistication. It's a matter of understanding that we really are all in this together. And I remember that, you know, ISPU has done research prior to this that really created kind of a map to show us that the same people that do anti-Sharia legislation are the same people who are uh, unequivocally pro-law enforcement and will block any kind of police reform legislation, are going to put forth anti-immigration, anti-refugee uh, legislation, anti-reproductive rights. I mean, it's all, they, they have a plan. And the plan is to marginalize those of us who are already marginalized in this country. And so in order for us to continue the progress that we've seen in our communities is to understand that, understand that in that context. And that brings me to the, 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 the understanding of everybody's role, you know, um, Dalia's role is to do research, is to make sure that we have the tools and the contextualization and how we and why our community is showing up for certain issues and not others and how we engage and the level of engagement. That's Dalia's job. Um, mayor Abdullah's job is he's a mayor. He is to lead his city, right? He is to ensure that all the residents of his city have all access and the things that they need to thrive. You know, Abrar is his role as an elected official is to ensure that all students um, in her district are able to thrive, are able to have access to a high quality public education. Um, I'm an activist and an organizer. I'm not a theologian. I'm not a scholar of Islam. I am an organizer. I organize people to do the right thing. I organize people to stand up with the most marginalized. I organize people to advocate. And I think for me, that's what gives me my resilience. My resilience is knowing what my role is. My resilience is knowing that I can compel people uh, to stand up for those who are marginalized. Um, you know, my resilience also comes from my faith. Um, and that's why, you know, when we're doing this work and Abdullah knows this, Abrar knows this, we're not going to impress everybody. And unfortunately, people think that to be a leader um, and to organize our Muslim community, it is about impressing every Muslim. Um, that's not my role. My role is to, um, inshallah, be doing the right thing to, and in, in, in hopefully, you know, have my Lord's approval in the work that I, that I do. And that's what gives me resilience. I, I don't work for the Muslim community. I work to ensure that our Muslim community uh, lives in this country with dignity, um, that our women can go into any spaces in this country and feel safe, um, that our children have access to high quality public education, that no Muslim dies in America because they don't have access to health care, um, and that immigrants who come to this country are welcomed and that they are respected um, and that you are able to, you know, whatever is left of it, um, be, have access to this uh, American dream um, that has been promised to all of us and was promised to our families. And so I, I ask and I say this to all of you who are here today, and especially if you are college students or other folks that are kind of thinking about how you want to get into this work, the time is now. Um, every year, I feel like I say that this is the, the year to be involved. Um, unfortunately, it gets worse from here. It's never been about you know who's in the White House. And I think we sometimes in the Muslim community uh, ended up being in a space where we were swimming in this Donald Trump, you know, conversation and narrative. It was never about Donald Trump. You know, racial inequity has existed in this nation since the days of its founding. Discrimination against Muslims has existed for decades, um, and of course, heightened after the horrific attacks of 9/11. Uh, the fight for women's rights in this country has exceeded over 50 years. You know, the the fight for um, you know just the sanctity of Black life has been in this lands for 400 years. So the fights that we're having the, around healthcare. 
um, around just infrastructure, around eradicating poverty in America. These are not new fights. They didn't start with Republicans. They don't end with Republicans. They don't end with who we believe is our opposition. These are long time fights um, and which requires us as a Muslim community to be in it for the long haul and to understand that our wins are not gonna be tomorrow and they're not gonna maybe be next week. They might be five years from now, they might be 20 years from now. They might be even uh, at a time when some of us are no longer here. And I think the question for our community and as we think about resilience is wh whether we're willing to put in the work now, even though we may not see the fruits of our labor. And I always think about that. I always think about that there is gonna become a time where we will win. Uh, we will win on foreign policy issues. We will win on, you know, seeing even more Muslims in elected office in the highest offices of this land. We will we will see wins on getting health care for everyone and making sure everyone has access to higher education. And I'm okay with not being here to witness that, um, knowing that at least we, as a Muslim community, as Muslim leaders and organizers, at least are putting in the work now for what we believe will be generations of Muslims to come uh, to to benefit from that. And I will say, and all of you know this, this is not a secret, um, you know, I, I will say I'm probably in our Muslim community probably have been the most attacked Muslim leader, um, at least in the last, you know, 10 years. Um, and I will say that it's not, it doesn't just come from, you know, the, what we believe is the opposition, you know, everyone's like, oh, the right wing, the white supremacist, the right wing Zionist. Yeah, those are on the list as well. But it also comes from liberals and neoliberals um, and people who even who we believe are part of our movement, who still don't understand us as Muslims, who don't understand our beliefs as Muslims, um, who sometimes don't know how to welcome a Muslim woman in a hijab um, in a larger kind of what, what, you know, Western feminist kind of movement in this country. So we get backlash also from folks who are uh, perceived to be part of our movements or people who perceive to care about refugees and immigrants and, and Muslim communities. And so I wanna put that on the table. I also get you know, attacked by our own Muslim community, people who don't understand what our role is as Americans in these United States of America, that we live in a pluralistic society, in a society that where Muslims are just one group amongst many groups um, who are fighting for civil rights and equal rights in these United States of America. And I am um, I'm proud and unapologetic about being an organizer that organizes around this concept of civil and human rights. Um, that's, the, that's, the, that's the foundation of organizing in the United States of America. Of course, our faith plays an important role in the ways in which we fight, in the ways in which we center our, our beliefs. But at the end of the day, violence against any community will lead to violence against other communities. And so we, I will unequivocally never stand down um, uh, if, if I see any group of people who are being attacked in these United States of America, because I know that the safety of others will lead to the safety of our Muslim communities. And so I thank um, ISPU for the work that they do. Um, I hope people continue to support their work um, and understand how important it is. Sometimes people think it's just reports, but these reports have been fundamental to the ways in which we are able to talk about our community in professional ways and the ways we are able to make the case for our communities amongst philanthropy, amongst elected officials, am around legislative policy priorities that we have. And so I appreciate um, Dalia and her leadership in the space. And I appreciate you, um, Mayor Abdullah, you know, for being you know, young um, and taking a risk, um, even when a lot of people, even in our Muslim community told you, you are not ready. Um, they told you that you know, your time was not now. Um, but your time was always um, the right time, um, the time to have a young, brilliant, charismatic leader like you. So I want to say congratulations to you once again, even though you've been there for a little while. Um, and to say that I only see it go higher from here. And to Sister Abrar, I just want you to know that you are an incredible leader um, and you've been through a lot. Um, and you know, you've, you've got to experience many of the things that some other leaders in our community, including myself, have experienced. And then you are resilience um, manifested. And so I hope that you know that we as a community got your back um, and we appreciate all the work that you do. And thank you for um, Dalia and ISPU and all the organizations here today for bringing us together um, on this wonderful Tuesday. Thank you so much, Linda. Um, and I uh, appreciate so much the kind words you just shared about ISPU. I do hope that the data that we just shared does get referenced and, and becomes really the foundation for our work because it's, it's incredibly powerful to, um, to just to center evidence in, in the way that we build strategy. So now I'm gonna uh, turn to you, Mayor Hamoud, 
you know, as a mayor of, as the mayor of Dearborn, um, a city that is famously uh, home to a large Arab and Muslim community, and, and is one of the youngest American Muslims ever to be elected to office. I'd love to hear what inspired you to run for office and how do you think your experience reflects a new generation of American Muslims? First and foremost, good morning, wassalamu alaikum. Uh, thank you so much for having me. Um, Sister Abrar, Sister Linda, I mean, you guys put me on a panel where no matter what I say, I'm not gonna meet the, uh, meet the bar. Um, I think uh, uh, before I also say that, whoever created that PowerPoint slide, uh, the, the brochure and put the angry picture of me, uh, I think I lived up to every angry Muslim man trope in that headshot. And so may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala forgive you for using that photo. Um, and secondly, Sister Linda, Sister and myself, both, both born on March 19th. So I don't know if there's something about March 19th babies um, and causing trouble, but I think there's, there's something special about that day. You know, what inspired me to run for office, it's a strange journey, uh, you know, not too different from, than many uh, uh, Muslim Americans who grew up as a, as a son of immigrants. Your parents always expected you to be that doctor, that lawyer, that engineer. And I aspire to be. Um, but unfortunately, uh, or fortunately, I should say, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala had different plans. Uh, you know, I grew up in a very working poor family. Uh, lived in 12 different homes by the age of 14. And my parents always uh, taught me that education would be my pathway to success, something that I was good at, but two parents who never had anything more than a high school education. Um, on that pathway to success, my friends and I, we had coined this term before Drake ever came out in the hip hop scene. It was six figures by 26. We wanted to achieve financial stability. It wasn't about being money hungry. It was children who grew up uh, having to stress over the bills that came into the mail. Uh, by 25, I had landed that six-figure interview. Uh, but um, during that interview process, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala called for my older brother, uh, Haj Ali al-Marhum Haj Ali al And when he was called away, uh, in the months that followed, I received a packet in the mail, about 50 pages. And it was about all, from all the people that he worked with and how he impacted their lives. And my brother Ali was 27 years young when he passed. And when I received that packet in the mail, um, I, I stepped away from the corporate world and I decided that I wanted to be what my brother was to me and to others for the rest of my community. And so I decided to step into public service and do my best to give back to try to improve the quality of life of others. Um, and so, you know, my brother passed away October 15th, 2015. And three months later in January, I had announced my first run for public office for state representative. Never, uh, never planned, never expected. Um, but as they say, you know, you plan, but he plans and he is the ultimate of planners. Um, you know, what, what I think is happening and what's important to also note is we oftentimes have this habit of celebrating firsts and it's great. There's certainly something to be celebrated and lauded about being the first, about shattering that, you know, that first idea of who can be a public servant, who can be an elected official, who can be, you know, and plug in that position. But I think what we have to understand is, you know, real true success is not in being the first. I think true success is in not being the last. You know, there's no, there's nothing great about being the first. And then once you step out of the office, no other Muslim comes after you. Um, I think what we want to do is assume office and demonstrate that we can lead uh, as good, if not better than any other individual from any demographic or religion that came before us. And in that demonstration of success, you truly then begin to open up the pathway, the pathways that next time somebody runs with a name like Abrar or Linda or Abdullah, um, it's, it's a little bit more familiar and it's not as strange. And you can point to examples of success and hopefully therefore uh, ensure that you're no longer the last in that situation. I think that's, that's the ultimate measure, ultimate measure of success. Amongst young people, what we're seeing now is just really this, this uh, uh, a number of young people not only getting involved in running for office, but being the ones who are also running the campaigns. We have Muslim American campaign managers and political strategists and activists and, uh, and researchers and, and, and folks who are now in the main media stream who are speaking to the narrative of the broader Muslim community. Um, and I think what's beautiful is, you know, it, it's taken us a while to get here and hopefully our parents are understanding that we don't have to be an engineer to be successful, uh, that we can uh, enter these other, uh, these other, these other spaces um, and the success that we achieve in those spaces is equally, if not uh, more important than just being the just being in those traditional uh, pathways. Um, and, and I think that's the proliferation that we're seeing. Um, I see young people all across the country uh, participating, running for office, even if you're not successful when it comes down to the ballots counted at the end of the night. 
success is not purely measured as did you win an election or not. Um, it's measured in did you were you able to uh, change perceptions. Were you able to, um, you know, maybe make the pathway easier for someone to come after you, for generations to come uh, after you? Um, and uh, it's it's really inspiring to see. You know, I, you know, strange for me to say, like, yes, I, I look at young people, you know, regardless of you know me being considered young, um, but there's a generation after us who I am uh, so inspired by, um, and I have so much hope for. And for those who don't know, you know, I'm a new father to a six-month-old uh, baby, Maryam Hamoud. And, uh, you know, the aspirations I have for her, you know, the decision making that I that I do that I have right now in this city is about ensuring that someone like Maryam uh, has far more opportunity than I did in the post 9-11 era growing up here in the city of Dearborn. Um, and that gives me all the hope in the world and the drive so that even when you have opposition from members of our own community or from others uh, outside of the community for 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 no good reason, um, that's the drive that keeps me moving forward. And inshallah, you know, we're, we're all successful together in that endeavor. Thank you so much, um, Hamoud, Mayor Hamoud. I, I love your story and what a beautiful way, what an inspiring way to honor your brother's legacy and congratulations on your new baby. Thank you so much. <laughs> Abrar, um, talking about the next generation, you know, we just heard from the presentation that bullying is a problem for Muslim students and um, you know, more than any other faith community in terms of religious-based bullying. And that shockingly one in three of the bullying incidents involve a teacher. We also know that 65% of Muslim families send their children to public school. So the, the majority. And you as a public school board member can you help our audience understand what Muslim parents and really any parent needs to know about their children's education and advocating for them, you know, to make sure that they are safe and are learning um, what they need for their, for their future. And, and then not only what parents can do, but what the broader community should be doing better to support our next generation's education. Absolutely. Thank you, Dalia. Um, it's, it's great to be here with uh, the likes of Linda and Abdullah, uh, of course, um, but really a pleasure to be with the research community, a community that's seeking to use evidence and data to inform the direction of where we're headed. Um, so peace be on to all of you. Uh, I want to start off just with a couple of reframing uh, thoughts. And, and, and what I mean by that is, you know, when it comes to education, um, or school boards, you know, we kind of think of it as this marginal, low, uh, kind of lower ranking um, elected office um, or space for us to be involved in. We think more on the national level, we think of foreign policy, perhaps, we think of Congress, uh, but really the starting point uh, and the foundation of where some of these conversations are, are, are happening and where they're kind of uh, percolating from is the school board. And we saw that more than ever over the past two years uh, with the, the masking and the, and the vaccine debates. Uh, and now, unfortunately, some of the, you know, I hate to label it this way, but cultural wars that are happening across our country and the challenges of the divides, racial divides and things related to gender identity and whatnot, all of which are, are starting in the, in the classroom with conversations uh, kids are having and then ultimately reflecting themselves in the politics of education. Um, so, and, 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 you know, some public, like national public uh, um, political uh, entities have recognized that and have started investing and pouring money into lobbying in these spaces. Um, so I, I offer that to, to shift the way we think about where influence lies and the importance of engaging and being active in these spaces. The other thing I want to offer is, you know, we tend to, uh, Abdullah touched on how that being a first is not, uh, you know, uh, necessarily how we want to think about things. I'm going to add to that and say it's not all glamorous either. Uh, and that means that there's a lot of grunt work and, and, and effort and time and investment that goes into the most basic of shifts that we can get to. Uh, and so my broader point there is it's not going to take one person to change it. It's not going to take uh, even a small handful, but, but it's a cultural transformation that we're seeking. Uh, you mentioned two specific things in your comments. You said you know, that one, uh, one in three of these Islamophobic offenses is from teachers. And so that points to us, there is a systemic problem beyond just a cultural Islamophobic problem that we know is already there. 
Um, and you also touched on earlier that Islamophobia is internalized, that, that you know, the Muslim community significantly sees themselves in the same way and advances those tropes. So those are things we have to challenge in thinking about how do we create a wave, not one person, not a couple of people, but a wave that is shifting a mentality on a local level in our communities. Uh, and there are very intentional ways to do that, which I'll speak to in just a second. Um, but the other piece, you know, in thinking about uh, the broader activism space is finding our own space as Muslim Americans where, frankly, the conservatives and the liberals won't entirely embrace us and we don't seem to fit fully in either of those camps. Uh, so then how do we lead through compassion in building that wave and coalitions in authentic and honest ways uh, that will advance uh, uh, the broader uh, perspective that we have to share? Um, the other piece I wanted to kind of challenge us on how we think about this is, you know, sometimes we think that bringing change on the school board level or on the on the school system level is uh, it takes national efforts, it takes millions of dollars, it takes a massive organization. Uh, but really, some of the most effective efforts, especially on the local level, where not as many people are paying attention, it's a small but persistent group. Uh, I, literally, I, I you know there are live examples that I've seen where a single person just because they show up all the time, just because they've built relationships with those in power, there is an emotional coercion that goes on to pass things in ways that have, have completely shifted the narrative around certain identity groups and, and, and their belonging. Um, so that's an example we can follow uh, in thinking about how do we cultivate a culture within our school systems that is healthy and productive and helps Muslim kids thrive. Uh, and all kids really when we combat the bullying issue and the idea of inclusion. Uh, but we tend to have, this is another one of my framing points, is um, that we have our own internal barriers to that. We fail to imagine our entitlement in these spaces. Uh, some communities will show up and, and they fully expect that you will change based on what they have to say and they will not go away until you do because they recognize that they're actually stakeholders of these institutions, that public institutions that we're paying for with our tax dollars uh, have you know an obligation to serve us in the ways that we expect and that uh, don't cause us harm. Um, but we perhaps approach this by you know accepting the fact that our community that the world is Islamophobic, accepting the fact that uh, you know uh, it's normal that on 9/11 people will say very harmful things and that your own teacher will show you videos that reinforce Islamophobia in school in the school environment. Uh, but if, if we kind of just take a few steps back and realize there's nothing normal about that uh, and that we should show up with that same level of entitlement and organization uh, uh, to, to insist that we see better. So what does that look like on the ground? Um, you know, the, in education, we're, it's, a, it's a more friendly space because there is space already carved out. There are frames that we can lean into. For example, the broader movement on equity and inclusion in education. That's a space for us to be uh, to, to enter where not everyone thinks about Muslims when they speak about you know DEI and all that work that's happening across the country, but we can create that space within a broader effort that's already existing. The mental health conversation, connecting the dots for people where a student be, being bullied because of their identity, not having equity inclusion, in fact, impacts their mental health, which does not allow them to show up for school. And that is part of education's mission. Uh, that is a failure of the educational institution if it's not cultivating a space that allows for the learning or creates the space for the learning to be possible. Um, so those are, those are some of the ways that we can you know, build coalition and enter frames that already exist. For example, there was the national movement from the National Education Association, which is uh, one of the largest, I mean, it is the largest education association in the country, in some states as a union, um, the, the teach truth movement, hashtag teach truth, right? And that largely came out of Cult, creating a narrative of it's not wrong to teach our history, all the craze around critical race theory and the confusion meant to demonize basically uh, teaching, you know, truth about our history uh, was an, an opportunity for us to also sh begin sharing our side and our perspective and, and fall into that broader coalition of teaching truth that then creates a, a more uh, inclusive and representative environment for Muslim kids in the classroom. Um, so that's an example, you know, and, and ultimately what does that take? It takes persistent voices that are willing to put in the work. We have to begin developing model guidance on the level of institutions uh, that school systems uh, and, and other similar institutions can adopt and can refer to because we have counterparts who are doing that very uh, work 
uh, and bringing that forward on the local level to say these are the resources that we want you know to, to push forward um, we have to be building our own local power through for example ptas you know to give our community a little bit of credit there are a lot of muslim parents who are involved in these institutions who are involved in ptas and, and who show up for their kids but there, there isn't necessarily a strategic vision of how that might influence uh, uh, pre points of power, like pressure points of power. Uh, so for example, when you know you have a lot of uh, different Muslim PTA presidents, but there's not that coordination that says, you know what, we're gonna target those decision makers and we're gonna make sure we maintain a relationship with those holding power and wielding that power. Um, so th those are connecting the dots, I think of where we are as a community, where we've progressed, but also where there are some gaps. And that's ultimately where our role is, uh, that for every one of us, you know, uh, in our own children's education, being involved beyond just showing up and having those conversations with the teacher, but recognizing who's at the top, who's making these decisions, and let me maintain a relationship, build a relationship with these individuals and make them understand how I'm heard. Because Wallahi, <laughs> sometimes it's a single email from a disgruntled parent, uh, student that intimidates the entire board, right? The entire power structure to vote a certain way. Uh, or to, to feel like they need to speak up on a certain issue. Um, so, so of course, you know, that's uh, the part of this broader wave, but all of us have a step in that, whether it's involvement in the unions, uh, in the, in the uh, uh, employee associations, where we are just as entitled to a voice in the space, uh, and that are organizations that already have a lot, you know, strong voice. Um, whether that's, again, the PTAs, uh, sustained relationships over time with other communities that will allow us to sustain um, uh, harms and, and be able to be not just on the defense all the time, but in the constructive building. Uh, those are all starting points, but there's so much more to talk about on this subject. Uh, I'll, I'll stop there. Um, but ultimately, it does start with our own involvement and investment as individuals and in what's happening in our broader in our, in our community locally, and then more broadly, of course. Thank you so much, Abroad. I think that's incredibly helpful. Um, coming back to now, just the entire panel, I'd love to hear, you know, we have a lot of up and coming public servants that have joined us today or will be watching this um, in the future. You are all leaders and trailblazers. What advice do you have to young people considering public service, considering organizing, considering being in the public sphere what is your advice to them? And what do you wish you would have known before you started this work? And um, if Linda, I don't know if Linda's still on, but um, I'll, I'll go back to her. I'll start with you, Mayor Hamoud. Uh, thank you for that question. You know, the, the greatest piece of advice I can offer anyone is to be authentically yourself. Um, being authentically yourself is a very radical thing in 2022. Uh, never shy away. Um, you know, there, there's power in forcing those around you to say the ayn in your name. <laughs> uh, you know, I always say, if you can say Daenerys Targaryen because you watch Game of Thrones, you can say Abdullah Hamoud. Um, it's not, it's not uh, that much more difficult. Uh, and the one thing I wish I knew going in um, that I know now is, even from members within the Muslim community, when you're actively pursuing their support, know that that is what you're pursuing. You're in pursuit of their support. You're not in pursuit of their permission. And permission and support are two different things. If you're actively seeking someone else's permission for you to run for office or achieve whatever success you have measured out for yourself, um, you'll lose just based on that mental state. If you're actively pursuing support, if they offer it, alhamdulillah, you move forward. If not, it's just, you just keep, you keep plowing ahead. I love that distinction support versus permission. Linda, what's your advice to people uh, seeking this kind of career? You know, I'll say, I, I'll say it again and I'll say it every time, just, just be unapologetic about who you are um, and, and keep moving forward and keep going. Every day someone's gonna tell you no, someone's gonna tell you not the time, someone's gonna tell you this is not the right path. Someone's gonna say, there's gonna be so much criticism and skepticism around, along the way and you just gotta run right through it and you just gotta keep doing the work. You gotta you know, make sure that you are centering at, at, at every moment, 
being able to center. For me, I always think about who, who are the most harmed people and what do they need? Um, and those are the people that guide me and guide the way that I work. Um, and at the end of the day, I always say to people, I don't want nothing from this life and I'm not getting much while I'm in it. Um, but I want people to continue, especially our Muslim communities, Muslim young people. What are you gonna have in the afterlife um, when you stand before your Lord and your Lord says there was injustice around you. There were things that were happening around you. And I gave you so many blessings. What did you do? And I wanna be able to say, I use every blessing you gave me everything that I had every resource you gave me um, to, to do what is right to do what is good and to help uplift creation so just keep going don't let anybody stop you um, and I will just say if I had listened over the last 25 years to our Muslim community about what I should and shouldn't be doing I would not be in the place and in the space that I'm in today thank you Linda abroad yeah, there's definitely something to be said about kind of following your conscience and leaning into what you believe is right. And that's ultimately rooted, of course, in our faith um, and, and really centering that. And, and in those moments of, of, you know, feeling like you want to do what's right, but then you're going to lose your election or you want to do what's right, but everyone around you is going to corner you and, and demonize you, lean into what's right, uh, because that will ultimately empower you to, to continue that consistency and, and your, with your record and no doubt have God on your side, um, which is critical. But the other, you know, is uh, that rootedness then inspires a compassionate based leadership. And I think there's a difference between coming in headstrong, uh, especially as I think minorities within minority groups sometimes too, our voice has been so absent from the space and sometimes just uttering something that is so basic to us uh, is largely controversial in ways that you would never intend for it to be controversial. Um, but to come in headstrong um, is not always the approach to build the trust first. Um, come from a place of compassion and then walk people along. Sometimes those mental steps of how you're not a demon because you disagree with them is necessary and being able to frame things in a way that people can understand. And that's part of the challenge we're seeing with the need for healing all across the conversations in this country uh, of race and, and beyond and class uh, because we're not able to bring people together to feel like they're part of that coalition, but rather it's a zero sum, it's you against me. Um, and that tends to be when we impose and come in headstrong and force our way rather than try to bring people along and uh, cultivate that understanding to help them see why, why what we think is important is important. Thank you so much. And, you know, just in, in trying to pull everything together, one point that I think was raised in some of the um, comments that we've been seeing kind of coming along is the connection between our plight and the plight of so many other people. So this is a theme that I heard in all of your comments. And I want to emphasize that maybe end with it is there is a not only a, a, a moral link, but an empirical link between anti-Muslim sentiment and anti-Semitism and anti-Black racism. Um, and anti-woman, uh, you know, bigotry or sexism. Our Islamophobia is one branch on a larger tree of bigotry. Um, and I didn't coin that, but I love, I love that statement. And it's so true and it's borne out in the research. And so we, we cannot do it alone. We must do it in coalition. And I think that this is what we're all trying to do today during this conference. Um, I'm going to just allow, you know, just kind of my, my final question to all of you. Every single one of you uh, has been attacked. You've been attacked for your identity. You've been attacked for um, what you've said, what you've failed to say. And this is part of being a Muslim public figure. Uh, I've, I've certainly experienced it, but I don't think people who haven't experienced it are ever ready. And I don't think we're even ready for the next time it happens. What is, what is the internal dialogue that we need to have with ourselves when that attack happens? Because I, I wanna get the folks who are you know, up and coming ready for it because so many people quit after that first you know, onslaught of social media abuse. What do you say to yourself and how do you reach out for support to get through that, that fire, that hardship of being attacked? And I'm gonna end there. Um, I'd love for all three of you to comment on that. I can start. Um, it actually reminds me of a quote um, and I hope people uh, 
contextualize me in this quote as well. It's a quote from Al Hajj Malik Shabazz, Malcolm X, that says, I want to be remembered as someone who was sincere. Even if I made mistakes, they were made in sincerity. Uh, and I think that, you know, when I'm under attack, depending on where I'm under attack from, you know, there's a question of humility. You know, maybe I was wrong. Um, this idea that we double down sometimes, you know, there are times where I've tripled and quadrupled down because it actually what I said is something that I truly believe in and I will defend myself in those situations. But there are times where we, you know, could have used better words. There were times where maybe, um, you know, we said something from a lack of understanding um, or maybe there was a lack of education and communication as abroad talked about taking our people from point A to point B. But the internal, you know, discussion that I have with myself is I got to just get back up. Um, I cannot um, and will not um, allow social media, you know, backlash to stop me from what I'm doing. I think that there are intimidation tactics. There is Cointelpro that is happening to silence the most effective Muslim voices in our community. There are people in our community that have helped us make strides for our community. And what I hope is that we as Muslim leaders who are under attack do not have to ask for support. Our attacks are usually quite public. Um, and I hope that our Muslim leaders Leaders and our Muslim colleagues and spiritual leaders reach out to us sometimes um, because sometimes we are also dealing with not just the backlash but our own mental health issues. Um, kind of, it's sometimes it's the word, it's us against the world um, and the world against us. And it's important that we reach out and uplift one another and be able to provide those um, support and resources. But for me, like I said, you know, I believe I was chosen for this work, so I'm not going to allow those things to stop me from what I'm doing. In fact, it actually fuels me to keep going higher and double down even more on some of the social justice work that I do. Um, so if anyone here has ever been or will ever be under attack and have their day on social media, and I've had about many days and months and weeks and years on social media, uh, keep going. Um, I think if, if, we, if, if anything, if we here can show you that we could come out on the other side and still do the work, then I think anybody can. Thank you so much, Linda. Mayor Hamoud. Thank you so much. Um, you know, and, and, and in no way am I diminishing anybody's experience. I can only speak to the attacks that I've, that I've you know, encumbered. Um, you know, willful ignorance is prevalent and it's a very dangerous thing to be willfully ignorant, especially in the era of, of over-information. What I tell individuals though, is the best thing you can do is be proactive and is to not react to every social media comment that's out against you. Uh, I remember uh, in my mayoral campaign, uh, my wife would see me on the phone for hours and she'd be like, what are you doing? I'd be like, you know, I call it strategic intelligence. What it actually is, I'm just reading every comment made by every single troll. And I'm just, I'm just burning my soul away by reading at all these comments uh, that are personal attacks against me for my faith, my, you know, whoever it might be. Um, so no matter what you brand it, you can call it strategic intelligence, you can call it you know, whatever you like. It's a waste of time. Uh, it's not, they might be, the, willful, the willfully ignorant might be loud, but they're not the majority. And if you keep that uh, at the top of your mind, you'll continue to, to, to work ahead and earn those votes for those individuals or, or reach out to those who really matter. The most marginalized are oftentimes not in the spaces that are, that are speaking uh, uh, in, in terms like this. So if, if you keep that top of mind, if you stay proactive, run your game plan, um, and Charlie, you'll be successful. Thank you so much. Abroad. Yeah, I, I really appreciate this question because it's 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 speaking to the point that resiliency is actually cultivated. It's not you just step in and you just have to be strong, but you have to put in place the measures, the mental conversations to be ready for that. Um, and building off of Abdullah's point that your perspective as a public servant will be skewed, actually, if you give attention to any of that. And, and I think for, for me, it was also important to just recognize, actually, this is totally normal and totally expected. That if you were to be representing a perspective or a community that has been so long not represented and that the conversations you know, around our identities and our needs and all of that haven't even been broached, then it's only natural that the, 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 uh, the reaction to that is going to be strong. It's going to be sustained because there's a reason those perspectives haven't been there and they've been quashed strategically. And there's money in organization that has maintained a perspective in a certain way. So once you begin chipping away at that, there's no question. Uh, that you're going to receive a storm uh, back at you. Um, and I think, you know, in thinking through that too, it's like, okay, what is the ultimate goal? The ultimate goal is to be of service, to make a difference, um, whether that means through the seat or not, right? Uh, so the goal isn't necessarily how do I stay at the, in the seat at all costs, but it is how do I move the needle? And if you're the one that doesn't survive, 
The next person that's coming, you have set the proper expectations. But if we're the ones compromising, then we're actually failing the entire movement. It becomes about us staying in a seat rather than a mission, a perspective, a, a voice that's coming forward and building its way, even if not through the first person. Um, so, so those are you know ways to think about um, this. And then of course, you know, you might be wrong today, but tomorrow people will realize that you were right. Uh, so that that's another thing that I think. Um, helps me, you know, go through at the end of it. I mean, you have God's army on your side. What that looks like, we don't know the most effective means of change. I don't even think political office is necessarily the way to change everything. We need people everywhere, right? So what, what that, that is God's plan. Our role is to be those, you know, frontline people facing it, but to fully expect that that's what we're facing. Thank you. That's a beautiful way to end this session. Um, and I just want to remind all of our audience to please continue to be ambassadors for the facts and share our resources with your network. I'm gonna introduce the next session. It's health policy and advocacy priorities for American Muslims, centering equity led by the American Muslim health professionals. And we heard about, um, you know, just in this past presentation that um, a third of those who experience discrimination are experiencing it while seeking healthcare. So I will hand it over to Dr. Sena Sayed Vice President of the American Muslim Health Professionals. Dr. Sena Sayed is a neurologist who is on the American Muslim Health Professionals Board as the Vice President and Health Policy and Advocacy Director. In her day job, Dr. Sayed is working as a clinical lead at Sanofi US, um, neurohospitalist at Base State Medical Center, and as a tele neurologist for NeuroX. And with that, um, I will hand it over to Dr. Sayed. Thank you so much. Uh, thank you, Dalia. Thanks a lot for that uh, kind introduction. Um, very happy to be here. And I'm uh, going to be leading this panel with a very eminent group of um, panelists uh, that I will briefly introduce. And then I would appreciate if they uh, provide a little more intro when uh, they're responding to questions as well. Um, so I have with myself uh, Dr. Awesome Padella, who's a professor and vice chair for research and scholarship at the Medical College of Wisconsin. Uh, he's an emergency medicine specialist and uh, also does a lot of research in the arena of bioethics. Uh, I have Dr. Adil Sayed, who is the chief executive officer of um, CEO of Ummah Clinic, which is a Muslim free clinic network. Um, and I also have Imam Do uh, Dr. Kaiser uh, Abdullah, who is an assistant professor in the communication and social influence department in Klein College of Media and Communication at Temple University. He also serves as an Imam in Chicago. Um, I will uh, also allow them to uh, go delve a little deeper into their background when they're uh, responding to questions as well. Um, uh, Adalia already introduced me, uh, so I will uh, dive into and give you a little bit of an introduction of um, my organization and also uh, the sort of the plan that we have for the discussion today, which I promise you is going to be very interesting. So I serve on the board for American Muslim Health Professionals, uh, just as um, uh, just as Dahlia mentioned, and this is a public health organization uh, for Muslim health professionals to in effect work for improving the health care for all, uh, all Americans in the US. So uh, we, we try to advance health care across the board, we just provide a platform for Muslim professionals from different sectors of healthcare. We're not specific to physicians. We welcome all professionals with public health backgrounds, nursing backgrounds, all the different aspects of healthcare. So this really ties into like our talk today. And it's important to mention that we bring people together from different areas because public health is an overarching term. It includes uh, not just the regular health care that we think about when we think about health and going to a hospital, but it also speaks to the um, to the, the different social and economic factors that we have uh, over and beyond. So it, that delves into more prevention, the social determinants of healthcare, the the mental health of uh, our, our community as well, where every day we're we're talking about how 
preventative measures in that arena that's more important than uh, than anything else. And also sometimes it goes into um, the criminal justice system and how it ties into mental health and all these complicated areas uh, tying together public health, social just justice, all of this and social determinants of health, we will be talking about the, the integration of all of this and how we need to have legislation and civic engagement within our communities uh, to improve this. Um, because health policy is a defining part of why our healthcare, um, of the changes that we need in our healthcare. So, so, so it's a very complicated uh, uh, topic, it seems, but I assure you uh, with our speakers, it will be um, a very engaging conversation. Uh, we will be centering on the health policy areas that we will have worked on today. We will also be discussing um, the areas within health policy where we need to work collectively as Americans and, and also talk about areas of need within the, the, the Muslim community itself when it comes to healthcare, which I think is a very interesting concept that we haven't really talked about. And, um, and in that sense, we will discuss also the work that uh, American Muslim health professionals, as we, uh, um, from a health policy standpoint, we try to center our work uh, in uh, health policy. And that includes, and I will touch on the various areas of health policy that we've worked in as we uh, have our discussion. To begin things, uh, I'm going to have an open question for all of the panelists, um, at, primarily to discuss uh, what is a particular area of health policy in which they have worked on and how, um, what, do you, what do they think um, are the particular legislative needs or builds or the work that is needed in the field in general. I'm gonna start with Dr. Asim Padella and Dr. Padella has done some very interesting research in this field as well, which highlights an area of need. And if Dr. Padella, you could speak more to that as well, we would appreciate it. So handing it to you, Dr. Padella. Thank you, it's a pleasure to be amongst you today. And I wanna congratulate um, the organizations that have put this together. Uh, I am really looking forward to continuing to participate in this conversation. I think we are outlining very important things for our community, but also for the broader American population. So thank you for the opportunity. So with that, I'll, I'll share a little bit about uh, the healthcare policy agenda and American Muslims from the lens where I sit. As you've heard <clears throat> that I am a professor of emergency medicine and biotechs at the Medical College of Wisconsin, but what we didn't hear is that I'm also the director of the Initiative of Islamic Medicine, which has been in this domain for about a decade. So let me begin. Bismillah This is the approach of the Initiative of Islamic Medicine over the last decade, where we do research at the intersection between Islamic tradition, biomedicine, and Muslim practices. We conduct theological, empirical, and bioethical research in two main areas, one of which uh, is around Muslim clinicians. This is one I've been asked to speak specifically about today, and I'll give you some data from there. But we are thinking about how the religious identity of Muslim physicians interfaces with their work environment, particularly in the academy the types of discrimination that they might experience, the types of biological challenges that they face. The other main arm of work is around how Islam animates the health behaviors and the experiences of Muslim patients, right? And that work is centered around mosque communities where 50% of Muslim Americans aggregate. The community is not just the center of the masjid, but the social network around that masjid. And our work is rooted in that sort of way in a community lens. The hope of all that is to create a culture of health in masjid communities, right? attentive and informative notions of health and how that relates to being a Muslim. The other area of sort of intervention work is around education, where our work informs right, teaching tools to accommodate and think about Muslim identity in the healthcare environment so that the general community of healthcare providers are more learned and more nuanced in the way they approach and communicate with Muslim patients. The other two domains, which speak more particularly to this conference today, are around advancing diversity, equity, and health, uh, and health equity and inclusion in the workplace environment, a conversation where Muslim Americans are largely left out for various reasons I'll share in a moment, and then it actually inform policy, right? So conversations around conscious and religious freedom from an Islamically rooted, theologically sound lens, right, where we can participate in conversations from our own tradition, bring our moral values to the tapestry of this country. So let me now, with that background, kind of give you a sense of where we reside with Muslims in the healthcare context, particularly as it relates to health policy. 
Now, I would argue that we are in the realm of known unknowns and unknown knowns. Known unknowns meaning things that we know we don't know. And one of the major issues is that we do not know aggregate Muslim American health status and outcomes. We do not know that at a national level, unlike other communities. And there are reasons for that. And the reasons for that mainly are the fact that the National Healthcare Quality and Disparities Reports are authorized by Congress to, and the national health surveys that are now funded by various foundations and institutions do not include religious affiliation. Right? They, they foreground the religious and, eth I mean, sorry, the ethnic and racial identity and the socioeconomic identity because they believe those sorts of features uh, allow individuals to have the same health behaviors, beliefs, and experiences. Yet religious identity is sublimated and, and not thought about as overlooked or marginalized. So even in the health agenda plans for improving health equity, the 2020 and now the 2030 plan from HHS and HRQ, religious features are not prominent. This influences the research that we do. So this last bit here is from a, about now a decade ago, but a med student uh, of mine, to some research around what healthcare research, health disparity research is occurring in Muslim American communities. We found over 50 years as it's a small amount of work, but even the work in Muslim communities or around Muslim communities were focused on racial identities like Arabs and South Asians. They did not include by and large religious data, right? And so metrics of religiosity and how they influence health behaviors. So the lens that we adopt to do research from our own communities also has racialized, right? Or ethnicized sort of identities, not thinking about the thing that common brings us together, which is our religious identity. So that's the known unknowns. And the other sort of aspect I mentioned is the unknown knowns. Things, right, that we know from lived experience exist, but the larger community doesn't know. I mean, the larger policy world does not know. So for example, we know, and empirical work that we've done in the initial Islam medicine shows that religious beliefs, values, and identity strongly influence health behaviors and practices of Muslim Americans across racial, ethnic, socioeconomic, and geographic lines. That being Muslim by in and of itself is more important than these racial, ethnic, and socioeconomic identities for health behavior and health behavior change, right? But the larger world doesn't know that, right? And we don't, again, for various reasons, as I mentioned. The other thing we know is that patient level health and healthcare inequities result from inadequate attention to the religious dimensions of health. This is a model, and I can share with you later on our work, um, but shows how Islamic identity, right, Islamic values and beliefs influence the, your healthcare patterns and the healthcare disparities that exist in the community. Again, if we don't research that, we neglect it, and the larger community, I meaning the policymakers we want to talk to, don't know about it. And this has several areas of our work. I'll just share a couple of statistics. Delayed healthcare seeking due to concordance. We found over 50% of Muslim Americans, men and women, right, report delaying seeking healthcare because they cannot find a provider that's of the same uh, sex, right? Poor adherence to cancer screening guidelines. We did work around mammography, a five-year project in Chicagoland. One third, uh, sorry, yeah, one third of Muslim American women were not getting age-appropriate cancer screening, right? We found worse health outcomes to discrimination. This is one of the first papers that we did was on post-9-11 discrimination abuse before we had the term Islamophobia, which showed mental health outcomes amongst Muslims were worse just because of the discrimination and bias that they were experiencing. And then end-of-life care health tensions, and I'll leave that for Q&A. But here, really, the particular notions about how to die faithfully are not attended to by the hospice, palliative care systems that we have today in the United States. So I was asked to speak about the Muslim clinician arm, so I'll share a few data points, and then I'll, I'll let my, 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 my panelists, co-panelists, I'm uh, glad to be on this panel with, uh, speak. But this is a decade long of work that's funded by various organizations in partnership with Imana and AMHP, who's, who's putting this panel on today. So I wanted to share with you a few data points for your reflection right, from our work. And, and the unknown known here is this, that Muslim clinicians experience religious discrimination, adverse personal and professional outcomes due to poor accommodation of their religious identity in the healthcare workplace. That is a known or unknown known, we know that, but it's our duty for a policy agenda to think about how to bring that to the outside external world. So here are some statistics which should be alarming. From our 2013 national survey of Muslim physicians to the 2021 replication of that national survey, you can think about what was happening in the social political climate, but you'll see this first marker here, just the frequency of experiencing resistance discrimination at workplace over your career course. At the, that time in 2013, 25% said often, always, or sometimes, but now over 50% of physicians nationally. And this letter, 2021 sample, is just in the academy, right? We're experiencing discrimination. Were they experiencing discrimination currently, presently at that time? 14% in 2013, but now 36% were experiencing discrimination at that time. 
Uh, do they believe that they were passed over for professional advancement because of their religion? So initially, again, in 2013, you know, only 25% or so said yes, but now over 50% are saying that they believe they're passed over because of the religious identity. Leaving a job for workplace discrimination, 7% in 2013, 32% today, right? The, the religious identity places them at greater scrutiny for work, uh, at the workplace, 50% both times, right? Or they report struggling to find accommodation for prayer at work, 50% or more on both times. And now from, this is institutional, but from the patient level, right? A 9% in 2013 said patients have refused their, their care because of the religious identity of the physician. Over a third are now reporting this. And I can give you more data points. This is absolutely alarming data around how Muslim clinicians are experiencing their work environment. And I'll share with you that many leave the environment because of that. So that data is coming out and I'll, I can talk about that later. But just to give you a sense of another outcome about depression, right? We're in the middle of the great resignation. And oftentimes we believe our religiosity buffers that effect. So 47% of our samples screen positive on a public uh, for depression, 47%, right? And intrinsic religiosity did buffer against that. So you see the odds ratio is 0.69. But believing your religion, religion is the most important feature of your identity, you had a five times greater odds of having depression. So there's a much complex nuanced notion here what's happening with our religiosity in the workplace environment. So what does this all mean, right? Some of patient level, certain some of it physician level or clinician level, Muslims are highly visible, right? They're visible by their features, but invisible in data streams, right? So we're subject to the adverse aspects of having explicit religiosity, and we do not get the benefits of equal attention to ameliorate the health conditions and work environment factors that, uh, that, that make the healthcare environment worse for us, right? So this example is what I just gave you around the clinician, but also patient level, right? So if a patient discloses that they're Muslim at the encounter when they're getting into the hospital setting, it only opens them to discrimination. There is no package of benefits that they get, Muslim chaplain, understanding of their religious notions of how to pray, and we'll do uh, guidelines, none of that do they get. So there's no need to disclose for them, and it's only a bad thing if they do so. A Muslim health policy agenda remains in the unknown, unknown domain, right? So we don't have, I would argue, us and Padella, that we not we have policy advocacy, but it's not attentive to the Muslim dimensions of health values and for healthy delivery. What's unique and significant about the Muslim experiences? And then do, the Islamic ideals don't reach the marketplace of health policy. And there's some papers on that. And I'll give you an example that that, that study right here, it was just by not a Muslim organization. I was glad to be part of that work was about how the Muslim ban affected Somali Americans interaction with the healthcare environment in Minnesota. That work clearly foregrounds the Muslim identity, but it is done by those external to us, right? And we need to think and own that work because it informs health policy in the end. So what is the initiative of medicine organization I, I lead doing? So we're capacity building for data streams and thought leadership to address this situation, right? We want to make the unknown knowns and the known unknowns into known knowns. So we design and implement mosque-based health disparity research and intervention work. We convene multidisciplinary working groups to mine the moral tradition to inform bioethics and health policy conversations. We equip community leaders and activists with the tools to develop their own health needs assessments in their communities, educational interventions, and grant partnerships. And the goal of this and why you're partnering here or participating here, what I'm so inspired by this group is that we want to initiate an ecosystem for environmental improvement and policy change, right, with all of your leadership. There. So we want to use data on our met needs and challenges to drive policy recommendations, and advocacy and partnership with others. So just I want to end now, right? So these are some of this is some of the work at the Initial Islam of Medicine. You can go to medicineislam.org to look at that. But I want to give you a sense of it's the most specific work we're doing. We developed the religious intervention for mammography, their toolkits and replication guides for you to uptake that, right? We did an RCT on informing Muslim Americans around organ donation because there were disparities there. And we created a religious sort of guide for decision-making based on the plurality within the ethical tradition and the plurality within the medical knowledge around organ donation. We engaged Muslim Americans. This was a capacity building a project which led to a research agenda, right? We did Delphi, a modified Delphi method to think about the top Muslim healthcare concerns for disparities and create a toolkit for communities to uptake and implement that sort of research paradigm within their own uh, settings. And our recent study is around the unmet Muslim American health and spiritual needs in hospital settings, which will come out. And I just do want to mention that over a decade ago, I, we were part of the ISP to create a, 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 uh, a policy report. And some of the work from what you just heard today will come in similar domains as well. So the end of my, my call and my, for us is that we have to highlight the invisible nature of Muslim health disparities and equities and challenges. 
right? We have to garner representative data sources to identify the unmet needs and religion related factors that address those needs, deeply integrate Islamic moral frameworks into policy visions so that we are empowering work, it's asset based work, it's religiously rooted research and intervention work. Thank you for the time, and I appreciate the grace from my co panelists. Thank you, Dr. Fadal. A very complicated topic, so of course it takes a little bit longer, and it is definitely an area of need, and this is what I was alluding to, that we will discuss areas where we still need work to be done. Uh, I would argue that, of course, the Muslim community should lead the way and make this uh, known that we need to have um, to need to implement these types of uh, changes in the healthcare system, but it's also imperative that hospitals and other healthcare organizations also recognize this individual need. And I, research is generally a pathway for change uh, in healthcare. So uh, hopefully that this will lead to some additional change. I will mention one uh, element of the work that Muslim uh, American Muslim health professionals have done in this area because we started. Um, a health equity arm as well, um, about a year and a half ago. And we were trying to discuss health equity from various angles. And one of the things that we did do was a, a patient, um, a patient advocate driven panel in which a, a, a South Asian uh, patient uh, who had what she calls dodged breast cancer discussed the importance of doing mammograms. Um, and we did open it up to all communities because there are um, intersections with other conservative religions where the uptake of doing mammograms is low. But she did speak to her personal experience and also delved into her religious background to explain how she overcame or she used religion to under, uh, understand the importance of doing a mammogram on time and how uh, useful or helpful it was. So, so there is some work, but to, to your point, definitely there is a lot more that needs to be done. And I think this is a very nice segue to our next uh, panelist to, to jump in and describe that the health policy uh, related work and public health work that Dr. Adil Sayed is doing. And it's very interesting because Dr. Padella talked about the needs of the Muslim uh, health professionals and Dr. Adil will talk about uh, the, the work that Muslim health professionals are doing, especially in the realm of Muslim free clinics. And uh, Dr. Adil, if you could also speak um, to, to a little bit about your own background, a little more if I left out anything. And I'm not calling you Dr. Sayed because I will feel like I'm talking to myself. So <laughs> you can you can jump in, please. Sure, thank you so much. And again, uh, I wanna thank uh, the organizers, uh, my co-panelists, the previous panel, which I think had a lot of implications for the work that's happening in the health equity space as well. Um, Dr. Padella as well, have a chance of knowing for a few decades. Um, so yeah, you know, at uh, UMA Community Clinic, as you may have um, known, you know, we were the first uh, federally qualified health center started by American Muslims uh, in the United States. Uh, we were a free clinic, transitioned to a FQHC, and there's been, uh, alhamdulillah, many other FQHCs who have come about uh, across the United States serving very diverse populations, uh, uh, you know, in, in rural and urban areas as well, and health, tackling health disparities. Uh, and I think one area that's unique to my comments as, you know, compared to perhaps Dr. Padella is the work uh, I think American Muslims are doing in the health safety net uh, at large. And I think, um, you know, if you look at different states, obviously we understand healthcare is a very uh, dynamic institution with a lot of peculiarities to specific states and what's happening with Medicaid expansion, Medicare across <clears throat> the health safety net, I think has been a natural place where many uh, Muslim physicians, those in the health space have uh, tried to increase their um, ability to give back, right? Whether it be the local free clinic started by the local masajid, whether it be a group of physicians who are seeing uh, patients for pro bono care. And so to that same end, you know, Ummah Clinic started its efforts in the eight, early 1990s, and it was actually started by a group of American Muslim medical students. And I think the unique aspect about UMA is that um, over, you know, 99% uh, of our patients are not from the Muslim community. We are servicing the needs of the local South LA community as well. And I think those efforts across the board um, have really increased, again, in different free clinics, federally qualified health centers that have come out in the United States. Uh, kind of fast forwarding to where we are today, you know, we have over 30,000 patient visits 
Uh, now uh, we are caring for uh, roughly 12 to 13,000 individual patients in South LA. Um, and we have really a truly integrated model of healthcare that includes primary care, behavioral health, and dental staff. Um, and that's delivered by over 80 uh, full-time staff members at the clinic. And I think if we look at some of the priorities that were um, mentioned by Dr. Mujahid earlier uh, from ISPU, healthcare continues to rank amongst one of the highest priorities for American Muslims uh, when looking at either in terms of you know, the policy preferences, but also in terms of their own health and their own choices that Dr. Padella talked about, but also about in terms of service and giving back to the community at, uh, at large as well. And so I think one area that we really, really stepped into is to one, share our work and our model with other communities. And two, as Dr. Sayed also, Sana Sayed spoke about is the social determinants of health. So I wanted to briefly mention what we're doing there. Uh, we understand that food insecurity is tied uh, to um, physical health uh, very closely. And so we run a, uh, a clinic on the campus of John C. Fremont High School in South LA where we do a free farmer's market and we give out free fr fruits and vegetables. And so on a yearly basis, we're touching 29,000 families and over 400,000 pounds of food that's given out to local community members and organizations and really going upstream to really address the work that's happening as well. And lastly, I wanna share, uh, you know, going back to some of the social justice implications and uh, you know, the, prison, the school to prison pipeline system and where American Muslims are uh, you know, doing work there. You know, again, being on the campus of John C. Fremont High School in South LA, uh, we've worked with the school, with the local police, um, um, uh, you know, union, and you know, their presence is also very visible on on the on on campuses across Los Angeles Unified School District to help to create restorative justice practices where you know punitive damages for children uh, and they're not getting placed into that school or prison pipeline early on uh, in their lives and accessing you know, mentors through our student health leaders program and other areas as well. So I think this overall network of increasing Muslim um, visibility in the safety net healthcare, and we see that over 5% of uh, American Muslim physicians in the United States, uh, physicians in the United States are uh, identif self-identify as being Muslim. And with, you know, representation of less than 1% of the population and in 2050, we're going to be close to 8.1 million uh, American Muslims in the United States. And so that's the type of, uh, I think, large, uh, you know, critical mass that we need to push these issues forward. Um, safe, health safety net and issues around health and, you know, health and wellness have been continuing to increase. There are wonderful models out there. I extend an invitation to you all to look at Uma's model. Uh, I'm happy to share our best practices. And if you're looking to start that work in your community and step into the safety net, uh, very much looking forward to help as well. And I think in addition to the work in terms of our internal community, what's happening with the initiative on Islam and medicine, also understanding how American Muslims are impacting the health safety net in the United States. So thank you for that. So thank you, Dr. Otto. That was, um, that was an excellent overview of a lot of different issues. And I think also a very excellent segue to our next panelist. Um, at, towards the end, I will also try to go over the different um, legislation in these various areas that everybody talked about that American Muslim Health Professionals has also worked in. Uh, but I do want to jump to Dasher and Mom uh, Kaiser now, uh, because he's doing very interesting cross-sectional work that ch touches both the criminal justice system and mental health and both of the topics that our previous speakers have just talked about. And he um, is really working at the ground level on these, uh, in these areas. And uh, I think uh, listening to his experience would be very intriguing as well. And it ties together this panel in a very nice way. Um, and really, really is a good um, segue uh, to sort of uh, bring this full circle. So Dr. Imam Kayser. <clears throat> Uh, good morning, everyone. Um, as Dr. Sana mentioned, my name is Kaiser Abdullah. I am situated, one slight correction, um, situated in, the, in Philadelphia as opposed to Chicago. Um, so the work that I <laughs> the work that I do in, um, in Philadelphia, so when Dr. Sana introduced me, when Dr. Sana introduced me, I'm like, oh, she wants me to focus on this as opposed to that. So I'm going to do a bit of modification here just to highlight some of the areas in which um, some of the experiences that I, I work with. So to connect to what Dr. Syed and uh, Dr. Perella shared earlier on, 
you know, there's a lot that has been happening around health equity, right? I want you to think of equity as everyone here on the panel was, as was eloquently introduced. Um, it really is about this idea of removing barriers. So one of the things that has happened very intentionally um, since the pandemic is this inclusion, and I think Dr. Fudalo is alluding to it, right? This inclusion of religious identity and religious communities in this conversation around health outcomes. Right? That, I, I think certain communities and certain state agencies have been very intentional about that. And I'll just give you one example. Um, maybe in late 2020, um, Pennsylvania in particular, they, they put together this health, health equity action team. Um, I am on the health equity action team, and what it looks at, it brings in people who are representative of health systems, um, community organizers, uh, religious leaders, um, basically anyone who is involved in creating healthier communities. And all of these folks have gathered together, although it came out of the, um, although it came out of as a result of the pandemic, which really brought some of these inequities to light. And there's this idea of bringing together professionals, people who are engaging the community members on the ground level from the research perspective or from the research perspective or from direct care or direct services perspective to help them come together to figure out what does it mean to create a more equitable health system or equitable, equitable health communities for all of us. Uh, one of the other things that came out of that, and I'm going to move into, I think, what Dr. Sena wants you to speak on uh, shortly. One of the other things that we did in this period was the Black, um, the Black Muslim COVID coalition, right? That was something that we looked at what does it mean to be a Black Muslim experiencing COVID at this time? What things do you have access to? What things are speaking to you? What things are, uh, uh, um, are distant from you? And is the conversation around your health really present in the national conversation around how do we, how do we navigate this issue? And the last thing I'm going to touch on in this, so I, I really am still speaking about the pandemic and what it has created and how some of these things have really been brought to life. One of the other things that came out was this, um, was the COVID prevention network, right, that really brought together a number of religious leaders, some of them carried the title of imams, and black doctors, right, black Muslim doctors who came together to speak about what does it mean to actually navigate the COVID pandemic in this time, but also, and more specifically, what does it mean when we look at the data on, um, on black Muslims who, or black people in general, which by and large affects black Muslims, right, who are impacted by the COVID disease at higher rates than, their, um, than other races or ethnic groups, and have lower instances of vaccination when compared to other groups. So this COVID, um, COVID um, prevention network, what we actually got together was, how do we come about removing that barrier of misinformation that prevents Muslims from accessing certain medical health resources, right? So that they can be in better health spaces. So these are just three areas where we actually did some work directly targeted to what does it mean to remove barriers to create um, areas for black Muslims to access better health outcomes, better health resources. In particular, um, when we, if we are taking a very broad look at what does um, public health, right, and public health um, is absolutely, or violence is absolutely tied to public health, one of the things that I am directly involved in is many of us are familiar, and this ties into something that Dallas said earlier on the previous plan, right? Many of us are familiar with the Plainview Project. And the Plainview Project is um, a, a project that came, that looked at what are police departments around the United States doing, or, or it looks at Facebook posts pertaining to um, police departments around the United States and how they engage in Islamophobia, anti-Black racism, xenophobia, homophobia, and a lot of other types of phobias, right, that targeted marginalized communities. And without going into too much of this, um, in Pennsylvania, there's something called Act 111, right? And Act 111 basically gives police officers the right to arbitration. Um, this is somewhat tied to qualified immunity, but it's, it's different. So essentially, Act 111 says that if a police officer is disciplined, what they are allowed to do is to seek arbitration. And arbitration, the outcome of the arbitration is binding. So as a result of the Plainview project, many police officers would disappear, whether it be a written, uh, a, a written notice, suspension, or dismissal. 
because of Act 111, they are, they are entitled to arbitration. So therefore, when they go through arbitration, it means that an arbitrator can decide that this police officer, although they were relieved from duties by the city, if the arbitrator decides that no, they should be allowed back on the force, the department has no recourse but to bring them back on. So imagine someone who says Muslims should be banned from the United States. And that's a really premium thing that they may have said in one of these posts. Muslims should be banned, right? Or the best Muslim is a dead Muslim, right? Think of things like that. They say this, say repeatedly, share comments on this, get dismissed, and then in arbitration, they get brought back onto the force. That creates a, 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 a serious distrust between the community and can absolutely impact how Muslims in Philadelphia and how people, black people in Philadelphia in general, um, interact with, with police officers and can actually cause an escalation in violence because of this lack of trust. What we found is that um, I come in there as uh, during these arbitration proceedings, proceedings, I come in there as an um, expert witness, is what they identify us as. And what we speak about is how this, how violence or verbal aggression that is rooted in bias, how that can actually lead to violence against marginalized people in the community, particularly Muslims, particularly people who identify as black and other marginalized identities. Um, thus far, we have prepped for about six different cases and I've testified in about three or four of these cases. The reason why I'm highlighting this is, um, if we understand violence to be intimately tied to the larger discussion of public health, and we understand that there are, there are agents that are um, entitled to engage in, in state-sponsored or, or violence against communities or against uh, marginalized communities. Then we can see why our intervention as Muslim experts, as Muslim leaders, leaders in these spaces can actually create better outcomes for health and mental health in our community. Uh, the last thing I want to say on this, um, just to wrap up this piece here, and then um, Sunny can tell me if, we, if I should just leave this for the next piece here is outside of my work as at Temple University, outside of my work as a religious leader, one thing that I do through, um, through another business that I'm part of is this idea of um, creating skills and working with individuals to develop the skills that they need to become better um, contributing members of society. So as Dr. Syed, Dr. Adel mentioned earlier on, right, um, when we look at health outcomes and how food insecurity is tied to um, to, to how people function inside of their communities. One of the things that we realize is that when folks don't have the skills, when they don't have the, 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 the ability to either work to get, the, um, to get the resources that they need or to purchase the, the, the types of food and sustenance that they need, that this can actually lead to different types of problems for them, their families, and the, and the communities that they are part of. So one of the things that, we, that Philadelphia has been very intentional about is so you're not ways to, to give opportunities for members of the marginalized community here in Philadelphia to develop different types of skills. Right? They generally call it workforce development. Um, that term is falling out of favor. So if you see me avoiding it, it's because uh, many folks are, are struggling using this idea of workforce development. But giving them the skills so that they themselves can make better choices when it comes to or have the resources to therefore make different, I shouldn't say better, make different choices when it comes to how do they want to interact with others in the community, how they want to interact with people who with law enforcement, and how do they want to interact with even their own um, healthcare and medical professionals. So those are just three of the areas that I find myself working in that help bring some of this work that we've been talking about together so far. Thanks to you so much, uh, Imam Dr. Abdullah. And sorry for mixing up your location. I made you into a flying Imam, flying, mm -hmm. <laughs> even though I know that Temple University is in Philadelphia. I don't know why Chicago was on my mind. <laughs> Maybe I thought you were close to Dr. Padella somehow. So, <laughs> I, uh, no, but thank you so much. As you can see, 
our speakers have such a diverse background and they are doing so many things all at once that it's even impossible to <laughs> encompass it in one small talk. I mean, Dr. Abdullah just gave you a very bare minimum of what he's doing, quite frankly, as far as I can, I can tell. Uh, but he tried his best to like highlight all the areas and do feel free to reach out to our speakers if they are okay with it to discuss further if they can uh, augment or help you with your work or you know collaborate with you i do want to say a few words about the the variety of things that everybody talked about um so uh i'm very grateful that uh dr abdullah brought up uh, the black muslim covid coalition uh because um american muslim health professionals and a number of org other organizations including ispu islamic relief and many many more isnan uh imana and all we came together and we also created a national black muslim uh, the national muslim covid task force as well and we did work very closely with the Black Muslim COVID coalition as well. Now, you would wonder, why would we separate it out? But I think it is very important to recognize that even within our own community, sometimes we have problems, not sometimes, a lot of times we have problems with the representation. Um, so we really wanted to ensure that we have a collaborative um, effort. So we're, of course, even within the National Muslim Task Force, there were people from all backgrounds, all organizations, but to ensure that the, the voices are heard in an equitable manner, we also made it a point to work with the Black Muslim Coed Coalition as well. And I think that was a phenomenal effort. And the, I would say the Muslim community was very well organized in that effort. Uh, one of the things that we worked on um, in terms of just uh, health policy, since that is the topic of the day, is that uh, I was a co-chair for the, the policy committee of the National Muslim uh, Task Force as well. And we uh, worked on key pieces of legislation. Um, I, some of our speakers, or rather all of our speakers today also do a lot of groundwork. Uh, our work was focused more uh, in the background on uh, policy and legislation and supporting certain bills and also um, using the many capabilities within the Muslim, um, Muslim community for advocacy and lobbying. And we came together with a variety of organizations that traditionally are not working in the health policy space. I would mention like MPAC, Imana, MGAGE. We worked with them to uh, support pieces of legislation like the TRACE Act which in particular uh, focused on improving uh, COVID testing and treatment and access in minority communities. And we all know the disparate impact as Dr. Uh, Abdullah mentioned in uh, the black and Latino communities, for instance. So those bills were specifically targeting there. Uh, more recently, we've also supported the HAIL Act, uh, which is more about immigrants in general uh, and removing barriers to access to healthcare. Um, access to healthcare, as both Dr. Uh, Adil and D Dr. Abdullah mentioned, and even Dr. Padella mentioned, is a key element of why healthcare suffers. And these barriers are very diverse. So one of them is, of course, um, just Medicare, Medicaid, not having sufficient expansion. But then there's also specific barriers for the immigrant community. Um, and the Hill Act is one of those things that we're working on. And when I say we're working on these various acts, I mean, we are trying to engage with the community so that they reach out to the legislators and push for this. We send letters to legislators ourselves, depending on where these various pieces of legislation are. So it's a way to bring improve civic engagement in its entirety. Um, and I will just, one last thing I already mentioned, uh, the health equity arm we created, that was in particular because of the inequities that became incredibly transparent during COVID. But I will say health equity is a problem for all times. It's not just a COVID problem. I mean, look at the, the, uh, the Black maternal health crisis that we have. And that is another area that AMP is, uh, American Muslim Health Professionals is short for AMP, is working on, for, and the Momnibus Act, which is recently what we've been collaborating with various other organizations on uh, and trying to uh, move that needle forward as well. So I, I do think that one thing that we should think about is that 
this recent public health crisis that just made uh, the flaws in our healthcare system more apparent should be a call to action for everybody to come to the table and bring their various expertise and even civic engagement as an expertise that uh, to change the way that healthcare is done. So um, that was my spiel, but I did want to go back to the speakers as well. And thank you so much for such a such an engaging conversation. Um, it's unfortunate we're not in person because sometimes that makes the banter easier uh, and we could have been jumping around. Uh, but um, I did want to say like, based on the work that you're doing and some of you have already touched on it, but what do you think is the call to action from your perspective uh, as well? So uh, Dr. Padella will just go the same sequence, putting you on the spot there, but you did kind of touch on a number of things, but if you want to just, you know. Yeah, so Thank you. So for all of you, just go back to the slide. It's probably recorded if I call to action. But I, I, I would argue to connect this panel to the one before, where the one before is saying, what's Muslim identity? I'm bringing my Muslim identity to this space. I'm going to be, uh, Linda was like, not apologetic, but we're going to be epistemically humble. And I do not think that that is possible in the healthcare policy domain unless we have the same notion that my identity must be accounted for. I must be seen when I go into the healthcare system as a marker for data, right? Meaning that Muslim religiosity should be, Islam, religious affiliation should be attached to that. When we do research on communities, we should be thinking about what are the specific unmet Muslim needs. No one will do the work for us, right? We have to do it ourselves. And that's my call to action. So if you want to change policy, go lobby for policies that allow for religious affiliation within data sets like the census, like the National Health Interview Survey, like whatever. But there is none, and we will be invis invisible to policymakers until we make ourselves visible to them. So no more feel good. We want to participate. It's actually we now in this space of equity and inclusion include our identity, include it as a religious community that is aligned by this affiliation. So I can't say any more clearer than that. Uh, Dr. Adil, I don't know if you want to jump in real quickly. Yeah, absolutely. I think <clears throat> for me, it's when we talk about health equity and all the great work that American Muslim physicians and others in healthcare are doing, and even, you know, community organizers, you know, I started my career off as a community organizer as well, are doing is take these solutions to the people on the ground, right? They're most impacted. And I'll give you a tangible example. Uh, Medicaid expansion in our state, in many states, still does not allow for the use of telehealth for who? For underserved community. Everyone access, everyone else has private insurance, can access telehealth, but the ones being restricted from it are underserved communities. So there's a piece of legislation right now at the national level to expand Medicaid access to tele, telephonic visits, to telehealth visits, right? And then also helping to increase broadband access in underserved communities, which oftentimes gets misconstrued to think, oh, everyone has access to broadband as well. Muslim community, us collectively have the resources to challenge that notion and to make sure that, again, if we're talking about equity, it's centered uh, in terms of advocating uh, policies and practices. And I would just say, lastly, I think we have answers about what complete integrated healthcare looks like from our own faith tradition, right? Medicine in our own tradition, as we know, is so integral to mental health, you know, physical health, all, uh, you know, all spiritual health as well, right? And I think there is a need across the board, regardless of religious affiliation, of what an Islamic framework of healthcare in this country look like. Every, every major health, you know, every major faith institution in this country has supplanted a flag of what health equity looks like vis-a-vis -vis hospital systems, right? Where is the Muslim equivalent to the Cedar sinai to the other Seventh-day Adventist health systems? And I think we have to make that push and we have to do it professionally. We have to do it with a health equity lens and we have to do one realizing that this is American Muslim and Islam in action through vis-a-vis -vis health equity and health access. So I think that's my call to action. Thank you. Thanks, Dr. Adil. Now, uh, Imam, Dr. Abdullah, I think you have a number of call to actions. Uh, but and uh, you, just, I guess, uh, I'll, just, <laughs> I'll just do two. Um, yeah. So I just put something that, there that I didn't mention, and I'm glad that everyone spoke about yeah. connection to mental health, right? As somebody in the community who um, does quite a bit of, just before this, um, this panel, I met with a couple online doing some marital relationship coaching intervention stuff, right? Um, and one of the things that we, um, that I, and I was speaking to a therapist, uh, psychologist just before that session, um, 
I want to say that I, as a call to action for our community, is to put a policy in place where um, we, we have funding, we collect money, and this is what um, she was mentioning to me, right? That we, you, we designate a portion of the zakat in each masjid, especially in the, ma in the more marginalized communities that fund individuals who need help getting mental health resources or access to mental health. One of the things, so um, that's kind of when you mentioned it, when you named it there, right, in terms of, um, of folks who have Medicaid cannot access telehealth. Um, those who have jobs where it's easy for them to leave to access mental health resources, right, are in a much better position uh, because one, they have the private insurance and they have other things that can allow them to do it, right? Those who are more constrained because of their resources, who need the, um, the telehealth, right? Who, who have now been availed of it for various reasons during the past years and who now need it more, they find that they can access it less. So what would it look like if our communities actually made funding available for Muslims who needed mental health um, support? One, it would help reduce the stigma that many of us know Muslims have against mental health, right? And it's very prevalent in the black and brown communities, right? So if we as religious leaders make this a priority that, hey, this is so important, the same way we get food from the share programs and we distribute it to our communities, this is so important that we are actually allowing, we are actually carving out a space where if you know you need the support, you, um, and I know we have different things that we have to navigate around confidentiality, privacy, and, and the stigma that is attached. I'm just mapping out the whole policy here, just an idea that we need to make this a priority. And the only way we can make this a priority is if we start allocating resources to it. And what more of a, of a significant way to allocate resources to it than to start looking at money that we actually have to pay in terms of our zakat? What can we do with that to help support this need that we know members of our community absolutely. So that's the, that's the one thing that, if I, yeah, I'm just gonna use that as my one call to action right now. No, thank you so much, um, Dr. Abdullah. That, that was an excellent point. And um, I, I agree wholeheartedly. It's uh, especially when it comes to telemedicine, since I do telemedicine um, as part-time uh, as well. And uh, it definitely is a need. And I don't think I am, re I reach a lot of patients across the country, but exactly what you said, those are either private pay patients or private insurance patients. So they're definitely not reaching the people that actually may need my services, the people who live in places where they cannot access physicians. So that, that has been my personal experience as well. So, and definitely uh, mental health care access is so tied to telemedicine as well. And it's so unfortunate that that deficit is not being bridged. Uh, when we know what the effects of poor mental health care access can be. So that's a definitely a good point. And I would be remiss if I didn't mention, I think Dr. Abdullah reminded me that the, um, we have American Muslim Health Professionals also has a, a very, very active mental health arm. And we've conducted um, Muslim, uh, we've conducted mental health first aid uh, trainings uh, across the country. And we've also collaborated with uh, the Muslim student associations uh, to conduct trainings at various campuses as well. And we've done it as a part of interfaith efforts and, uh, and recently uh, also for the refugee populations, particularly from Afghanistan, as uh, I, everyone might be familiar with. So, so Definitely, we're trying to do work in this area, but of course, a lot more effort is needed. I, I think one important element of uh, the take home from all of this is that all of us bring so much, so many different um, uh, expertise to the table. And we saw this with COVID and we saw this when we created the coalitions within our community, the, the Black Muslim COVID Coalition, the National Muslim Task Force for COVID, that, that we have the capacity to work together and the collaboration uh, when it comes to healthcare and it comes to health policy, and I would argue policy in general, policy is an arena where you need to work together to make a change. It's not competitive. 
your policy does not trump someone else's policy. So if we come together and we make these changes and we are advocates for the changes that we need within our own community, Dr. as Dr. Padella mentioned, uh, we are our own best advocates, uh, but we should also advocate for each other in that sense. So it's an advocation, uh, it's advocating for the community in general. So I do think that um, that is the, the, the message and you can really see today, like with the different panelists, uh, the variety of expertise and the different areas that they work in, yet they are uh, uh, intertwined with each other and overlapping because uh, healthcare does not occur in, a, in an, an isolated framework. It is extremely interconnected. So everything that anyone does, you are touching someone else's work and lives in that. So I think that is a very important thing when it comes to healthcare. Um, I think we um, we had a lot to say, so I don't think we have um, time per se for further questions. But I would encourage you to reach out to the speakers as well, uh, because uh, I would say that they were not able to fully get into. Uh, what uh, the, the depth of the work that they're doing. And also feel free to reach out to me if you want to work with American Muslim health professionals in any of these areas. Uh, we always welcome volunteers and we welcome your expertise. I will mention that within the health equity arm, we're also publishing. Uh, so we welcome students. Uh, we've published in the American Journal of Bioethics and we had a number of posters at the American uh, Public Health Association as well. So we welcome co collaborations like that as well. Um, so I don't think there are any questions, but let me quickly check. I don't think so, and not in the chat as well. So with that, I will uh, wrap up this session and I will introduce the next session, which will be on civic justice for the most diverse community. And thank you so much to all of the speakers, not to, <laughs> not to forget that. Thank you so much, excellent discussion. And uh, the, the session will be hosted by the Illinois Muslim Civic Coalition. And for this session, it's my pleasure to introduce Dr. Delara Saeed. Uh, she's the president of the Illinois Muslim Civic Coalition. And I will hand it, hand it over to Dr. Delara. May God's peace be with you. And assalamu alaikum. My name is Dilara Saeed, and I'm president of the Illinois Muslim Civic Coalition. Civic justice is inspired through story, achieved through action, and codified through policy. This is what we're focusing on throughout the day today. Our American Muslim story, which is where we'll start, is complex. It's vibrant and it's complicated. It tells of people that come from every race, class, and background. I'll start with my American story. On the timeline you have on the screen and in the chat, our story, our family story, begins in the 1950s, a time of great change at conflict with entrenched traditions, of civil rights trying to forge the right to build a life for every American. Within this complicated context, my father-in-law immigrated as a student. He was learning from his professors, but also learning about being American from allies and friends who were Black, Brown, tan, every race, color, and faith. And they were learning about him from his roots and his background. A few years ago, we were sent a newspaper from 1965. It was a half page spread in the McLean County Times. Why did they have a half page spread? Because the Saeeds were the first family in town. The first Indian family in town got their names and their photos in the newspaper. Even back then, it led to a lot of curiosity and some veiled hate. This story, my story, and many others is why we do this work. 
Remember, civic justice comes from stories achieved by action, codified by policy. We do this work to ensure the American Muslim story and the promise of American protections and rights apply to each of us and our neighbors across the nation. Today, our American and Muslim family is four generations, and we're not alone. For Joy, the story begins over 150 years ago when her enslaved ancestors helped build this nation. For Chris, it continues today in his family's quest to become documented. For Mina, it is the raising of her new baby, a new generation of Muslims. For Sara, it is the publishing of her new children's book, her legacy in print. When did your American Muslim story begin? As you heard from our friends at ISPU, American Muslims come from all different backgrounds. The idealist idea of one ummah takes its form today in many voices, through many organizations such as yours, and across many rural and urban suburban neighborhoods across towns, states, and cities. Muslim Americans might be some of the poorest families in this nation, but they're also some of the wealthiest families and philanthropists in this nation. American Muslims may be completely integrated in their blocks and neighborhoods, and yet many will feel completely isolated. We come as card-carrying NRA members we're also ardent gun law advocates. We vote at every point on the political spectrum from far left to far right and everything in between. And in some states and counties, we can swing the vote. Some of us are religious stalwarts and others of us consider ourselves spiritual lightweights. Our community is not what it was 30 years ago. We're large, diverse, and growing. It's not enough to tell our story alone anymore. It is not enough to know that we are diverse. We must respect and advocate our own diversity within our community, within our Muslim community, as well as within the greater American community. We need Muslims and massages and community centers and organizations that advocate and support our own challenges, diversities, and issues, and celebrate them. Today, our strategy must change. Laws and policies must codify our story. Again, civic justice is inspired through story, achieved through action and codified through policy. We will have masjids that take care of our spiritual growth and welcome those with special needs, different backgrounds, and all classes. Today, we need empowering social services that understand the challenges that we face across the spectrum of health, class, systems. And today, we need and have specialized civic justice strategies that then codify our stories. This conference and gatherings like this bring together hundreds of partners and allies, all of your organizations, activists and influencers. We need grassroots organizing combined with regional leadership Combined with national strategy, no one level does it alone. And we need to tell the story that is the story of all of us as Muslims. And then again, as I said, codify it into policy. So this section of the conference is very hands-on as the last one was. We're going to be focusing on strategy for building policy and laws for the most diverse community, ours. 
First, my colleague, Nadia Muzaffar, will share a case study of how our team at the Illinois Muslim Civic Coalition builds a template for legislative advocacy. We ensure policies made for us are made with us, and we pass law after law each year. Then our colleagues at the Arab American Institute, led by Maya Berry, will share the case study of the intersectionality between our identity of Muslim and race and ethnicity. She'll talk about the inaccuracy of how we are portrayed in the US Census as Arab Americans often categorized as white. And she'll talk about what we need to do to prepare for the 2030 census together. And then Delegate Sam Rasool of the state of Virginia will share how we can build strategy and pipelines for equitable elected and appointed representation. In the end, public officials and leaders should understand us, should know us, but some must also look like us. Each speaker will speak for about 10 minutes. Please add your questions onto the chat, whether in Facebook or on Zoom. And we'll make sure that we're able to ask a few questions after the presentations. Let's get started with Madia Muzaffar, Director of Policy and Advocacy for the Illinois Muslim Civic Coalition. Assalamu alaikum. Thank you, Dilara, for such a uh, thorough introduction of our community. I am so humbled and excited to speak to all of you today, and I'm, I'm just so inspired by everything that we heard earlier this morning, the significance of the need for policy, the significance for recognition of how unique our community is, and how we have to show up as ourselves um, unapologetically. I wanted to show you um, just a case study in Illinois. I am Maria Muzaffar, I'm the Director of Advocacy and Policy. Uh, I have a fellow, Khushbu uh, Patel Advocacy and Policy Fellow. Uh, we have a small team and our team is focused on taking what we learn from who our community is, the statistics of who we are, and then resulting in a legislative change that serves our community. Next slide, please. So very quickly, the Illinois Muslim Civic Coalition has six different areas of work, um, advocacy and policy, voter engagement, uh, census and redistricting, engage and impact leaders and officials, civic leadership, capacity building, Illinois Muslims report that includes demographic needs and assets. But I want to just use these three statements to boil down what they all encompass, and which is that we believe, as Delara said, policies made for us must be made with us. Uh, we also get out the vote, GOTV, for ethical leaders and just laws, because we believe if we're going to have a role in making sure who gets elected, we need to have a role in making sure what they are spearheading on our behalf. And public officials must know us, understand us, and some should look like us. And I think the way you walk into a legislator's uh, office is very, very critical, and the relationships you build based on sincerity uh, serve you long term. Next slide, please. So we have a very um, specific process in Illinois for advocacy and policy, and, and the reason is that we want this system to be replicated. The whole purpose of this is to be able to be a template for other states. So we specifically don't assume that we know everything that we need to know about our own community. And I'll say it's that many times, as many of you in the audience are individuals that are active in the community, that are activists and are on the ground. It's easy for us to assume that we know every angle of what impacts our community. So we never wanna take that for granted. So we host and listen um, um, with other organizations, our community organizations and find out what the main issues are. We identify them and then where we actually play a very different role is that we map out a legislative response. And what I mean by that is that we identify the issue, but before we go to a legislator and say, okay, this is an issue that we have, 
uh, how can you help us? We actually come up with the solution ourselves. We do the research, we draft the legislation. So literally it's like creating a solution to a problem that someone can take the lead on in the legislature. After that, we develop a legislative strategy because of course you can write a legislation, you can come up with a solution, but if you don't know how to get to the finish line, you're gonna fail in the middle, right? So we need to make sure that we know how we're gonna frame it, who our partners and allies will be within our community and outside of our community, um, when we're going to uh, introduce it in what chamber, which legislator we're going to really work with in committee and, and what are the talking points for it. And key community partners and allies can be on the front line on the ground to really educate people uh, as partners with us. And then lastly, we find the legislative sponsor. And I would say that this is very, very similar to when you have a startup and you're looking for a funder, right? Because you have a startup, you believe in what you really, really wanna create and all you need is money, but you cannot make the mistake of getting the wrong funder. So you need to find a legislator in the same way that it's not enough for someone to just say, okay, I'll champion your cause. We wanna know why you wanna champion the cause. We wanna know who is in your community where it really, really affects you. What is the demographic of your community? And then what is your uh, record to follow through? And so I think those things are very, very necessary when you analyze. A, a lot of pause and analysis uh, takes part in this process. And then you follow the legislative process to create law. I think we all know about how a bill becomes a law because we probably learned about it in civics in elementary, but um, there's two chambers and each chamber has a committee uh, on subject matter hearing sometimes and the committee needs to vote it out and you have to lobby all of those legislators and you have to get it to the finish line and have the governor sign it. Next slide, please. Yay. All right. So case study. Here is a case study for Illinois that we want to share with you, right? How did the Illinois Muslim community, alhamdulillah, pass three laws and one resolution and support a dozen other organizations in one session? That's the question we want to have. Next slide, please. So there's a couple of guiding principles before we dig into the really exciting, cool laws that are in place in Illinois. Uh, and these principles we really stick to because they actually create a template for, for how we guide our conversations and our relationships. Number one, and this was stated a little bit earlier in the morning, so, so we have a lot of uh, you know love for that uh, notion. We don't ask for permission. We come as equal partners to the process. We believe policy should be based on what is needed and not what is politically feasible. So if it's if it's always going to be about, oh, this is not the time, that's not the route we're going to take. We're going to take the route of what is important. We know legislators respond to numbers and expertise. So we make sure we have numbers and we definitely, definitely want to come in as experts. We assume no ill intent on any legislator we meet. And this is very critical, too, because there's a lot of baggage about how legislators are perceived. Um, and how different organizations have, have, have kind of characterized them. But we always want to start a blind slate. We, we're not ignorant about the record, but we always want to feel that legislators are there to make a difference. And, and we really state that when we enter our conversations. We build diverse coalitions. We have over 50 partners and allies. We use a grassroots organizing arm that we created, Illinois Mobilize, to not only lobby with legislators, but also on the ground and file witness slips and everything else that needs to be done. And then we create advocacy temp templates for states across the nation, because if Illinois can do it, we, we feel it can happen around the world. And, and that is our, our biggest goal. Next slide, please. This is just a snapshot. Uh, instead of uh, all of you just looking at text, we felt that the pictures really can impact how you can see the impact of these laws. and. Um, I just want to state that these are also the little postcards that we use to talk to legislators and educate our partners and allies, and it had an incredible, incredible, incredible impact. Um, Cross-culture mediation among students. We know, as we heard earlier, that there's a lot of bullying, uh, specifically for bias-based bullying. So we literally wanted to address that issue, inclusive athletic attire uh, act. We wanted to make sure that Muslim athletes were able to continue and play sports and be welcome on sports field, no matter what their accommodation looked like or the need was. Um, Muhammad Ali Day resolution, making sure that January 17th was a Muhammad Ali Day. 
and the contributions and history of Muslims in America. So this is a snapshot of images. Next slide, I'm gonna do a little bit of a deeper dive. Next slide, please. Okay, great. So now I'm gonna get into a little bit of a text, okay? So the Inclusive Athletic Attire Act, actually we wrote as a legislation that not only modified uh, uniforms for Muslim students, um, but generally for all faith-based communities that wanted to be modest or anybody that wanted to modify their uniforms and not only girls, but also boys. So it, were, it was very applicable to interfaith communities and many people, we got calls from parents that were simply saying, we don't like the volleyball uniforms anymore, right? So a lot of these things made sense outside the Muslim community and that is the winning formula because we wanna address issues as wide um, as we can for the whole state. SB 564, Contributions of Faith in America, of course, again, just like HB 120, it's the first in the nation, which basically means that in K through eight US history curriculums across the state in Illinois, now the contributions of Muslims will be taught in US history. And uh, obviously this was, again, uh, we heard a few of these uh, stories in the beginning of this uh, conference, but there were uh, cases where students felt like they were outsiders. In fact, there were students who were being taught of material on 9-11 where they felt that it was biased and, and unfair and made them feel like they were targeted. So how better than to include a community than to teach others about how their community is already part of the U.S. story. We also added Muhammad Ali as a commemorative holiday in January 17th. So now every year there's a Muslim American, proud African-American Muslim uh, that will be celebrated uh, across the state. And cross-cultural mediation, I touched on this a little bit, but I wanted to dive into this because what we actually saw in these bullying cases is that detention and suspension had a role, but it did not solve long-term relationships or problems. So we, what we wanted to do is if your child had bias-based bullying, that they would have the option of mediation. In fact, mediation would be sanctioned, right? It would be mandated. So if you're a parent where your child has been bullied for wearing hijab or being Muslim, separating the two, uh, the bully and the victim, it's fine, but how powerful would it be if you had to have mediation, uh, absent physical harm and physical danger, you had mediation where the victim can actually empower themselves in this story. And then we went to the next one. Okay, we went to the next one. But um, so those are the different language um, critical changes that we made to make sure that we reach the finish line. Right now we have a full plate, but two major things that we are looking at, we got, we got them, thanks, we got them, Muhammad Ali. But the two major things that we're looking at right now, which is 2022, uh, is Faith Behind Bars, HB 5455, and Faith by Plate, HB 1574. And what we understood is that when you are incarcerated, um, it is the time where your faith really, really matters. It is your strength. And so we wanted to make sure that Muslims behind bars were able to have access to chaplaincy. Again, we brought in that language. So individuals who are of different faiths should have the ability to make sure that they have access to chaplaincy. And this was actually inspired by a case in Alabama where if you know an individual that was incarcerated was being executed and did not have a chaplain and imam enter. Um, Illinois does not have a death penalty, but we do feel that so many moments chaplaincy should be something that's accessible. Faith by Plate Act is simply stating that individuals that have faith dietary restrictions in state facilities should be have should have the ability to have that type of uh, food. And so that specific bill we are now uh, pushing for all faiths, and but specifically halal food and kosher food, and we've created an alliance between the two communities to make sure that all state facilities, hospitals, schools, um, prisons, all have um, that type of uh, accommodation made. Next slide, please. And not everything goes the way that, that you expect it to go. And I think that's a major, major lesson for people that do this legislative work is that the interesting and the creative part of it is how do you solve the problem? So to reach the finish line, it may be that you pass a law, but other things may also occur that also result into a different type of finish line. So if you look at Commission on Healthcare and Prisons, which is also a legislation we're working on 2022, we actually moved it to spring session 2023 because where we wanted to house it was not where it was the best fit. So we had communications with state agencies and we built relationships to make sure that we moved it to the right direction. Insurance coverage for healthy foods for cancer patients. This was very critical and very important for us to do because we actually put Muslim physicians 
um, as leads on this issue. So st the state of Illinois could see Muslim physicians in their role of being frontline workers and being experts in this field. And what we felt is that insurance should cover felt, uh, healthy food, and especially for areas of food deserts. What we actually decided is instead of creating a law, we need to go into the agency and create the uh, program ground up. And so now we are excited to work with Imana and, and different medical organizations, uh, Chicago Medical uh, Muslim Medical Association to build this ground up one uh, first in a nation um, to be able to the state agencies. And then lastly, faith behind bars, uh, we moved it to a veto session. So we're gonna be seeing inshallah faith by play and faith behind bars in November in the veto session. And we've done all the work to be able to have witnesses for subject matter hearings and have uh, national attention for both issues. Next slide, please. Now, we added the slide because I wanted you to know that we have Dr. Rachel Mahmoud, which was our education task force lead. But we wanted you to know that you can create a legislation in your state that creates a Muslim curriculum that talks about um, the fact that it's mandated, but it will only be effective if you can guide the educators. And so many times there are these mandates which schools don't really like, but if you're able to create a guide, then that makes it a lot easier. So even when we were speaking to legislators, we would say there's actually a task force of diverse educators across the state, many were not Muslim, that came together to create this guide. And so teachers will have this guide, parents will have this guide. And we actually share this in information with the Illinois State Board of Education. And we basically share the fact that we are prepared before, we're even, before this law even passes. And so that was very, very critical. Next slide, please. And this is key because when you do the work and you do a very public type of action that can be interpreted in, in political divisive environments, you need to know how to relate to the media and how to use the media. And so we had some guidelines as well and we were very, very disciplined about it. Number one, no pat on the back until success. Many times communities and community organizations will get um, questions and, and leads from, inter from, from uh, from newspapers and, and journalists really wanting to dig into issues. And it's very, very tempting to say, okay, now we can get a word out and now we can complete the narrative. But we really, really feel that until there's success, there's really nothing to talk about. For us, success was uh, when the law is passed. No invitation to distracting and disparaging narratives. This was for the same reason. You know, We didn't wanna engage in discussion in the public forum unless it was about education with legislators and community organizations, which we could do ourselves without the media being involved in our um, community sessions and in our WhatsApp groups and in our um, town halls. We were able to have those discussions uh, on our terms, which we really enjoyed and we were able to gauge that diversity. Share press releases only after passage of laws. That's self-explanatory, right? You have new, share news when you have news. Show intentional leadership in discussing legislations in thoughtful and nuanced manner and not sound bites. And this is very critical for our community because you'll see, hear this again and again, that this is too long or this is too complicated and just simplify it, simplify it, simplify it. And we need to have a balance because for us, we are trying to create a nuanced understanding of a complex, diverse community and needs. Nothing should be so simple. Lives are not simple. Um, legislations are not simple. So we wanna have that fine balance where we're not falling into this trap where political sound bites are what we're leading into. Because as we know, what we always feel as a Muslim community that things are too simplified, right? People just follow sound bites and form opinions. So we, to be able to move away from that, we have to show leadership in that and take a little bit longer. Use media to educate on the issues instead of seeking accolades. This is this is very, very critical. I think as a community for ourselves, we just need to get in the habit consistently to take every opportunity, even if our community is highlighted or an individual is highlighted, how can we take that and make it an education form so the media understands that the Muslim community is here to educate and not for a pause. Next slide. All right. So I know that was uh, a lot and uh, I apologize if I went a little bit over, but we are very, very excited to share this template with you, to share the model with you. We do feel that it's very, very possible to have it in your state. Uh, we'll also be looking at federal legislations. And so we would love to hear from you. Um, you can email us at info at illmuslimciviccoalition.org and I look forward to the question. Thank you.
Thank you so much, Madia. Um, and you know, we do all these plans and it's with God's grace that we succeed. And so all praise is to our creator who has made this the time for our community um, to do this work and to move the needle forward, um, inshallah, and continue to move it forward together. A question that came up uh, several times in the chat was, um, are, is the Illinois Muslim Civic Coalition a registered 501c3 or c4 or PAC? And in this space of civic work, we actually um, have all three types of organizations, right? Actually four types. There are some organizations that are working ad hoc. It's a group of uh, parents or a group of community activists, and they uh, or organize through WhatsApp or a listserv, et cetera. Great. You can do this work as that. You don't need to be an organization. Remember your power as individual residents and citizens of our nation. Secondly, you could be a 501c3. The Illinois Muslim Civic Coalition and the work that Maddie is describing is through a 501c3. It is a nonprofit tax deductible status in the US. Third, you can do it as a 501c4. That's a nonprofit, but it is not tax deductible. 501c4s can lobby and they can endorse candidates. We also have that at the Illinois stations will be a C3, C4 partnership, the Facebook. We have a ilmuslimcivitcoalition.org is our C3 and coalition-activate is our .org is our C4. Engage also has Engage USA, Engage Action. So there's definitely many organizations that have a C3, C4 partnership. Lastly, you could be a PAC, in which case you can do all of the above and also directly give money to candidates and be political. Uh, we chose not to be a PAC, but there are several organizations that are also a PAC. Engage has a C3, a C4, and a PAC. Maria, a question that came up often in the chat was, um, thank you for this process. You've described it well. How did our community support this process or challenge it? And how did legislators support this process or challenge it? So two kinds of questions about our community and about our legislators. Yeah, um, I thank you for the question. I, I will say this, that this could not be possible without the community. The community supported it and this is why it worked. Um, there were many districts that we identified where there were large demographics of Muslims. We went to them directly. We told them what the legislators um, were going to be voting on, and we asked them to mobilize and have conversations with them. When there was a legislator that voted yes, we also asked them to send them emails and thank yous, so that was critical. That's how they helped. How the legislators responded is literally by seeing the fact that there, were, there was a community that knew what they were talking about, was an unapologetic for what they were asking for. And I will say this, I'll use this phrase, you have to create FOMO for legislators because they want to do the right thing and they want to be where the party is. And the party was to make sure that they were making history uh, in the state of Illinois. And so we're so thankful for that. Mm -hmm. I, I think Maria also gets now, and, and we get that in our briefings with legislators uh, requests. So what are your laws in 2023? And can I be a chief sponsor of one of them? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I think that what, what's critical is creating that um, that energy and that anticipation. And so we take full leverage of that. Mm -hmm. Awesome. So thank you. Again, if you would like more information, all um, workshops and sessions such as yourselves and activists such as yourselves all across uh, the, the nation. So I want to turn now to another critical case study and how the U.S. Census 
impacts our communities and how we can impact the census being more accurate and more uh, supportive of our needs. Uh, Maya Berry is, um, many of you know, uh, you know, a great friend of our communities, a activist in our community and the executive director of the Arab American Institute. And really wanna thank Maya for joining us today. She'll speak for about 10 minutes on the stu case study of the census. And then we'll talk again about questions. Thank you so much for inviting us uh, to be with you today, and thank you for all the work that uh, you are doing and all my colleagues are doing. Um, I'll start by talking specifically about why it is important to have an accurate count of communities on the U.S. Census. And frankly, I, I had the pleasure of being able to listen into the panel previously on uh, the, the medical care and medical research. And uh, as was demonstrated and highlighted in that panel, data drives policy. And if you don't have accurate data, you're not going to have a policy that serves communities well. So one of the most important aspects of, of the decennial census is that we need to have an accurate count of all of our communities. Um, it, it literally funds the multi-trillion dollar budget. Um, the federal budget um, accounts for every single penny that our government spends. It is about how we do uh, uh, apportionment, so political representation. There's really almost no aspect of your life uh, that is not uh, touched by the Census Bureau. Um, and the decennial census, from where English as a second language is taught in a, in a local school to where a, a local community will put up a stoplight or a stop sign. Um, so every aspect is, is there and it's absolutely critical. Um, the meaning category in particular is, is the story of how we come um, to, to this issue. Uh, the Arab American Institute was established in 1985. It is a well-known fact uh, that there is a dramatic undercount of Arab Americans. It's one that the Census Bureau agrees is a problem, which is why the Census Bureau has actually been a partner with us on this journey. Um, the Institute was established in 85, and the first partnership we ever had on the decennial census was in 1990. So it gives you a sense of how long um, this process has been taking and why it's important to do. Um, it, initially, and this is sort of important is it, it, in terms of context, there was an effort to say, why don't we have an Arab American category in the census? But frankly, it was not a category that was inclusive enough. So early on in the process, it was determined that the best way to gather information about uh, communities, from, including Arab Americans, was to create what is called the MENA category, Middle East and North Africa. So it encompasses the uh, Arab American population and that it represents the 22 different mem uh, member nations of the Arab Arab League, plus three, um, and those are Iran, Israel, and Turkey. And coming to MENA, uh, that category is, is it's clear, um, it, it was strategically important to do so because it allowed for a broader coalition to come together and advocate for this category. Now, we're having a conversation sometimes here about identity. And to be clear, the US government doesn't give you your identity. The census is not giving you your identity. We're not creating a MENA category. MENA is a geographical area. And within that, people uh, are then able to identify their national origin. Um, there's much that's said about um, uh, many of our communities um, not identifying as white, um, and even though under the OMB Office of Management and Budget Directive, uh, people from the MENA region are currently classified as white. From our perspective, as again, as highlighted by the previous discussion, uh, we are a very di diverse community, just like the American Muslim community is equally diverse. Um, so for our perspective, it is an ethnic category that we are seeking, not a racial one. Arabs can be black, Arabs can be white, Arabs can be brown. It's it's the, it is an ethnic category, not, not a racial one. So those efforts had been underway for some time. It really took hold in 2010 uh, when we began a, a more formal process. By 2015, the U.S. Census Bureau actually tested in its national content test a MENA category, and it was found to improve the count of people from the MENA region. Uh, so when demographers and the experts at the U.S. Census Bureau say this category will improve the count, it generally is perceived to be uh, an important important development um, in terms of uh, moving forward on that category. We were extremely excited um, going into the 2020 decennial census uh, and really confident that the MENA category would be available to us for the first time. What that would mean is that there would be a MENA checkbox. Folks would be able to check that off and then again within that identify their own ethnicity or national origin. Regrettably, our country saw the most uh, dis the most politicized decennial ever um, during the uh, uh, previous administration, um, and the MENA category was abandoned. Uh, so, a category that had been tested and proven to be uh, 
uh, accurate, uh, meaning it would improve the count, uh, was abandoned. And instead, the, uh, the uh, previous administration was engaged in a process where they were talking about introducing a citizenship question, something that had not been tested and had not been on the US census, decennial census since 1950. So that process regrettably uh, really upended um, uh, the progress that had been made over decades. Um, and it didn't happen uh, in 2020. Having said that, I will tell you that the work on the MENA category for the 2030 decennial census began before the 2020 uh, process was complete. Um, it is, again, it's helpful in this process when the government agencies that are in charge of this, uh, that oversee this process, understand that there is a problem and have been a partner in attempting to remedy it. Um, so we have had um, uh, meetings with the new census director. We've had meetings with the Office of Management and Budget. We have a broad coalition in place uh, that includes colleagues from uh, the Latino community, the Black community, uh, the Asian American community. It's just a broad coalition in place to advocate for a, uh, data equity and, and getting to a media category and improving the count uh, on the census is how we do that. So. Uh, I'm pretty confident that by by 2030 we'll we'll be positioned well positioned to to have a MENA category. Uh, I will tell you that though in advance of that, um, the the this decennial happens. Um, it, it's incredible how quickly the work on the decennial begins. So there is a a, a survey called the American Community Survey that goes into local communities, um, regular continuously, it's ongoing. And, and our efforts are already underway to say, how do we get the MENA category added to the, to the ACS uh, in advance of talking about how it gets added uh, to the 2030 uh, decennial. So that, that's that's the, the sort of quick version of how we got to, to where we are on MENA. Um, and that is, you know, again, doing everything right. And then there's an unexpected development, uh, but you still pick up the pieces and you move on and, and, and you look to uh, advance it. There is a point though I want to make, um, and that is, of course, you're having the conversation in the context of the American Muslim community. And um, uh, just like um, um, the as I said, the, the American Muslim community is, is very diverse. And Arab is not a proxy for Muslim. It is, um, it, it's important to understand that um, we, we, we have from uh, data of some of the presenters today, we know that uh, a plurality of American Muslims are black. Uh, I believe, if I'm, if I'm wrong, uh, please correct me, but uh, the single largest continuing growth of American Muslims in this country are among the Latino community. Um, so when we talk about uh, getting it to a better count in the decennial census, there is, the census does do a faith-based outreach um, effort, um, and, and those are important. So as you think about uh, how we can get to this is having a better count, there are ways which we, we can partner uh, as American Muslim communities um, with the Census Bureau in terms of faith-based approach to outreach when it gets the get out the count efforts. Um, having said that, um, it's important to note that uh, because of the issue of, uh, and I think a very important issue uh, of separation of religion and state, uh, the, the census will not ask, um, in fact, it's prohibited by law since Congress passed a law back in 1976 to ask a question about one's religion. When you receive the census, you're actually required by law to fill out every question. Um, so none of the questions are optional. They're there and you're required to fill them out. So if the government were to ask you about your religion, um, I, I think uh, it's been determined, uh, and, and I would argue perhaps correctly, uh, that based on religious liberty issues and the separation of, of religion and state, that uh, the census does not ask a question about one's faith. Um, so there are, I just want to point that out because I think it's important to understand it in this context, but having said that again, uh, for example, when we did polling in our community about how to do our, we did both polling and focus groups about how to reach our community, how to arrive at one of the better counts, uh, among the most uh, uh, valuable voices that were determined uh, as, as key to uh, advocate for filling out the census, completing the form, uh, were actually religious leaders, uh, people's individual uh, congregants were, were uh, people's individual, um, either priests or imams, or were, were deemed as uh, important voices, as validators for the, the need to participate in the census. So I think there are ways in which a faith-based approach can be taken here, but important to note that um, uh, there really is a pretty strong line between asking the religion question and the decennial uh, by a formal government document. Uh, I will stop there and look forward to your questions and answers, but thank you again for all the work that everyone's doing.
Thank you, Maya. Um, and thank you for your and your team's leadership on this. I know that um, the coalition and dozens of organizations, if not hundreds of organizations across the nation, were taking your lead as this work was being done. And it was very important. Um, one of the questions being asked in the chat is, so we're preparing. There should always be a prep time because it's just not going to happen magically where 2030 meets our needs. Right now, we have over 500 um, policymakers, center leaders, faith leaders, et cetera, that have registered for this conference. What should they be doing between now and the next cens census to prepare and follow your lead? Yeah, that's a really good question. Um, on the right now, we're in the phase of, of the policy, uh, addressing the policy problem before we get to the get out the count uh, problem. <laughs> um, so right now, we really are engaged directly with the agencies who will be, be uh, making uh, the changes in policy that will allow us for the MENA category to be added. Um, if folks are engaged with their member of Congress, that is always a good thing to do. Talk about the, how you felt when you took the census form. Talk about if there was a box that represented you, what that felt like. And if there was, that's wonderful. I filled it out. This is how it could be better. And it just share with those members that, um, you know, the MENA category is something that a broad coalition is working in support of as part of a combined question uh, that we believe will arrive at a better count for all of our communities. So I think that's one thing whenever you talk to a member of Congress, just talk about the importance of the decennial census and the need to add a MENA category on the combined question. Separate from that, I will tell you that uh, I trust that your coalition and others are going to come to these local communities in no time at all because the the work the preparation work for the get out the count efforts happened years in advance and the partnerships on the state and local levels are how we actually do the census it's it's absolutely critical work that happens in local communities so please just uh look out for when those coalitions come together uh, and those campaigns are put in place and and we really will count on you to be the vehicle uh because you're the trusted voice in your local community I think it's really powerful that you're saying start messaging to our elected officials and our public officials now. And so in the chat, as we did after the last session, we'll also put um, two like talking points. And, and Maya, we, if you could just craft like number one, talk to your legislators and public officials now that we are preparing for the census. Number two, let them know that the decennial census has to reflect the needs of the Muslim community, the vast and diverse American Muslim community community that intersects with many races, ethnicities, or community. Um, one of the questions asks and, and states, our community does not participate enough in the census. We are, as you would might state, hard to reach, undercounted, all of the above. So how do we begin now How do we prepare starting now for our own community to be ready for the 2030 census? Because we ourselves um, identify as difficult to reach and hard to count. Yeah, there are many reasons for why a community would be uh, considered hard to count. And, and um, it, interestingly enough, actually, uh, the language we use, we use to talk about Arab Americans was very similar to what I heard in the previous panel. We are rendered highly visible by U.S. national security policy. We are called as Arab Americans, and certainly one would argue American Muslims as well, are a securitized community. That is, our government's approach to us is viewed through a national security lens. So as a result, highly visible when it comes to certain policies, particularly particularly in a post 9-11 environment and the Patriot Act, but then rendered completely invisible when it comes to data and, and, and the importance of government services and representation. So um, it's yeah. that, that's the, this dichotomy that we find ourselves in here. So the, the work that has to happen is to address that problem. And when we did our focus groups, um, I'll, I'll be honest enough to tell you, I had this whole idea about we really have to be honest with our people and tell them that, yes, we know the government does surveillance in our communities and, and just tackle it directly and address it. And, and this is the messaging we should use. And my idea is completely flopped. The focus groups did not want any of that. They wanted positive messaging about families and younger people. They wanted to make sure kids were counted. So I think you have to acknowledge where the community's at, meet them there, but also understand that, that you know, do your work here. And that and, and enough from our perspective, it was the positive messaging that worked most effectively. I want to be counted. I want my kids to be counted. I want my grandkids to be counted. I want there to be adequate representation of our community. 
That's really critical. Um, and in, you know, this, this is a, a policy conference we began this year with five organizations and all of your organizations joining us. In the years to come, we need full sessions on how to approach the census and how, as organizers, we are going to do this work in the next six years, um, because it isn't a 2030 event. It's a starting now towards 2030 and then moving on to redistricting and many of the other ways that census impacts us, including resources, et cetera. So we had a question from Ilhan Kagri, actually a, an insightful comment that said, yes, this is going to be important, but it won't matter unless we have that holistic approach. And this is why in this policy conference, you're hearing from many different policymakers who are working in the healthcare space working in the census space, working in the legislation space, and now we're going to move on to actually um, voting and political representation. Because if that isn't part of all of this, as Ilhan pointed out earlier, we, we may have a, another Trump or another pushback from uh, people who don't support us and maybe on either side, but not supporting us. Um, and so we'd like to move it to uh, Delegate Sam Rasul. Uh, he's a delegate of the Virginia State House and a great friend, and also really working towards equitable representation and modeling it in Virginia. I know, again, across the Midwest, across uh, Southern states, we're using his model and his template. So Sam, thanks for joining us and all yours. Thank you so much, uh, Delora. It is most certainly a pleasure to be with you. Thank you for inviting me to be part of uh, this afternoon's now um, a presentation. Uh, and let me just say, if every state had an, uh, a, a model organization like the Illinois Muslim Civic Coalition, I mean, this is exactly what you need in 50 states where you have this kind of involvement, this kind of investment. So kudos to you and to uh, your coalition members uh, taking charge and saying, you know, Illinois is where it's at. And as you saw in your chart, uh, that you showed earlier, Illinois has the highest Muslim representation, uh, Muslim uh, population per capita, and right behind it is Virginia. So I join you from Virginia today with uh, some information for you. So um, in the next slide, you get to see a little bit about uh, me. So they said I'm coming on right before uh, lunch. So I'm part of the uh, show here just to um, keep you awake. I'm the first Muslim ever elected in Virginia history, but where I'm elected is interesting. It's in the foothills of Appalachia, um, so I get to be the country Muslim. I'm, I'm in the ninth year in the state legislature. I've loved being able to serve, but it was quite a surprise in our election in 2014 when we were able to make some progress, and that uh, it leads us to say that we can win and run uh, just about anywhere. On the next slide, you'll see just how few representatives we have. Now, so in America, there are over half a million elected officials at the federal, state, and local level. And we only have a few hundred that are actually Muslims. So if we said that 1% of the population were Muslim, you'd roughly say that that'd be about 5,000 uh, individuals. Instead, we have less than one-tenth of 1% who are elected representatives around, uh, uh, around the whole country. And if you think about the appointed positions, that's about a similar uh, representation. So what we need to be doing to build a, a broad pipeline is to keep a few things uh, in mind. If you're looking to run or wanting to be appointed, which is an important part of uh, civic action, uh, think about uh, one of the, the biggest questions I ask incoming candidates are, where do you actually live? The, you just heard uh, excellent presentations, not only from uh, Maria on how to be involved in the legislature, but uh, Maya talking about the census, and census is very specific about what census block, what census track, and how these districts then are redrawn. Many times we have candidates who want to be involved, uh, but uh, unfortunately do not uh, know specifically where they live in, in respect to what they can run for. They wake up and say, I want to run, uh, and uh, for, uh, for many candidates, I say plan in advance where you're going to be rooting yourself. Number two, uh, this is a people business. Uh, while we hear a lot about the, the policy side, remember that uh, you've got to invest in those relationships. Number three, you've got to play the long game. So two things that I want to focus on 
uh, as we're thinking about uh, building this pipeline are, you know, how do we organize the broad coalitions necessary to make progress? And number two, how do we make our messages stick? So in the next slide, we have some catalyst data around what's called the Peoria 9. So many times we think about the, the coalitions, um, uh, as you might've seen from one of the presentations earlier, it was kind of the iceberg of what we see, our race, ethnicity, uh, religion, and those types of coalitions. But what I'd really like to focus on uh, is uh, values-based coalitions. Uh, in areas like mine, as well as many others across the country, we uh, are not only trying to build coalitions uh, across race and ethnicity, religion, but we also need to build values-based coalitions. And that is a powerful thing when we can uh, be able to connect people across socioeconomic status, as we heard from the healthcare presentation earlier. In this Peoria 9 information that you see here, instead of looking at everyone in buckets of Democrats, Republicans, Independents, we have nine values-based uh, data. In this, you'll see super seculars, for example, who are not religious, traditional Democrats who are uh, rather uh, religious, uh, paycheck to paycheck progressives who are thinking uh, that uh, they're very socioeconomically fragile, libertarian left tend to be younger uh, and very skeptical of government involvement, the new suburbans. Are, we've seen a suburban push, especially post-Trump. Nostalgic traditionalists look at uh, the way things used to be uh, and reminisce the merit and market vote with their pocketbook. Identity conservatives are exactly just that. And Fox loyalists are there to defeat the liberal agenda no matter what. But if you look at this and think of the Muslim um, uh, contingency, we roughly are uh, six out of these nine pretty consistently from paycheck to paycheck progressives to identity conservatives. But the key is, is how we message uh, and how we build those coalitions are finding those common values. And each one of these uh, nine have a, a specific set of values. And so if you come into uh, an issue that you're running or a campaign or your candidacy and your candidacy specifically messages to one of the nine, you likely will not be able to build the winning coalition uh, that is needed. So this is very helpful data in understanding and trying to weave uh, all of these together. In the next slide, we'll think about not just building the coalition, but how to make that coalition uh, stick. And making that stick uh, on the next slide talks about the uh, six moral foundations. We will uh, find that there's this book, uh, The um, uh, Righteous Mind. If we could go to the next slide, please. The Righteous Mind, written by Jonathan Haidt, Why Good People Are Divided by Politics and Religion. What you have here is the moral matrix and the six foundations of morality. Why this is very interesting is that the top uh, leaders, uh, the best communicators, were, are consistently able to appeal to uh, five or six of these six foundations on a consistent basis. So if you really want your message to stick, you're really wanting to make progress in your um, campaign, whether it be from a candidacy perspective or on issues, uh, you've got to keep in mind the best in moral psychology and, and we'll also touch base on some neuroscience. And if you contrast this liberal moral matrix with the next slide, which it shows you the, the moral matrix of a social conservative, uh, Go back one slide, please. And you will find uh, that uh, there is a difference in the weighting. So what does this mean here? Well, in, these, uh, in the calculation of morality, the way we actually connect in a way that, that actually sticks, uh, we've got to make sure that we are uh, messaging in such a way that uh, really appeals to the broadest base. So for example, in these six that you see here, the Care Harm Foundation is a a piece of uh, morality that says, are we, are we providing the care or is there something that is harming someone? Liberty and oppression speaks for itself. Uh, fairness is something fair or someone cheating. Are we loyal uh, to an institution? Are we respecting authority and then sanctity and degradation, the, the kind of purity of something? This is the calculation in contrasting the liberal one that you saw earlier, which was somewhat of an uh, imbalanced and heavily focused on the Care Harm Foundation, uh, we find that the successful individuals uh, who are able to communicate, like President Obama, President Clinton, President Reagan, and uh, John F. Kennedy, for example, 
consistently hit on five or six of these um, uh, foundations on a regular basis and had a broad based appeal. Uh, and so if you're wanting to make your message stick, you've got to uh, keep that in mind. And the last piece on the next slide will be on the, the neuroscience of um, how the science of all of this actually works. So you'll hear about a lot of the policy that we've, uh, we've just talked about, which is excellent work. And uh, this emphasizes the fact that you cannot discuss policy with individuals or with groups before you've built a relationship with them first. Trust uh, goes to the very heart of the science of how our brain is wired. If you picture the brain as the uh, uh, reptilian brain, and then you've got the kind of more advanced portion. Uh, everything goes through the reptilian brain first, and it's asking this question, what is the purpose or what is the why of the individual organization in front of me? And then the how are the values with which they are interacting with me? Are they respecting, listening, inclusive? Once I understand and feel comfortable with your purpose and understand and appreciate the values with which you're communicating and connecting, then the reptilian brain allows for inform information flow uh, to the cortex, the, the more advanced part of your brain. And so when, we, when we're trying to take our information, the policies we really care about and just pound people over the head with it, no matter how much sense it makes, it will not work uh, unless you've been able to build that relationship. And I could speak to that firsthand as someone being elected here in the foothills of Appalachia with very few Muslim Americans, very few uh, being of Arab American descent myself, because we were able to find and build relationships with a broad base of individuals. And so not only do we want to understand and have the best policies that we want to advance, but then figure out exactly how we're going to be able to implement that. And that's with building some broad uh, coalitions and building the best relationships. So think about those relationships and think about how we're going to make them stick as we uh, build uh, the relationships for the future. And with that, uh, of course, we're happy to answer any questions. I'm sorry, I uh, have you on mute. You spoke really well um, and, and very clearly about that relationship building um, before we do anything like build policy. But a question was asked, even before we do anything like run for office, uh, what we're seeing in the last couple of years is um, running for office in the American Muslim community, especially in the larger areas or in areas where there's deeper population um, supports, uh, it's trendy, um, it's sexy to run for office. And yet you have people running for office um, at higher levels of government that have never been activists in the organizations or people running for office that have um, not really built those relationships with um, labor or the community or to uh, or or the or the neighborhoods or their condominium association or wherever they might be. Talk a little bit about um, how you decide to run for office and the strategy our community is going to have to employ, given finite resources, finite, uh, you know, supports available across the nation? Yeah, it's a great question. Uh, you know, and what's important about this is a lot of us have made uh, the, uh, the mistakes. My first run for office was for U.S. House as the youngest congressional candidate in America back in 2008. And that is certainly not how I would advise folks to, to get involved. Uh, don't underestimate the importance of being in certain appointed positions at the local uh, at state and federal level. These appointed positions get you into not only certain circles from an advocacy perspective, but also legitimize uh, your uh, what you bring to the table. Uh, and so, when we're thinking about wanting to to run for office and be involved, um, you know, we we certainly never want to tell someone we'll wait your turn. Uh, but it, it is important that people do feel that you're in it for the long haul. And if this is a relationship a relationship based business. Uh, they want to know that you've invested in the community and that you're really there for them. And I'd like to, Delara, reference what's at the core of our faith. Our faith isn't even a, a judgment of what actions we take, but of our intention. And the only way I can explain the people giving me a shot here in the Bible Belt of Virginia was that they could feel the intentions that we were coming uh, with. And so hopefully the, the more you can bring those intentions by showing you're vested in the community, the better off you'll be. Thank you. Thank you so very much. I uh, wanted to reiterate 
Um, today, uh, you know, I, I was able to begin by saying that um, uh, civic justice comes uh, when um, we have the um, activism and the policy that connects with the story. And what you saw throughout the day today, but in this section specifically, was connecting the story with the action and with the policy and codification. Um, so Madia Muzaffar of the Illinois Muslim Civic Coalition, Maya Berry of the Arab American Institute, and Delegate Sam Rasool of Virginia um, were all able to help us with this and will continue this work in the years to come. We have some action steps for you. Um, right now, primaries are going on across the nation. Uh, I know in our own state, we are heavy in the Illinois primary, which is June 28th. Um, I know that right here in the Midwest, in the East Coast, uh, where we are with MPAC, the primaries are in June. So one, register to vote, check your registration to vote. Because we had redistricting, you have sometimes new places you're gonna be voting and new districts you're gonna be voting for, check all that. Number two, get your sample ballot. We have a website here um, that links you directly. If you put in your address, you'll actually get what your ballot looks like. So before you even go in to vote, you can check and see who you wanna vote for, circle them, take it in with you. And then get others to vote. Let's be honest, the 500 or so of us that registered for this conference, <laughs> I'm speaking to the choir. You've already drunk the Kool-Aid with us. You know the importance of this work, but we all know dozens of family and close friends that aren't doing this work and we need them to be voting with us. Second, advocacy building in your community. Please, these are replicable. They are not hard. Once we build the system, we just need to do it over and over again. Top 10 states that have the most populous Muslim communities that's 2 million people right there in our nation. So please email us at info at IL Muslim Civic Coalition, and we will connect you to whichever organization is the best fit for your uh, legislation and policy that you wanna change. And then to learn, of course, more about the Arab American Institute, we have our, their website here. And, um, and of course you can find Sam uh, on his website, samrasool.com. So thank you so very much for joining us. Uh, this is now time for lunch. We will have videos showing uh, during lunch about the work that different organizations have been doing. What is civic justice? And you are welcome to watch them. We will return at one o'clock p.m. Eastern time, 12 o'clock p.m. Central time, 11 a.m. Uh, Pacific and 10 a.m. Mountain. Assalamu alaikum. My name is Salam Amriyadi. I'm the president of Muslim Public Affairs Council. I'm Wael Zayat, CEO of Engage and Engage Action. And uh, our panel is going to be on the January 6th insurrection and the rise uh, of white supremacist violence in our country as a threat to our democracy. Uh, first of all, I just want to thank uh, the organizers and the hosts uh, of this wonderful conference, our inaugural uh, American Muslim National Policy Conference 2022, uh, the first time that uh, uh, great organizations like ISPU, the Illinois Muslim Civic Coalition, um, the American Muslim Health Professionals, Engage, the Muslim Public Affairs Council, and a number of other supporting organizations are coming together for this policy conference. The main message is uh, for our government to start listening to American Muslim voices in its policy making. And it's for the betterment of American society, for the interests uh, of US policy. Uh, it would only make more sense if our US policymakers talk to Muslims instead of just talking about Muslims. So we're really excited about uh, this inaugural conference. And this particular session is, is critical uh, in terms not just of national security, uh, but also in terms of 
civil rights and in terms of democracy. I mean, we can look at it in one of two ways, that we are victims uh, of violence like everybody else. Uh, but more importantly, we are involved in the defense of democracy. And so working with our allies, with our partners in the Jewish, uh, Black, Latino, uh, Christian communities, Buddhist, Hindu communities, people of all backgrounds in working against any type of, type of extremism and reconciling on the double standards uh, in our national security policy is critical uh, for the future of democracy. And I think that's really the, the deeper reason why we're involved in this issue. And with January 6th, what happened, uh, as we all witnessed that day, uh, and the investigation uh, after that, is making us think uh, about where pluralistic democracy uh, can go, or, or if, if it has a future, uh, or are we only talking about ethno-religious uh, segmentation of our society? Uh, so Robert Pape, Dr. Robert Pape from the University of Chicago testified today to the U.S. Senate Committee uh, on Counterterrorism. And he said, the volatile capabilities and ideas, the combination of which produces a deadly cocktail that promises more violence is the main problem. Ideas based in the great replacement theory are given capability by financing of well, wealthy individuals. So these are some of the issues that are going to be addressed. And we have two very important guests who will be with us in the converse conversation. Uh, the first is Acting <laughs> Assistant Secretary Samantha Vinograd with the Department of Homeland Security. Uh, Ms. Vinograd is the Acting Assistant Secretary uh, for Counterterrorism and Threat Prevention and Senior Counselor for the National Security at the US Department of Homeland Security. And she's been on CNN as a national security analyst, senior advisor at the Biden Institute, and a visiting fellow at the University of Chicago Institute of Politics. Also with us will be senior staff attorney Diala Shemis of the Center for Constitutional Rights. Diala Shemis is a senior staff attorney for CCR, where she works on challenging government and law enforcement abuses perpetrated under the guise of national security, both in the US and abroad. Prior to joining the uh, CCR, Diala was clinical supervising attorney and lecturer in law at Stanford Law School and senior staff attorney supervisor supervising the Clear Creating Law Enforcement Accountability and Responsibility Project at CUNI School of Law. So with that, uh, I'd like to go to uh, Samantha, if she's with us, and let her uh, respond to this quote uh, of Dr. Pate uh, today in, in the Senate. Where does the great white replacement theory uh, play a, a role in this rise uh, of violence and violent extremism in our country? Thank you for the question. And before I respond, let me just uh, share with all of you how pleased I am to be with you today. It is, is truly an honor to be speaking with you, having this conversation, answering your questions, and perhaps most importantly, just listening. So on behalf of the Department of Homeland Security, thank you uh, for having me here today. Well, we cannot hear, but can others? Can you, can you guys hear me? We cannot hear you. Uh, having some technical difficulties. I can hear her here. Yeah. All right, let's go ahead. Go ahead. How about now? Yes, can you hear me? thank you. <laughs> Wonderful. Yeah. Well, then I'm sorry to everyone who heard my intro before. I, I just wanted to share before answering your question how pleased I am to be with you today and what an honor it is to be speaking with you, answering your questions, and just most importantly, listening uh, to what all of you are experiencing, hearing, feeling. And I hope that this is the first of, of many, many conversations. So thank you for having me. With respect to your question on the white replacement theory, we are unfortunately in the midst of living real world examples of the impact that this horrific theory is having on communities within the United States and across the country. The white replacement theory has led to violence um, in uh, both hemispheres. And, uh, and we, uh, I'm hearing that we're, I'm still having audio issues. Can folks hear me? Yes, we can hear you. Okay. Um, the white replacement theory is leading to acts of violence and fatalities around the world. 
And the problem is that the white replacement theory is being promulgated uh, in very open spaces. So these horrific theories um, that are abhorrent, they're unacceptable, are not are no longer just a matter of individuals exercising their rights to free speech. These horrific theories, whether it's right replacement theory or other uh, conspiracy theories or disinformation that we hear targeting specific groups of individuals, whether it's the Muslim community, the Jewish community, the immigrant community and elsewhere, we're seeing an, an actual nexus to violence, which is where the Department of Homeland Security comes in. Um, you know, Our job is to identify um, to work to evaluate potential acts of violence before they occur and seek to prevent them. And for example, in the case of Buffalo, where the white uh, replacement theory played such a particular role, this individual um, was sensibly radicalized over a period of time, um, exhibited indicators that he was potentially going down a pathway for violence to violence. And there was very little um, help provided to him what we seek to do at the department is to work with members of various communities such that when they see an individual consuming these horrific conspiracy theories, making threatening statements, spending time in extremist websites or digesting extremist material, for example, like the Christchurch Manifesto, that they place a call and ask for help such that an individual doesn't continue down that radicalization path. And that's something that we, we seek to work uh, with all communities on to prevent other acts of, more acts of violence. You know, the, the other part about the theory is that it actually started in France, where it asserted that the problem was immigration and it was pointing to Muslims who happen to be of Algerian, Moroccan, North African descent. And so this is an example where anti-Muslim animus is playing a role, even though in the United States it's not as much of a role, it's really directed at Jews, Blacks, and Latino communities. Um, and, and so we have an example where if we had addressed this problem earlier that was anti-Muslim, it, it shows that anti-Muslim rhetoric is not just a Muslim problem. It's a social problem. It's an American problem. And we really have to work more collectively with uh, these kinds of conspiracy theories that lead people uh, to violence. Um, I just, just wanted to make that point as we're as we as Muslims are dealing with anti-Muslim animus in the United States, I think we have to frame it in a broader sense. Not, it's not just about us. Uh, it's about the larger society. Uh, well, did you want to take Yeah, um, that, Samantha, if I could, we can stay with you for, for another question. Um, MPAC and Engage partnered together on our recent report uh, regarding the double standards of US uh, FTO and domestic terrorism prosecutions. Uh, we've seen, for example, uh, all too often when uh, somebody of the Muslim faith commits uh, a, a terrorist act, it's immediately labeled an FTO uh, case and, and they're prosecuted accordingly all, all too often. Yeah, we just discussed the white replacement theory, which is a transnational and a global movement and ideology, yet when a white perpetrator commits those same acts, uh, in some cases, use of the manifesto that was refers to the attacks in New Zealand against Muslim worshippers, and uh, you know uh, other atrocities committed by international uh, uh, Nazis in Europe and elsewhere. Uh, it's prosecuted under domestic statute. How how can we have still these contradictions, and and how can we address them moving forward forward to unify them? But also, when we continue to do that, we're really otherizing the Muslim community and Islam because it's always foreign. Uh, I'm wondering if you can just comment on that and let us know how we can perhaps overcome this. I wanna to respond to your question, but first I just wanna piggyback on the comment that was made about the white replacement theory um, and the fact, yes, it is transnational. Yes, uh, in France, um, uh, where I'm from, um, a lot of the white replacement theory is focused on uh, perceived Muslim immigrants just based upon immigration flows into France. In other countries, it's focused on other populations that are immigrating into the country and replacing white Christians. The fact of the matter is that 
both from a personal perspective, based on my family's history as a daughter of a Holocaust survivor and as the Assistant Secretary for Counterterrorism. The fact of the matter is that these hateful conspiracy theories, when they affect one community, they affect all of us. And from a professional perspective, what we are seeing is, um, I'm trying to think of the right term here, we see individuals kind of shopping for hateful things to focus on. So an individual may start out with anti-Muslim bias, piggyback onto anti, um, anti-Semitism and just overall live within a culture of hate. And that's not to minimize the hate directed against any particular community. But from, again, from a personal and professional perspective, that is why we are focused on addressing hate with the nexus to violence, whomever the target of that may be, because it metastasizes so quickly. With respect to um, prosecutions, I'm gonna defer questions on prosecutions to the Department of Justice um, because that's outside the purview of what I work on. What I can tell you is this, from the Department of Homeland Security's perspective, we are focused on preventing, detecting, and mitigating acts of targeted violence and terrorism, regardless of the ideological motivation or the perpetrator. And that comes into play as we talk about domestic prevention efforts, as well as um, the work that we do in coordination as, as part of our intelligence uh, evaluations and work with the law enforcement community. Um, regardless of whether an individual is directed by or inspired by a foreign terrorist organization or um, is motivated by what we call domestic violent extremism. So think about white supremacy or anti-government violent extremists. Um, what we are seeking under Secretary Mayorkas's leadership is to demonstrate through our actions, not just through my words today, but through our actions, that we are focused on the perpetrator potential violence and not focused on the underlying ideology and separating it out in the way that you just articulated. I will, I will share with all of you, um, I am aware of the history of the department's um, efforts in countering violent extremism and unintended and unfortunate consequences that occurred as part of that work, which is why I'm stressing the actions along with the words part as we seek to work with community members. Um, I spoke with um, MPAC leadership in the aftermath of Buffalo, but just as we continue our work, really showing you that our approach is different and that we are ideologically agnostic in this respect. Yeah, I, 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 I appreciate that. We appreciate that, uh, uh, Samantha. However, the term domestic terrorism is a misnomer because it is a transnational movement. And it and just mere perception and, and to a large to some extent, the actual uh, what's actually happening on the ground is that domestic terrorism uh, is uh, for white nationalists who whose civil liberties will be upheld even under investigation and incarceration and uh, uh, prosecution. Yet, if, a, if, a, if an American Muslim who was born here is under investigation, they're put under the foreign terrorist investigation uh, framework who, and their civil liberties will be suspended and the whole community becomes the target. That's been the double standard we've been dealing with actually since 1995 when the Oklahoma City bombing uh, attack happened. It was blamed on Muslim initially, Muslims initially, but it turned out to be uh, these two white uh, militia members and the um, 1996 uh, anti-terrorism law was passed under Clinton, the Clinton administration. That's where you find the statute on the use of secret evidence, which was actually used against Muslims uh, after 9-11 and up to 9-11 actually. So the double standard is, is, is more than, um, you know, whether we, we, we can rely on our authorities to be agnostic uh, on the issue. And I, and I appreciate it. And I, and I, and I sense a, a lot of sincerity from you in saying that, but we need help in really reconciling these double standards uh, by uh, US officials. And I hope we can, we can talk to you about that uh, more in the future. Did you wanna comment on that or, or we, can, we can go on? What I'll just say is um, something I started with, which is I'm here to listen and I'm hearing what you're saying. And I think that an important follow on conversation would include the Department of Justice, the folks that are actually doing the investigations. Um, more than anything, it is my desire to partner with MPAC and uh, individuals joining with us today to identify these issues and seek to address them because we all have the, sh the same goal, which is to ensure the safety of our communities. Well, thank you. We're, we're all bored there and we'll, we'll invite the Department of Justice uh, 
uh, in the future. Now, uh, we want to go to uh, Diala. Um, you've heard a lot of what we've been talking about. I'm sure you have a lot to say about that. So why don't we let you uh, jump right in and, and join the conversation and comment on the questions and, and answers that you've heard so far. Thank you, and thank you for having me. And I have to apologize for my several octaves lower voice. Uh, it's, been, it's been a rough week, gun, um, but I'm really glad to be here with you all. Um, and congratulations on putting this conference on. Uh, you know, I, I really appreciate being in this space because uh, Muslim, Arab, South Asian communities are in an incredibly difficult position um, right now and want to acknowledge that. Um, so the challenging position is of being amongst those, as you laid out in your comments, uh, who are maybe the most motivated to want to see real concrete solutions to white supremacist violence, um, while also having a very good reason or a whole slew of really good reasons to be wary of many of the proposals to expand um, US counterterrorism laws or the US counterterrorism infrastructure, which has you know, predominantly been used um, and deployed very aggressively against Muslim communities here in the US um, and, and abroad too. Um, as, as I'm sure is no uh, surprise or nothing new to this audience, the counterterrorism campaign has included um, demographic mapping of Muslim communities, uh, documenting things like where they eat and they pray, mass suspicion of surveillance programs, oftentimes in the name of you know, radicalization theories that are being re upped um, as we look for solutions of how to address, you know, the abhorrent uh, incidents like uh, the Capitol riots and uh, the Texas shooting and Buffalo shooting and the list goes on and on. Um, these uh, radicalization theories have been uh, repeatedly shown to be flawed, um, you know, in the most crass versions have named things like identifications of Muslim types of behavior as indicators of potential criminality. Um, and over the years, and as a result of you know, really significant challenges by uh, Muslim organizations and other civil liberties groups, they've been um, somewhat refined, improved, altered, uh, transitioned to counter violent extremism programs, but they still are sort of based on that very same fundamental idea. Um, and and I, I don't know that I've really heard uh, good solutions. And, and I wanna sort of weigh in on so a couple of things that were said, um, moments of, I mean, I, I sort of invite us to think in sort of a, a longer view, right, temporally. You were right to bring up the Oklahoma City bombings, um, that was in 96, and although the ostensible purpose was to address white violence, um, the result was the Anti-Terrorism and Effective Death Penalty Act, which primarily uh, you know, criminalized uh, or added a set of charges, it tar primarily targeted, you know, communities of color. Um, it made non-citizens who had lived legally in the U.S. for years suddenly subject to automatic deportation, uh, material support laws borne out in the EDPA um, ballooned, and uh, they now encompass uh, protected First Amendment conduct. We see that kind of uh, fallout every day at, at CCR and how material support, um, the chilling effect of expansive material support laws um, is very real, including in, in, in Muslim communities and Palestinian advocacy groups, um, as well as, you know, uh, anyone else, you know, the, I just kind of want to note that there is not only the criminal the threat of criminal prosecution, but there are also expansive civil prosecution elements that are being used right now, today, very aggressively against advocates and activists um, as a way to silence them in uh, litigation that's called strategic litigation against public participation. And so that, oh, sorry. No, I just want, if I could just stop you there and ask, so what would you recommend as, as the main um, approach to addressing white uh, supremacist violence against uh, communities of colors and against the minorities, uh, how how would you advise the government pursue that? Because at the end of the day, we do need security, mm -hmm. but what would be the alternative for the existing policies and laws? Now, I would just add also that yeah. the, the Muslim community, perhaps more than any other community, plays a double role. One, it is really uh, one of the primary targets of white supremacists globally, uh, as well as in the U.S., uh, alongside the Jewish community and, and perhaps the African-American community, especially in America, but also have been viewed 
as public enemy number one in many circles, particularly uh, during the global war of, on terror. So we're both the recipient as well as, well, the recipient on both ends here of being uh, viewed with suspicion as a perpetrator, but also uh, knowing ourselves as uh, the primary victims. Um, I really can't think of another community that's kind of stuck in this position. And it is having an adverse effect on how we conceptualize our role and engage from a from a position of strength and comfort. You know, we're worried about the United States and our democracy. We're worried about what's happening in the fight against global fascism. And, and we have a role to play, but there's all this baggage, all these legacy issues that we're dealing with that are making it difficult for our community, our organizations to figure out our rightful place in this very important conversation and policies. Go ahead, yeah. Expand on that point. I mean, I think it's a really yeah. important one, and and you can I disagree, add, by the way, but that's just where we see it. No, I think it's it's right on. Um, and I would add that um, you know, black political dissent in the U.S. has also been something that has been targeted by even the domestic terrorism language. And this is where you know you were so right in the previous conversation. And I would love to have further engagement on this question of the distinction between foreign terrorist organizations and domestic terrorist organizations, as you laid out really effectively, domestic, uh, foreign has become, not to use an academic term, but racialized as Muslim uh, because of who, which organizations are predominantly on uh, US foreign terrorist lists and so on. Um, and domestic, we're now trying to say or solve for the problem by saying, well, that's gonna be white supremacists, right? But where in the definition of domestic terrorism are we actually gearing it towards uh, the ostensible targets of a lot of these pushes, right? White violence, um, white supremacist violence. And, you know, of course, it's not politically palatable, palatable to pass a bill or legislation that says we're going to go after white supremacists. Um, it's more politically palatable to say we're going to go after all domestic, uh, racially motivated, violent extremists. And what we also have seen, and you'll forgive me for having deep mistrust in agencies, um, given the long history in, in a lot of you know federal law enforcement agencies, given the long history of um, of you know repression and discriminatory um, uh, reactions to civil rights movements as well as Muslim communities, uh, and and so the question is, well, maybe right now we have the right administration in place and we have the right motivations in place, but what happens once we pass these expanded authorities? And we have the doubling down, as we did under the Trump administration, um, against, for example, Black communities uh, who've been named, uh, you know, there was a crass term, term of Black identity extremists that was used in, in light of the Black Lives Matter movement. And then that sort of gotten gobbled up in the racially motivated violent extremism uh, definition. And so there's sort of equality there against white extremists and Black extremists. And I, I, I just wonder where the guardrails are for abuses in the future. Hmm. No, thank you for that. And and it, it's a complicated subject, but I think we're in a better place, at least in terms of the discourse of it. Uh, and this is where I'm I'm just so appreciative that Samantha has joined us and 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 the you know the current leadership of the Department of Homeland Security genuinely cares about these issues, these contradictions, and and you know. We know that affected communities are part of the conversations, finally. Uh, Samantha, looking forward, uh, can you tell us a little bit about some of the things that the administration and particularly DHS are doing to and have done to reshape, revamp, you know, what we still refer to as countering violent extremism programs, CBE. What happened to them since the administration has taken over? Uh, and, and why should we be less worried if indeed we can be, about the excesses of such programs. Where are they now? And, and just educate the, the audience about them and, and the thought process behind the changes. I'm glad that you asked that because we have a lot of work to do with Muslim community and other communities to show with our actions that our approach is different. I'm going to share with you how that, appro how that approach is different. But what we seek to do uh, is put that into action at the community level. So that it's not just me speaking to you, it's all of you seeing this and starting um, to trust that we are taking a different approach. We recognize that the most effective prevention mechanism today is based on 
identifying indicators that an individual may be going down a path to violence. The threat profile of individuals per, uh, perpetrating violence, if we look at over the last several years, there are commonalities, common indicators, and I mentioned a few of them before. So consuming extremist content, spending time on extremist websites, um, uh, making threatening statements, things of that nature. The other commonality that we see is after almost every attack, people around the subject say he or she was making threats. You know, he was spending a lot of time reading the Christchurch Manifesto, but I didn't want to get him in trouble. So I didn't want to call the police or, you know, spending a lot of time on these, you know, in these extremist chat rooms, but you know, I didn't really think it was going to lead to something, so I didn't take any action. Almost after every single, almost after almost every single attack, we hear that. What our new approach does that um, was launched in May of last year under the Center for Prevention Programs and Partnerships. What we seek to do is educate people around the country on what those indicators are, and from there, educate people on how to seek help. Our approach is not law enforcement centric. There, I was speaking with Black community leaders last week and made this point. There may be cases where law enforcement should be involved if there's been a uh, where, where that's warranted. What DHS approach DHS's approach seeks to do is educate people on the indicators, instill confidence in seeking help from uh, a network of professionals that might be social services, youth services, mental health practitioners, a coach, a faith leader, what have you. Um, such that it's not just calling 911 and the police saying, um, we can't help you because a crime hasn't been committed. We want to get at the early stage of prevention. But number two, this law enforcement is not always the answer. So, you know, in the case of Buffalo has been publicly shared, an individual made a threat. There was some mental health attention and then pause, right? Nothing happened. There was no ongoing care. We seek to avoid that exact situation. Um, and as I mentioned in my earlier remarks, this is not focused on one any on any type of single um, racial profile of a particular individual. This is focused on what those indicators are. The tough part is in educating people around the country, and then even tougher is instilling the confidence to ask for help because people are worried about getting their friends and family thrown in jail, distrust of police, distrust of government entities. So we have work to do. Uh, we have work to do. And my hope is that we can work together in this endeavor. Again, I realize that that's going to take time, but that that is a new prevention approach. We have field staff around the country um, that seek to engage at the at the local level. We are also, this is an endeavor that I announced to Homeland Security Advisors about two weeks ago after Buffalo. We are very focused on supporting states in the development of targeted violence and terrorism prevention strategies that take this, um, the approach based on these indicators and create these local prevention networks of, pre of prevention practitioners that know how to provide help and ongoing care. We can't do it all on our own. <laughs> so we need help from community members and hope to work with all of you on that. And again, to show you that our approach is different and that it's effective. I'm so sorry. I think you guys are muted. I don't know if I'm the only one having an audio issue. Okay, I think we're back. We're back. I, I was just I was just applauding you, Samantha. You didn't hear it. Um, but <laughs> but yes, uh, and and we we appreciate what what you said, uh, Samantha. And and I'm imploring our community to take up the offer to engage because we're not going to come to any solution without engagement. Uh, we can't just criticize from afar or. Um, isolate ourselves, we, we have to uh, be in the arena, be seen for what we're doing and, and contribute. Um, and there is no right answer. And, and, and actually there's no wrong answer either. It's, these are all uh, trial and error attempts to addressing a very, very complex issue. I, I had two points though I wanted to follow up on and both of you can answer. Uh, I was at a Council on Foreign Relations conference talking about uh, the rise of white supremacist violence and the speaker had said something that was very interesting and somewhat controversial, uh, but it generated a lot of conversation. She said that after 9-11, religious ideology was overemphasized. After January 6th, religion and ideology was underemphasized. 
Do you agree with that statement? And if you can elaborate. I'm curious what is meant by overemphasized in the context post January 6th. I think what we are what we are finding today within our borders. So when, when I refer to kind of the dom domestic terrorism I'm referring to within our borders, what we are finding today is that the most significant terrorism related threat facing our country co comes from lone actors and small groups of individuals. Um, within that within that subset, we are finding um, that a large majority of those individuals are racially or ethnically motivated and or mo motivated by anti-government um, or anti-authority motivations. So based upon all that, the emphasis on religion, for me, I'm focused more on um, the, what the threat actors, ideological motivations are in that respect. And we're finding a lot of racially and ethnically motivated and anti-government and anti-authority. Diala? Um, I am not an expert on white supremacist violence or what I assume is the intended point of the comment that you quoted is Christian, uh, you know, whether Christianity or uh, various forms of Christian beliefs should be factored in. I, I really don't think I can weigh in on this, but it goes to this broader point of wanting to and seeking answers to address the sort of like discriminatory um, uh, history and how Islam has become historically a sort of stand-in for potential for violence. Um, and I, I, I wanna make sure that, you know, that I don't leave unanswered your earlier question of well, what do you think we should do? Um, because it's easy to say what, uh, you know, to, to talk about the pitfalls of all the various proposals. Um, and again, this is, you know, probably completely beyond uh, the scope of my area of expertise and certainly beyond the scope of my job, but uh, we do need political withdrawal of support for Republicans promoting white supremacists and election fraud ideas, right, of gun control. Uh, we need more transparency. For instance, what, it, what would it look like to demand that federal agencies make public how they have and are now using existing resources, right, let alone expanded resources to fight white supremacist violence? Um, again, this goes back to the point that there's no shortage of existing law enforcement uh, tools in the toolbox. Um, and so how can we uh, have more uh, data sharing and transparency and insight into how uh, these existing resources are being deployed? Um, and I wanna acknowledge that these are some of the provisions that were in uh, proposed legislation, the Domestic Terrorism Act that didn't make it through last week. Um, and I just wanna send, uh, kudos to all of the organizations that were involved in really difficult conversations and kind of in, improving the language in that bill to take out what, you know, many civil liberties advocates felt were some problematic um, aspects to it. Uh, you know, noting that, that uh, there's been a domestic terrorism kind of legislation uh, on the roster forever. And every time there's an act of violence, it gets re-upped and, you know, I think it gets a lot of more momentum in these moments, but, um, but that provision, you know, there's a lot of data sharing there, there's more transparency. Um, and so I, I do think some more of that would be interesting. Um, but I also think that we have to continue to press for uh, maybe with more urgency now than before, rolling back broad FBI authorities because currently there's a Biden administration in power and we don't know who the next administration is going to be. And that is a source of real concern for many folks who saw what happened under the previous administration. Um, and so I don't want us to lose focus on that consistent and constant here. It's, and it's a continuing uh, effort, continuing struggle uh, that I think all of us in civil society must continue to work on. And, and I appreciate what you said, Diala, and also Samantha, that we really need to engage communities uh, on, on these issues and make them part of the solution. Uh, and I think that is the one difference I see uh, so far in, in, the, in this, uh, uh, this latest phase uh, of countering this national security threat, and, and we hope to continue engaging. Uh, I also want to just emphasize uh, uh, on behalf of our organizations that we want to engage Republicans who are in agreement that this, is, uh, this white supremacist violent threat is, is a major issue and who push back against any kind of conspiracy theory against uh, mm -hmm. our community or or all communities for that matter. So we, we definitely wanna move away from this being a partisan issue. 
it, it's a national issue. It's an issue of, uh, of, uh, of uh, all people, Republicans and Democrats alike. And so we will engage with Republicans who at least uh, are willing to listen and engage with us on that issue. The, 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 the follow-up question um, that we have uh, on this issue is, in the time when we were, when ISIS and Al-Qaeda were considered the major threat, uh, there was a strategy uh, with, with uh, countering uh, their violence. Uh, one aspect of that strategy was to come up with a counter narrative. At that time, ISIS and Al-Qaeda were saying, America is at war with Islam. And so in many of this, uh, the counterterrorism circles, there was this idea that we have to come up with a counter narrative that America is accepting of Islam and America is engaging and integrating is a place where American Muslims can be uh, equal citizens and so on and so forth. That was the counter narrative, whether it's the right one or not, that's another matter, but that there was an effort to come up with a counter narrative mm -hmm. to these uh, terrorist groups. What is the counter narrative? What do you think we, we should be thinking about in terms of the counter narrative to the great white replacement theory? I mean, we uh, we have an idea. We can we can we can uh, we can assert now, and you can comment on it. Or if you have your own ideas, we we'd love to, we'd like to hear them. I'd love to hear your ideas. Uh, All right. So uh, I think you know what we've been talking about inside MPAC is that the counter narrative to the Great White Replacement Theory is the Great Enrichment Theory. In other words, that we Muslims, Jews, Blacks, Latinos. Uh, people of all backgrounds have enriched America from our contributions, our mere presence, our, uh, our, our increasing the wealth uh, of our country, the economy of our country, vital contributions in science uh, and culture. And that counter narrative needs to be amplified by our government. In other words, we may not be able to contain hate speech because it's a first, it's a protect, it's protected speech under the First Amendment, but we should demand from each other that we lift responsible speech uh, uh, as a counter to it. And so the great enrichment theory is, is a possible counter narrative to that. We've got some positive responses here in our audience too. <laughs> Go ahead, Samantha. Um, I think uh, the great enrichment theory, is that what you refer to it as? The great enrichment theory, is that what we're calling it? That's what I heard, yeah. Great, I don't know if our uh, our host can hear us. Is there another tech issue? Our hosts are frozen to me. Yes, oh, I see some perhaps are unfrozen. Can you, can you guys hear us? Yes. Okay, keep going. Great. So that's, I was just... I mean, that's that's what... It, oh, they can't hear? We got 20% <laughs> or was it 8%? Okay. You guys are a bit frozen, so I'll just start talking and hope that you can hear me. Um, and if you give a thumbs up, that would be great if you can, in fact, hear me. I think, um, I think in general, the administration did publish uh, national strategy to counter domestic terrorism last year. We're actually uh, uh, creeping up on the one year anniversary, which is I believe June, uh, one day next week. Um, and there are several pillars to that strategy, which include um, greater information sharing and a lot of work in the prevention space. DHS has a lot of um, equities in both places. Uh, with respect to the counter narratives, um, it is critically important that we all as community members and just as Americans address hate wherever it arises. So um, it's incumbent on politicians. It's also incumbent upon every member of every community to discount these horrific narratives wherever they hear them. With respect to the broader counter narrative to the uh, white replacement theory, I think we all know in this audience um, the incredible contributions that non-white Christians, Americans have made to this country. Um, a lot of us are living, or many of us in the, in the audience, uh, speakers, we're literally living examples of that today. We don't need to convince ourselves, um, but certainly the more that 
anybody can get that message out, I think is very helpful. Um, but even just as critical is again, when these horrific narratives start circulating, that everybody speaks up and says, this is abhorrent, it's inaccurate and it has to stop. Because what we're finding is not only because we have people in positions of power um, and in the media promulgating these narratives, they so quickly gain steam and are taken as fact. They're no longer, people aren't talking about the white replacement theory only in you know, encrypted platforms anymore or in secret spaces, they're becoming mainstream. So in addition to the counter narratives, we have to take them out of the mainstream because of the nexus to violence um, and, and address them as they're promulgated in each of our communities. And that's hard, right? That's hard. You hear something important, you're so shocked. Um, you don't really know what to do and you stand there with a stricken look on your face. We, we all, and not just this audience, every American has that responsibility because otherwise we're seeing these narrative, narratives lead to acts of violence. Diala, did you want to comment? I, I think you're uh, noting about whose role is it to put out, you know, narratives and questioning whether that's the government's role versus, um, uh, you know, looking to other parts of uh, our institutions and society is, is, is an important one. And I also want to uplift a comment in the chat, um, the, the concern about the enrichment theory um, is it might support the model minority stereotype that is oftentimes used to divide. Um, and I think that's a really important uh, note. I think we, st we have so much work to undo the flaws of the terrorism narrative um, that has really uh, just like stigmatized Muslim communities. And I, 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 I don't know what the best way to, to tackle that is. And I just, you know, and also uplifting your point, if not, certainly not doing anything that entrenches it further. And then maybe this brings us back to our conversation about why Muslims are foreign terrorists, even when they're homegrown, right? Allegedly, um, or what the, to use to use parlance of the FBI. Um, whereas whether white white supremacist violence is inherently domestic. Um, and, and that's not just a narrative problem, of course. Um, certain investigative tools are unleashed um, that can't be unleashed when it's a uh, foreign terrorist organization as opposed to a domestic terrorist organization. So it's not really an, an, you know, an, an, just an abstract or a narrative discussion. And I really would uh, want to uplift Shireen, Professor Shireen Sinar, who is a professor at Stanford Law School, who's been doing a lot of thinking and writing um, on this particular question of really challenging um, why we're talking about domestic terrorism versus foreign terrorism. Uh, if I can pivot a little bit, uh, but still remain connected to the to the subject at hand, Samantha, the administration has uh, promised and, and in some areas has done a really good job in terms of diversifying the workforce, uh, particularly in the national security sector and other agencies. What has the department done in this area and how far do you, do you think it still has to go uh, in terms of representation, credible representation? Uh, you know, at the end of the day, people are policy. And all too often we look at these spaces and uh, affected communities are, are, are still not represented in the middle or senior tier of, of these agencies. Uh, you know, there's been some great movements in some regards, but wanted to get your thoughts a little bit about uh, how you see it and, and what still needs to happen. Um, I'll speak from the DHS perspective, and I think I'm, I can speak on behalf of the administration on this. Increasing equity um, and diversity in our workforce is a core priority. Um, so uh, at the department, um, the secretary is deeply focused on that. And through the Domestic Policy Council and broader other initiatives at the White House, that's a core focus for the administration in general. But increasing equity and increasing diversity is not just a focus for us on the personnel side. And I don't want to discount that. I will tell you, I am lucky to work alongside um, some incredible uh, Muslim American colleagues, many of, of them you know well, but across the um, equity and diversity spectrum, we, we have work to do and we're committed to that work. In addition to that, it is a core priority for the department um, to just ensure that we have equity across our resources. And I realized that for the Muslim community and for other communities that um, were 
suffer the unintended consequences of previous CVE, CVE efforts, it's going to take time for all of you to trust us enough to take resources from us. So I, I get that. I hope that we can get there. But among our you know, tens of millions of dollars in grant funding for hardening facilities, getting, getting cameras, putting up, um, doing risk vulnerability assessments, engaging in prevention work, um, we are really, really focused on increasing equity across um, the full range of, of our grants. And again, I know it's gonna take some work for us all to get there, but we need grants to go to people that need them the most. <laughs> and um, members of um, various communities are very uh, used to applying for grants um, and aware of the grant opportunities. We wanna ensure that all communities are aware of the opportunities and also feel comfortable applying. So that's a really big focus for me over the next year and I hope we can work on it together. You guys are still on mute. Go ahead now. All right. Uh, I have one last question from the audience. The question is, we'd like to know how we look at our groups work collabor collaboratively with local authorities with vandalism and other hate crimes. If it isn't reported as a hate crime, even events issues really get pushed up. However, later it is found. I'm really sorry. I can't. I can't make. I think you get the gist. Under reporting the hate crimes. Under reporting something worse has happened to you. I'll keep track of issues that occur at our places of worship. Why recommendations do you? What recommendations do you have to the community and how to help best support these organizations when issues arise or even before? Um, so I think that was one question. <laughs> <laughs> I'll make it I'll yeah. make it brief, but um so as I articulated, our whole approach in the prevention space is focused on engaging at the community level. And so we have these regional prevention coordinators all around the country. We want to ensure that they're engaging with individuals across the country when incidents like this arise. Um, we call them RPCs, but um the hate crime reporting is a key piece, but when there are matters that are affecting you and your communities, affecting your safety, um, we wanna make sure that they're addressed and that the full local prevention network is involved to make sure that all of you are staying safe. So um, I would love to introduce our, our team to folks that are on this call um, through MPAC or otherwise to ensure that there's, that there's that point of contact for when these incidents occur so that we can work together to address them. And of course, work together to try to prevent them from occurring in the first place. Thank you. Diala? I, uh, I'm not sure I have much, uh, I wasn't fully understanding the question maybe, but if it is about the problem or whether hate crimes as a framework is maybe a way to address a lot of this. Um, you know, I think that's a really interesting point and that has been a lot of the primary response. Um, and, you know, there's a lot of short, uh shortcomings with the hate crimes framework it you know it's not uh it's it's sort of post facto usually it's like after you've already been harmed and then what it does is maybe uh increase uh your sentence or increase punishment um as a model versus you know the preventative one that Samantha is really underscoring here um i i really want to uh, underscore, uh, and I feel like I'm plugging her twice now on a panel, which is always a good sign. Shirin Sinar, Professor Shirin Sinar, has also written an article about this <laughs> that I can circulate to the audience after this call. Um, and I think she kind of gets into this in more detail in terms of how to look at the differences of hate crime versus terrorism frameworks. I think uh, as, as we close, we as a community have to ask ourselves <laughs> the question, is prevention a worthwhile endeavor or not? Uh, do we need violence prevention programs? And if the answer is yes, then we have to work uh, on coming up with ideas, uh, suggestions in terms of policy, but always make sure that there's a demarcation, a separation, a wall of separation between intervention in terms of social services, public health, mental health, religious counselors, community leaders on the one hand, and government and law enforcement on the other hand. <laughs> Um, that seems to me is where the conversation is, is, has been going for the last 10 years. We haven't come to a resolution on it, 
but it is important that we continue working uh, on the prevention space uh, while ensuring that civil liberties are upheld uh, in any program. And I think as Diala ha has been talking, it reminds us of the words of Benjamin Franklin that you cannot have temporal safety with the suspension of civil liberties. If you do that, you deserve neither. So uh, with that, I thank both of you, uh, Diala Sh uh, Shamis uh, of the Center for Constitutional Rights, the great work that they've done uh, and what you're doing right now for our country and Assistant uh, Secretary uh, Samantha Vinograd. Uh, I think as, as you were talking before, you were the first uh, US official to call the Muslim community after the Buffalo incident. I think this is immediately after you took your post. You are the first US official to call the Muslim community and ask them, are you okay? And, and that means a lot to us uh, as a partner uh, in this. And uh, we hope to continue these conversations, these very complex issues with you. Uh, and we appreciate the, the, the effort you've made in reaching out uh, to our community and all communities. And we look forward to working with you in that uh, healthy partnership. No, thank you to our uh, great panelists, to our audience, to you, Salam, for all that you do and MPAC and uh, the other co-hosts of this conference. Look, the midterms are around the corner and our votes do matter, irrespective of what your politics are. If you agree with what our government does and is doing on our behalf, great. If not, we probably should let them know. And the issues are before us, gun violence, access to voting rights, reproductive rights, criminal justice, human rights abroad. How do we feel as an electorate about these issues? And do they represent our interests and our values? What type of policymakers are in power? Are we engaged with them? Do they know about our issues? And are they factoring them into their decision making? So we really hope that this conversation and the, the next conversation, which is going to be focused on international issues, gets you thinking and, and caring about these subjects and moves you to act. Uh, if we don't do it, no one else will do it for us. So I'm going to conclude this conversation. Thank you again to everyone. And assalamu alaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. We're going to take a three-minute break. So for those of you at home, you can get a drink of water, get a cup of coffee, whatever you like. Don't go away. We have some Just don't go amazing away. speakers we coming up. Peter Beinart, Summer Ali, John Feiner in our next panel. We really would like you to, to remain, uh, remain uh, with us in this next important conversation. So we'll take three minutes and we'll be right back. Thank you. Um, thank you for having us. You're in the middle? Yeah, um, you should be. colleague Salama Mariati, president of the Muslim Public Affairs Council. Our next panel is about a subject that's very important to our community, to our country, and the world, which is human rights abroad and the role of the U.S. policy in advancing it. What are the challenges and opportunities facing our government as we seek to tackle some truly difficult issues affecting the world? With us is Peter Beinart, who teaches national reporting and opinion writing at Newmark J, J School in political science at the Cunny Graduate Center. He's also the editor of, at large at Jewish Current. He also has his own newsletter on Substack called the Beinart Notebook. Uh, we are so thrilled to have him given the national platform that he has on important issues, particularly the Arab-Israeli conflict, the question of Palestinian rights, and U.S.-Israeli relations, among many other topics. But this is traditionally, and every poll backs it up, 
a key issue of the Muslim community. Uh, with us also is a, a great friend of mine and, and, a, and an incredible intellectual, is Samar Ali. Samar Ali uh, is at Vanderbilt's political science and law faculty member and is a research professor with over 14 years of experience in international relations and legal practice. She's also the CEO of Millions of Conversations, which is a nonprofit dedicated to uniting Americans in these polarizing times around common values or shared futures by fostering dialogue among those who hold different views. Imagine that. And I know that she's a proud Palestinian Syrian American with an incredible personal story so we're really thrilled to have you both here for this important conversation. And I, I wanted to just kick us off here, if, if you don't mind. Uh, and I'll start with you, Peter. You know, we're living in these polarizing times and the United States is facing some very difficult issues abroad. Vladimir Putin and Russia invaded Ukraine. And we have one of the biggest security challenges perhaps facing Europe uh, since the end of World War II. For those of us who are advocating for human rights abroad and for a principled, values-driven U.S. policy, how should our government approach these trade-offs in terms of leaning in in support of Arab democracy, leaning in in support of Palestinian rights, leaning in in terms of uh, engaging whether it's the Indian government or the Chinese government on their own uh, human rights violations, just in terms of the macro picture what, what should be the guiding principles of how we approach these difficult, challenging, at time contradictory issues? I guess one principle that comes to mind for me is the, is the Hippocratic oath, do no harm, right? It seems to me that um, the first thing that we should look at is America's direct role in providing arms and support mm -hmm. to regimes that then use that arm, those arms and support to oppress people, right? There are horrific, horrific things that are done by America's adversaries that we should publicly oppose, denounce, even impose sanctions on. Um, but our resources there are limited. Uh, in, um, in, 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 Ch in China, in Russia, the terrible human rights abuses that are taking place are not being done with American money or American provided weapons. So our, our resources are more limited. I think the, 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 the lower hanging fruit, honestly, is there are the places where there are human rights abuses that are being perpetrated that we are funding through our own taxpayer dollars. So I think that will be one principle. A second principle I think is that interests and democratic ideals, it seems to me come closer together when one thinks in the longer term and they are more sharply at odds in the shorter term. And I understand why presidents, administrations often want to have to think in the longer term. Oh, we need the Saudi oil now because the price of oil is very high. But oftentimes that can be more self-defeating over the longer term. And so when I think about American policy in the Middle East today, right, where what we're doing is pushing for a tighter alliance between uh, Israel, the United Arab Emirates, Bahrain, Saudi Arabia, um, uh, to, to counter Iran, we are actually promoting authoritarianism in all of those different countries, right? One of the, we, what we're doing is we're selling arms to authoritarian regimes in the Middle East. We're helping facilitate Israel, providing surveillance technology to help these dictatorships better spy on their own dissidents. And we're giving Israel a path as Israel further entrenches its fundamentally undemocratic and illiberal control of Palestinian territory, right? And see, it seems to me in the short term, this is good. This can help us get more oil and we can be stronger against Iran. But over the longer term, what impact is that going to have on the relationship between the United States and the populations in these territories, where there is Palestinians who are suffering under Israeli uh, military occupation, uh, uh, or whether it's Saudis or Emiratis or Bahrainis who are suffering under those tyrannical regimes. So it seems to me one of the things that we need to think about is whether we're hurting our interests in the long term mm -hmm. in an effort to support, help them in the short term. We're going to be hearing later on from Deputy National Security Advisor John Finer about these challenges and 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 these principles. Salam, you know, you and I have spoken quite a bit about what uh, this policy should look like in the region, and I'm always, you know, appreciative of your wise perspective on it. I wonder if you can join us in this conversation and, and ask Peter um, about some of what we're discussing. Well, yeah, I think uh, you know, those of us in the human rights sector, we we always want to advance it. Um, human rights as an agenda in U.S. policy, but there are U.S. interests, and some of them are very short-sighted, uh, 
the ones you outlined before. So how do we continue engaging? Because a lot of the comments I get from the community is, you know, politics is a dirty business. Don't even get involved in it. So they, they remain isolated. And so we, we don't have the numbers um, to, to really work in, in creating that uh, momentum. So what do you say to our communities and our meaning, uh, both of our communities, to continue working for a human rights agenda uh, and, and addressing the realities of US interests? Well, I think that one of the blessings um, uh, of living in the United States is that as though we have a very, very deeply flawed, and I would say even imperiled democracy, we still do have institutions that can be responsive to public opinion when people really uh, um, when people really mobilize. I mean, the anti-apartheid movement, for instance, the United States government had no interest in ending its long-standing alliance with South Africa. Um, the United States considered the African National Congress and Nelson Mandela terrorist organizations. It only looked at that issue through a one-dimensional prism. South Africa is on our side in the Cold War, therefore they serve our interests. But it was a mass, it was moral leadership from Black South Africans combined with a massive movement of Americans across a variety of different communities that actually dramatically changed the politics over the course, particularly of the 1980s. And so, excuse me, Jews and Muslims, both of whom many of us in our own family histories have the experience of living under oppressive regimes, should recognize how incredibly valuable it is to live in a country where actually our voices can be expressed. And also that by expressing those voices, we actually strengthen those democratic institutions and make them more resilient so they can better sustain the threats that they're, fa being, they're facing from within. Here, here. So you're, 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 you're nodding your head and, and, and I wanna invite you to co comment on, on what you're hearing, but also, you know, those of us who genuinely, well, we think of ourselves as genuinely caring about human rights. We try. Um, and you're looking around in the world and it seems to be in trouble in many places. Um, how do we maintain attention on these issues and mobilize people for action despite what's in front of us, which is, hey, gas prices, the economy, inflation, uh, in, some kind, in some cases, even unsavory alliances that seem to be needed in this moment in time. Uh, so I, I, I wanna hear your Yeah, well, I think Peter actually just outlined that. I'm gonna answer that, but I first wanna say thank you. I wanna say so far they come to everybody. Um, it's oh, truly an honor to be here with you in this hybrid event. I wish I was there in person. Um, and it's so good, it's so good to see friends here. Um, and uh, so thank you for inviting me. I'm very proud to be with you um, here today. Um, and I would say, you know, I really think well, we have to go back to basics. And Peter was talking about this as well. Who have you ever met that says, I want to live in an, under an oppressive regime of where my rights are taken away from me, of where I don't have freedom, of where I'm living um, under a corrupt system that um, steals from me and, is, and then is dishonest, and that's the way I want to live. Have, have you ever heard that? Have you ever, have you ever met anybody that said that to you, that that's what they want? Um, so I think that what we need to do in terms of the narrative are talk about values and principles that people can relate to across the world um, and show and prove that they work. And this gets to Peter's point uh, with regards to consistency, which I'm going to talk about. I just want to talk about that and add on to some of his points in a moment. But just to boil it down to these simple points, we're talking about freedom and justice. And that includes... And I just want to make sure you can hear me because you're frozen. Can I do a check? Check. Okay, great. Thank you. I just want to say, kind of going back to freedom and justice. These are key values and points. And that includes freedom from corruption. We are seeing a global corruption problem right now. Um, and also fairness and honesty and, and talking about those values and those principles and hard work that relates to everybody, every human being. And that's when we talk about human rights, one of the first, the key end of that first word, which is human, human rights. And, and that brings me to this point of you simply cannot have national security without human rights. And I realized this more than ever when I worked in the White House with John Feiner. This became so clear to me. We mustn't politicize or weaponize our national security apparatus. 
and say that one comes before the other. No, they need each other. They're in sync with each other. And that includes the surveillance of activists, by the way. We have to stand up and we have to say no to that because that is in violation of human rights. And that violation leads to an insecure um, security system. And so that goes about back to values-based policies that are domestic and foreign, both domestic and foreign policies in the United States must be rooted in our values that are in alignment with our democratic principles. That's what being a democracy means. If we're not doing that, we're something else. We're not a democracy. So if we're not doing that, what are we? What are we enabling? And the problems never stay outside of our borders. We need consistency across the board and a deep commitment to protection of human rights. And coming back to consistency, and I promise I'll be brief on this, we need consistency and the deep commitment to the protection of human rights defenders. And it, allow, and it follows to all those who oppose the authoritarian regimes that destroy human rights and that apply and that particularly right now applies to the war against Russia. And yes, we won't always get this right, as many make this point. Inconsistency and even hypocrisy at moments are bound to happen when humans are involved. But we must admit this when it happens, not be in denial or cover it up. And also the degrees in which this happens along with how often must be taken into account. We must be honest with ourselves when it seems that it has effectively become our policy, we have ultimately lost our way. And the cost of that is deadly and generational. And I don't need to continue to give too many more examples of this other than to say, look at what happened in the Iraq war, at the beginning of this century, and the torture memos, and the drone strikes, and the Patriot Act, and the lack of accountability for the killing of US journalists and other journalists like Khashoggi and Shireen. And I think that one of the questions we need to be asking ourselves is if, we have effectively been living under the Kissinger doctrine for US foreign policy for the past half century. And if so, does it work for us as a nation and a democracy moving forward? And of course we should discuss, has it ever worked for us? One of the things we were talking about before the panel is if, when we are engaging US officials, like we're gonna be engaging in a little while, uh, somebody from the administration and the National Security Council, they, they, they uh, sometimes comment on how personally they're, um, they're really uh, challenged in terms of addressing these uh, the human suffering in the region um, and feeling they can't do anything about it. Um, so how, how do you, how do you deal with that? You know, in, in engaging U.S. officials. You know, demanding that they do what's morally uh, upright, uh, but at the same time dealing with what I what we see is a national security apparatus that has prevented uh, us from really moving forward on a human rights agenda. So there's a there's a story that I I, I sometimes think about that supposedly happened in 2008 when um, Barack Obama was asked a question at an event. He was a he was a candidate, and someone from the audience who was Jewish said to him, you know. Uh, um, we, I, I, I'm a Jew, and I, I really oppose American policy towards Israel because I think the United States is subsidizing uh, oppression of Palestinians, and I, I want you to change that policy. And um, Obama then quoted a conversation that Franklin Roosevelt had had uh, with, with the famous uh, Black labor leader A. Philip Randolph when Al A. Philip Randolph said he wanted Franklin Roosevelt to desegregate the U.S. government, and Roosevelt said something along the lines of, put 10,000 people on the White House lawn and make me do it, which was mm -hmm. essentially, this. I think what Obama was thinking is, I would do that. I agree with you, but I'm a politician, right? Mm -hmm. And so I live within certain constraints. It is your job to change those constraints. And I have to say, one of the things that I, is for me, it feels tragic uh, as a Jew is that we in the Jewish community uh, have not been able to change the politics in our community in order to change the political incentives that even someone I think like Barack Obama, who I think more than any other president, perhaps with maybe except for Jimmy Carter, actually did have a genuine, I think, understanding and empathy for Palestinians. And he was still very, very constrained. And probably the answer is that we can't do it. Jews, we uh, progressive Jews can't do it alone. It has to be a coalition, a broad coalition, which includes Palestinian Americans, Muslim Americans, Americans in general of goodwill. But, Politicians respond to incentive. Government officials respond to incentives. Maybe they will stick their necks out a little bit, 
But ultimately, we have to get them out of the box that they're in by changing the political dynamics that we're mm -hmm. in, they're, that, that they're in. And I, so I think that's ultimately what the great movements in American history, whether it's the civil rights movement, or the labor movement, or the women's movement, the anti-Vietnam, LGBT, you know, rights movement, though, that's what they've ultimately done. Can I just follow up just a, a digression here? Because I wanted to ask Peter just a personal question. Uh, you're, you said you're involved in the progressive mm -hmm. uh, side of, of this issue, but yet you're an Orthodox Jew. Um, and I find that fascinating mm -hmm. because I think we, in, you know, in the Muslim community, when we think about progressive mm -hmm. issues, that somehow we have to liberalize our religion mm -hmm. to be involved mm -hmm. in progressive mm -hmm. issues. Mm -hmm. why, why is it important that we remain to our orthodoxy, if you will, mm -hmm. or um, authenticity in terms of our faiths while working on pro progressive issues? So that's complicated. So first of all, I would say I do go to an Orthodox synagogue. I think that I'm going to put the, what it means to be Orthodox is a theolo set of theological questions that I'm going to put aside for the for the time being. Um, I also don't want to suggest that that being an Orthodox mm -hmm. Jew is the only way of being an authentic Jew. I think uh, many different people in our community, as I imagine among Muslims in every community, have different authentic ways of relating to one's own tradition. I would say that um, um, the I think that the value to me of engaging deeply and seriously with Jewish texts um, is that they can offer um, answers about the way one lives. And they also offer a competing perspective that takes one out sometimes of the dominant culture that exists in the United States in 2022, which has some wonderful features in some of it, but sometimes it's very valuable to hear a dissenting voice and also to be able to feel connected to a, a long tradition that connects you to things that are not just of the here and now. I also think it's very, very valuable to have a religious tradition that impose certain restraints. Um, mm -hmm. We in some ways live in a society where you know, a lot of restraints have been exploded. In some ways that's really good, but I actually also think the discipline of certain restraints whether it's, it's prayer or certain kind of restrictions on how one lives one's life, having a day of rest is, is profoundly important. I do think it's important to acknowledge that as I read Jewish texts, and I, I can't speak for, for Muslim texts, or, but there are radically different voices in those texts. There are voices that speak in the most profound terms about human dignity, and there are also voices that speak in very chauvinistic and frankly, even bigoted and even very violent terms. So I would not say that I speak, that, that my progressive ideals, the, the centrality of the idea of human dignity is the only or authentic voice in Judaism. It's the voice in Judaism that speaks to me, the one that I want to magnify, and the one that I try to remind others in my community when is sometimes lost, right? That, that the first people created, according to Torah, are not Jews, right? Adam, Eve, Noah, according to our tradition, those are not Jews. These are universal human beings. And the fact that they precede the story of the Jewish people tells us something very profound in our tradition. Yeah, and I didn't mean to say yeah. that. No, no, no. It's that, okay. that one group is only uh, yeah. authentic. But, no, I know you didn't. didn't. But the issue of authenticity yeah. uh, coming towards the issue of Palestine Israel is important for both of our communities. Yes, know, yes, right? yes. And I think that one of the things that, I mean, I want to go too long. I think one of the things that at its best, Jew, American Jews have been able to show, uh, including Orthodox Jews, that one can live a very rigorously religious life according to a quite rigorous religious law and also participate fully, you know, uh, and I think Joe Lieberman represented this. I don't uh, like his politics on Israel-Palestine at all, but he was, a, I think, a beautiful model of how someone can live that life. And it seems to me that, especially for people who have legally driven religious traditions, it's really, really important to send the message that those two things are possible. Yeah. And, and as you said, and I think the same thing in Islamic tradition, before religion was revealed to us, human dignity was the most important right. value that God was delivering uh, to our messengers, right. whether it's Adam and Eve or right. Noah and right. so on and so forth. So I think there, that commonality is important. Anyway, I'm off my religion. <laughs> uh, Fox. I just wanted to get it off my chest. I wanted to hear what what Peter had to say, I, said, oh, I think it's fascinating. That. So back to you, Wow. So, so drilling down a little bit, uh, <laughs> Samar, you know, as someone with uh, fam familial as well as um, uh, professional connections to both Syria and Palestine, uh, how and where does the struggle for Palestinian and Syrian liberation intersect? Are there mutually exclusive aspects to these struggles? Hmm. More specifically, there's a perception that opposing the brutality of Assad may somehow undermine Palestinian rights. Is this true? 
Why and how did this perception emerge? And how can we overcome it? Well, I think we know how it emerged. So I'm, I mean, if we have more time, I can get into that. So I, I think we, I think most people know how it emerged and why it emerged. If you're, if you're um, broadly familiar with Middle East history and politics of the 20th century, but what I would say is that I think that that is a very dangerous and short-term view to think that they're at odds with each other. They are not at odds with each other. And I think you've all three already um, spoken about why they're not at odds with each other. And that goes back to the bottom line. And that is, it comes down to what are people, individuals, communities um, asking for? They're asking for human rights. It goes back to dignity which our you've talked about the importance of, um, of religious teachings. And I know that it's an all Abrahamic faith is about dignity. Um, it's about freedom. It's about peace. And I should say peace, positive peace, not negative peace, which is faux peace, real positive peace. And I'm speaking to you today from Nashville, Tennessee. So in addition to being Palestinian, Syrian, and Muslim American, I'm also a Southerner. And I grew up in a post-Confederate town called Waverly, Tennessee. And I'll tell you, and it was in, and for way too, for, for um, too many decades, too many seconds, um, it was under Jim, it lived under Jim Crow law. And we learned, as we've seen um, in Brown versus Board of, Educa of Education in this country, separate can never mean equal. And equal is at the heart of what we're talking about when we talk about freedom, when we talk about justice, when we talk about fairness, when we talk about the potential to live life in the ways that we dream about for ourselves and for our children. And I, and having worked as a mediator um, and where I first met you uh, on the Syrian conflict and meeting everyday Syrians going through the most painful civil war, where people were trying to figure out is how do we find a way forward where we can be quote unquote normal? And how was that normal defined? What did that mean? And anytime it meant, how can I enjoy my life and be free of this strife and this pain and this injustice of, of where I can feel equal in my home country and, and not oppressed, going back to Peter's point about oppression. And the same thing with regards to Palestinians too, both Palestinians living in the West Bank and Gaza and um, inside Israel, um, inside, inside 48, inside the boundaries of 40, 1948. Um, and people are saying, how, how can I have the same chance at life as my neighbor has? And so everybody here that we're talking about and with regards to everyday Palestinians, everyday Syrians are asking for the same thing. And that gets to that narrative and to the piece about civil society and the role of civil society too. And which President Obama and Peter had a similar conversation directly with President Obama, where he said exactly what you just said, exactly that. He said, there's only so far I can go as a politician. And I'll just say this, there's a great line if you've seen the movie Selma, um, where there's a, um, in, the, in the Oval Office between Lyndon B. Johnson and Martin Luther King, uh, where M L Lyndon B. Johnson says to MLK, I need you to do your job. I need more protesters. Bring me more protesters. The more you put pressure on me, the more I will be able to do. You do your job, I'll do mine. Excellent, thank you for that. Uh, Summer, we have a question from our viewing audience. Uh, the question is, I'm an international human rights lawyer. Do you think the average American still struggles with understanding human rights? I find that civil rights and constitutional rights are more widely understood than human rights in the USA interested to hear your thoughts. Absolutely, this gets back to what was first question to me and that's on narrative. Narrative matters um, more than, it, narrative matters for us more than ever right now. Um, and we have to figure out how to communicate in a complex um, environment. What I mean by complex is hybrid, online and offline. Um, and different, different languages, like different words are being used to describe the same thing. So we need to figure out how to speak to everyday Americans in a way that's consistent with values and principles that we all share. So how did human rights connect to the Bill of Rights, for example? These are, that's the getting back to the constitution. Um, and so, yes, I mean, so oftentimes, for example, I will say, which happens to be the truth, I work at the intersection of human rights, national security and economic development. Many times people will scratch their heads when I say that. 
Um, and then I will go on to explain what that means exactly and where you can't have national security without human rights. And we can't talk about these things in a vacuum. People wanna feel safe. I just came from this panel, thank you all for accommodating me, where we were talking about um, public safety and gun violence in America. We can't talk about gun violence without talking about public safety. We need to be able to talk about safety. What is national security about? It's also about making people feel safe. How do you make people feel safe in part that relates to respecting their human rights? And then um, I wanna ask both of you, how, how do we navigate this very difficult terrain politically? You know, when those of us who are on the pro-Palestinian side are being accused of anti-Semitism, you know, there's several issues involving the ADL coming out uh, and equating anti-Semitism with anti-Zionism, uh, even singling out some of our organizations. Yet we're supposed to be working together uh, in dealing with the security threat to our houses of worship and our communities uh, and so on and so forth. How do we navigate uh, that issue? I mean, do we even, do we agree with this equation? Is anti-Zionism as an ideology that may, I mean, clearly has impacted adversely the indigenous Palestinian population? equating it distinctively and always with anti-Semitism. Mm -hmm. is, is that the right approach? And if not, what's a better way to go about it? I would say that when one talks about Israel-Palestine, one has to always keep in mind, a conversation, hold a conversation about anti-Semitism in, in one hand and a conversation about anti-Palestinian bigotry in the other, right? We, if one doesn't even acknowledge that there is such a thing as anti-Palestinian bigotry, we don't even really have this term anti-Palestinianism, then what essentially one does is one suggests that Palestinian rights and dignity don't really matter, right? I mean, in the West Bank, Palestinians and, and, and Israeli Jews live under a completely different legal system where Jews have full freedom of movement, due process, citizenship, the right to vote. Palestinians have none of those things. This is a form of, and it's actually just being renewed. There was a vote yesterday in the Israeli Knesset to renew it again, right? This is a profound form of institutionalized bigotry, at least as profound as Jim Crow in the South in the United States, right? So this is anti-Palestinian bigotry. So if we're gonna be, if we're gonna, we, if we wanna hold people to a high standard of, of not being anti-Semitic, because of course we should, we should hold them to an equally high standard of not being anti-Palestinian bigots. And, and the reason it's important to hold these things together, right? is that if a Palestinian is anti-Zionist, right? Which is not very surprising if you are a Palestinian, right? Even if you are a Jew who believes that Zionism was a national liberation movement that was a blessing for the Jewish people because it created a state that would protect Jews in the wake of the Holocaust. You can still understand very understandably that, the, that for Palestinians, the impact of this movement to create a state that would privilege Jews over them led to the expulsion of half of the Palestinian population in 1948, led to Palestinian citizens living under military law until 1966, and now living has Palestinians living under blockade and under Israeli military law. Why should Palestinians be Zionists, right? <laughs> so then the question is, why are what is their what what do Palestinians want? If Palestinians are anti-Zionist because they want Jews exterminated or subjugated, then they may very well be anti-Zionist and anti-Semitic. I think Hamas's initial charter in 1988 was an anti-Zionist, anti-Semitic document. On the other hand, if Palestinians are anti-Zionist because they say we want to live alongside you with equality under the law. How can that possibly be bigotry? I mean, it's an Orwellian statement to say that it is an act of bigotry to say you want equality under the law, you want everyone to be treated equally. Mm -hmm. So that's the important question. And similarly, if someone is a Zion, someone supports a Jewish state, we also should ask them, do you believe that Palestinians deserve to be treated equally? Do you believe it's okay to discriminate against Palestinians? Those people should also be asked to ask that, ask that question. And right now, we essentially, that question is almost virtually not asked at all in Washington. Can you tell us about the conference you're attending in Germany? Yeah, I don't want to go into too long, but you know, Germany is a place where perhaps for obvious historical reasons, speaking about Palestinian rights and, and criticism Extremely because of the way in which anti Semitism is used in Germany are called hijacking. We, the, to, to, to misuse Semitism, um, given the history of it, right? This term has immense power, it should have power. Because 
is what has been done to our people. And therefore, we should speak about it reverently um, to be fighting anti-Semitism as part of all people. Because what's wrong about anti-Semitism fundamentally is not, the, is not that bigotry was done to Jews, but that bigotry was done to any people. And so any effort that ends up using anti-Semitism to perpetuate bigotry against any other people, it seems to me, is fundamentally in contradiction to the tradition that we should be supporting. Summer, did you want to respond to the initial question as well? Um, sure, and I, I was cutting out the second half was just cutting out just a little bit, but I got I think I got enough. And I, I would just say, read what Herzl wrote. I think when I speak to people um, who want to comment on this, oftentimes I'll ask them, "Did you read what Herzl wrote in the late 1800s when there was the rise of anti-Semitism in Europe and his vision for Zionism?" And actually, in his writings, he talked about their importance for equality, and he did not talk about separate ever being equal. He never, he never referred to that doctrine, which was quite active at the time in the United States and was out there as a form. And so when people even talk about Zionism, I want to understand how they're defining it. Um, and I would also go back to um, state saying that uh, everyone should be anti, everybody should be fighting against anti-Semitism. And, and I know there are a lot of movements around the world and here um, that are doing that. And we should not ever conflate the two. It's very dangerous to conflate the two um, for, for many reasons because anti-Semitism is real. And we do have to come together and focus our resources on defeating anti-Semitism. And, and if we're declaring anti-Zionism as equal to anti-Semitism, this is just wrong and we have to push back on it. It paints large swaths of political opinions on political issues as blanket hatred of a people based on their religion, which is undeniably wrong. And this goes back to my other point with, um, I, think, I think that what I would actually talk about is what I think we're having, and I'm hearing more and more the conversation around in Washington being is around what I call neo-Zionism. As I don't think that this practice of what people are referring to as Zionism right now is what Herzl ever wrote about and envisioned um, when, he, when he wrote the first book on Zionism, on modern day Zionism. Uh, says, I have Jewish friends who feel they cannot publicly protest Israeli policy because they will be blacklisted and not allowed to visit relatives in Israel. American Palestinians say they are marked as anti-Semitic here in the US and it affects their jobs, their political careers or any kind of political ambition for that matter. Does this not prevent protests in the US which we need to push for change? Back to your, your point that we need to pressure the uh, public officials to make them uh, act yet there, there's always this threat um, uh, under people that want uh, to create that kind of change. It's, um, it's it, it, it makes me both, it's, for me, it's both tragic and infuriating to see how many people of goodwill, Palestinians above all, but others as well, feel so afraid of actually just trying to apply their own basic values, the same values they would have for the United States or for any other country, which is the belief in equality under the law. And, and feel inhibited by speaking out about that because they feel that members that there's some in my community who may who, who may um, you know may call them anti-Semitic. Um, and it seems to me part of the reason that I write about these things myself is as a Jew is because I feel like I have in some small way some responsibility to try to make it easier for those people, people of goodwill, if they really believe in equality under the law, to not be have to be ashamed or afraid of actually saying that that's what they believe in. Um, and um, I think the, you know, the 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 challenge, um, the the challenge for 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 people who support Palestinian rights, I think in, in in particular, is to try to create more opportunities for people to humanize Palestinians who've been so deeply, deeply dehumanized, so deeply dehumanized in the discourse that I think often people don't even realize how deep the dehumanization goes. And that's why I think it's so important to say in the specific, it's so important that Rashida Tlaib be reelected. Um, uh, Rashida Tlaib has been, you know, I think in a 
singular way, someone who's been able to put a human face on the Palestinian experience at the, in, in Congress in a way that nobody else has done. And it worries me a great deal that there's going to be a huge effort to defeat her, um, to try to silence the one person who can speak from that intimate personal experience about what it means to be a Palestinian. And that's why I desperate, deeply, deeply hope that American Jews of goodwill who believe in equality will support her and, and, and try to kind of show that this is not, um, uh, ultimately, it's not in the best interest, it seems to me, of Israeli Jews or Jews at all to, to continue a process of dehumanization. A process of dehumanization ultimately only produces hatred and violence, it seems to me, that hurts everybody. That, that, yeah, I just wanted to, no, I just I wanted to add one thing. Can I add one thing? Yes, please. Yeah, I just wanted to say about, and I think there's a word here to be used and that's to criminalization of the Palestinian identity. And I think that we have to be very careful not to criminalize an identity. And that's what many Palestinians feel um, and uh, myself at times included. And, and, I'll, and, I'll, and I'll tell you that um, um, people who have worked with me have told me that people have whispered to them, be careful about working with her. She's not a nice person, except, well, some people will say that, but, and they say, but <laughs> they said, but she's Palestinian. She can't help it. She, you know, we know she was born that way, but if you have, if you have interest in having a political career, even being associated with working with a Palestinian American could be career suicide for you. Um, and that was made more than once. And so it's just even we have to be able to have a conversation as human beings around the subject and it's extremely painful. Um, and I'll tell you this too, when I was elected student body president at Vanderbilt University, um, uh, when I was 20 years old, um, people said, people were because some people were even saying, and somebody ran a, a newspaper ad about this that just simply assumed and stated because she's Palestinian, she's anti-Semitic. That is, not only ridiculous, that's painful, especially when it's an assault on your value system. I wanted to connect the last panel with this panel in terms of counterterrorism policy and national security. You know, we complain about what the Chinese are doing to the Uyghurs. We complain about what's happening now to Indian Muslims uh, by the Hindutva, Hindutva movement uh, and so on and so forth. Yet, they are using U.S. counterterrorism, the U.S. counterterrorism playbook. You identify a group uh, as a group of terrorists, you suspend international law and uh, civil rights law, um, and you can do what you want to do with them. And to a large extent, that's what's been done to the Palestinians. They're violent, they're extremists, and, and therefore they, they don't deserve uh, human rights uh, to begin with. Um, how how do we address counterterrorism policy that is so slanted um, in terms of you know dealing with only one region and, and not applying it uh, to ourselves um, in terms of having uh, a consistent policy on human rights? I mean, I think the truth is that the term terrorism itself is is for so many people in the United States, particularly after 9/11, so deeply saturated with religious associations, um, that it's very, very difficult to use the term at all, I think, in an objective and neutral way. Generally, when people ask, you know, uh, if you ask people, and, and I think it's better not to use the term at all, frankly. If, you, if someone is using violence against civilians, which I believe is always wrong, say they're using violence against civilians. If using violence for a political aim, say that, right? It seems to me that's a much more neutral way of, of, of talking about it. I guess the only other point I would make is, one of the things that I think we've seen in American history that is very, very dangerous is that when America uh, creates a geopolitical conflict with a certain nation or a certain nations that have particular religious or racial or ethnic categories, um, the people in the United States who get associated with that foreign adversary often get crushed. You can go back to, to German Americans during World War I, to the Japanese, um, uh, I don't need to tell this audience about, you know, about how much Muslim Americans have suffered from this. And I, I think that it is very, very important that we, that as we move towards a kind of a new Cold War with China, and obviously China does some horrific things, starting with, with what it's doing in Xinjiang and continuing with Hong Kong and many, many other things. It's a brutally repressive government. We should talk about that. But when you create a sense of paranoia, the Chinese are about to take over. 
They're, they're, they're about to destroy us. This kind of language we now see more and more. It is not a coincidence that now we're seeing a rise in anti-Asian hate crimes all over the United States. And I think we have to be very, very careful about that. I think that we saw after 9-11 the way in which American foreign policy was used to victimize a group of people in the United States. And I worry that we could be on the verge of another cycle like that uh, uh, with Chinese and, and other Asian Americans. Mm -hmm. Summer, you have the last word. Oh, no, I just was going to say, I absolutely share that concern, and we're seeing that um, violence in the name of. I think that's exactly the language that we should use, um, and it comes back to just to hone in on the point that I've been making consistently, and going back to that point about consistency, um, is it comes back to what are, our, what are our values? What are our principles as a democracy? We're feeling tensions right now between democracy and authoritarianism. We're on the side of democracy for a reason, not just because we were born into it. Some of us were born into it, some of us sought it. But here we are, and we need to not assume that people who live in places of authoritarianism agree with that, but they're looking to us to demonstrate solutions that work, that are consistent, that, uh, that are rooted in values and principles. We have to, back to somebody's question, we have to model solutions at home that are consistent with these values and principles that can be replicated the world over. There is, there are to, because of the fourth industrial revolution that we're currently living in right now, in this state, online, offline, the role of technology, things have, and, and just how the workforce has shifted and changed. Uh, so we have all these workforce development movements happening around the United States right now. People, the, the world is in flux. People are looking for solutions and they want to say, who, which, which system makes sense. And one thing that turns, the fastest thing that will turn people off is going to be hypocrisy. It's going to be systematic inconsistencies. And so we have to be truthful at our, we can't only use words, our actions matter, our actions count. And people will respect us so much more when we admit our mistakes because you can do that in a democracy. And that's also what the First Amendment is for too, to allow us the freedom to talk about these things and to do this. And, and that gives people hope. So I think I'll just say this last point to tie into Peter's point just a minute ago as well. As we see this, we're all talking about US and China. We're all talking about US and Russia right now. It's everywhere. And, and we, as we talk about the rise of China this century, people are debating, is this China's century? Is it the US and China's century? Whose century is it? I think we have to be very careful in the rhetoric that we use. Words matter. We want to be thoughtful in how we talk about the tensions between the US and China. And we wanna learn from our past, especially from the past 20 years during the war on terror. What language was not helpful? What language drove us more apart, intensified the polarization in our country? What lessons have we learned? What does our way forward look like? And how can that way forward be anchored in our values and principles as a democracy? Show, don't tell. That's, that's really well said. And I, I really want to thank you, Samara and Peter, for, for thought-provoking and, and just such a uh, well-grounded uh, yet realistic conversation about this subject. Very so rich. thank you so much for joining us. Yep. And we would love to have you back at a, at a, at a future convening. Thank you so we'll much. Meet you in New York. <laughs> I like that. Thank you. Great. Thank you. So for our audience, we're going to now get started very quickly with our next panel in exactly 60 seconds with Deputy National Security Advisor John Finer. Hello, everyone, and we're back. I'm Wael Zayat, CEO of Engage with Salam al-Mariyati, President of the Muslim Public Affairs Council. We are so thrilled to uh, join, uh, be joined by uh, distinguished Deputy National Security Advisor, John Finer. Uh, John Finer is a deeply experienced journalist as well as US diplomat. He currently serves as a Deputy National Security Advisor. He previously served as a Chief of Staff of former Secretary of State John Kerry. Uh, I had the pleasure of working with John in the Obama administration, where we really tried to tackle some of the most difficult issues facing our country, particularly in the Arab and the, and the Muslim world. John, just want to make, do a cons check to make sure you're hearing us and you're good to go. 
I hear you very well. Can you hear me? Yes. Yes, Great. we can. Uh, thank you so much for being with us, John, and, and, and we know that you're uh, you know, dealing with a lot of issues uh, that the administration and our nation is confronting, so we'll get right into it. Uh, I want to give you an opportunity to say a few words if you would like, and then we can get into a q and if, if you would like that, or we could go into the questions. It's, it's up to you. Okay. Uh, first of all, thanks, uh, Wael, and thanks, Salam, and thanks to everybody for uh, being here. Maybe I'll just say a few things to, to sort of frame how, how we look at these issues, and then obviously happy to talk about whatever's on, on your mind. Um, I guess to start out with, uh, the Biden administration came in with one big advantage on human rights issues and one significant disadvantage. The big advantage, and I don't mean this as a political statement, is that we had pretty small shoes to fill when it came to an uh, international human rights agenda. Uh, not our predecessor's uh, strong suit, uh, certainly in our view. But the disadvantage is that fundamentally we had a big hole uh, to dig out of on this uh, set of issues and a lot of work to do uh, right off the bat. So, so what has that work looked like? First, I think the way we see it is we just had to reset the foundation of our work on this set of issues. And that meant reversing uh, policies that we strongly disagreed with, both on policy grounds and to some extent even on, on moral grounds in some cases. And these were things like uh, the travel ban uh, and a, a refugee admissions cap uh, that was just unconscionably low at a time of a global migration crisis. It meant things like rejoining uh, the Human Rights Council, which we uh, did last October, and publishing a, a racial equity EO. Just a number of steps that we took to put a foundation under our uh, human rights work and, and advocacy in, in the world and essentially re-enter the conversation. Uh, second, we had to change the tone. Uh, and I think here, you know, it'd be hard to imagine a starker difference uh, from one president uh, to another, but you have uh, President Biden talking about human rights from the very beginning as being at the center of our foreign policy. Now you can debate the degree to which uh, we have made good on that. We believe that we have. Uh, but talking about human rights in that way frames the issue uh, with this particular priority that we think was just critically important and lacking uh, in recent years. This is also part of uh, the way that the president has framed his entire worldview as being on some level a clash uh, between democracies and autocracies, uh, a frame uh, that had led us to host uh, the first democracy summit. Uh, last year, where we put this set of issues, uh, including human rights, uh, really front and center uh, with, with much of, of the world that cares about and values these sorts of things. Uh, it's part of why we published the first strategy on countering uh, corruption also last December, and uh, part of why we just talk about these things in a fundamentally different way. Uh, third, it can't also just be talk, uh, and we know that that is uh, very much the case. And so in, in some ways, the hardest part of the agenda is integrating human rights into all of our foreign policy work. That is what it means to put human rights front and center uh, at our of our agenda. And we do this both because it's the right thing uh, to do. I don't think anybody would dispute uh, that statement, but also because we believe fundamentally that it's in our interest uh, to do that. Uh, and we believe that countries that share our values or that are moving in the direction of, of kind of greater sharing of our values make better partners and that those that violate our values fundamentally or are moving in the wrong uh, direction uh, just frankly, they're not going to be as good partners in addressing the big problems uh, the world faces. And so this is why we have uh, taken a number of steps that I know we'll get into in the actual conversation uh, on issues like Xinjiang, on uh, uh, Russia and, and Ukraine, uh, focusing on the human rights dimension of that conflict, on uh, issues like the entities listing of the NSO group and going after transnational oppression, uh, both through our regulatory system and our criminal justice system, uh, and a much longer list of, of examples that I can give you. Last point I'll make, uh, we talk often about trade-offs in this context. I suspect you'll ask me about some of these trade-offs. I'm not going to reject totally the idea that there are trade-offs in this space. Sometimes uh, that is undeniable, and while you and I uh, wrestled with uh, some of these uh, very much so during uh, our time in, in government, your, your previous stint in government. But I also think that the way the president sees this actually is fundamentally there is not a pure trade-off between pursuing human rights objectives and pursuing other foreign policy objectives, between our interests and our values. I think what he would say if he were here is that our values are fundamentally in the interest of the United States, and, and advancing those values is fundamentally in our uh, interest. Uh, we also, I think, don't agree with the critique we sometimes get and have gotten as recently as, as this week in the context of some decisions we've made 
uh, that engagement with difficult partners, engagement with partners who do not uh, fundamentally respect human rights to the degree we want them to, is a reward for those partners or lets them off the hook. First and foremost, it's our opportunity to actually raise these issues most directly. But second, uh, countries have an alternative to engaging with the United States, an alternative to partnering uh, with the United States. And when you talk about kind of major country alternatives, for the most part, you were talking about countries that are going to be far less respecting of and far less promoting of uh, human rights, democracy, anti-corruption, all these issues that I've just been describing, uh, countries like Russia and China. And so uh, if the United States does leave a vacuum with our engagement, other countries will fill that vacuum. We've seen them do that. We see them doing that in real time uh, today. And so that's part of why we believe broadly in engagement, you know, even with difficult countries. So I will uh, maybe stop there. And sorry for talking a bit longer than I intended. No, really appreciate it. So it's okay with you. I'll, I'll get yeah. into the first question. Go ahead. Um, no, I appreciate that, uh, John. And, 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 you know, looking at what the administration is confronting right now domestically, internationally, I do not envy your job or that of your colleagues. Drilling down a little bit into specifics here. Um, we're looking at a set of countries right now that are particularly concerned, whether it is Egypt, Saudi Arabia, but also supposedly the world's largest democracy, India, where there's various degrees of, 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 of problematic behavior by the governments vis-a-vis -vis the civil rights of their citizens. India, 200 million Muslims right now, we feel, and, and many observers believe, are at the precipice of perhaps a genocide given the policies of the Modi government and the ruling party. Whether you want to call them trade-offs or, or other, other pressing priorities, how is the administration grappling this? Let's, let's keep it on India a little bit. At a time where we, we are dealing with, with a rising China, we need international support on Ukraine. Are we having these conversations with the Modi government on some of these laws that have been passed, the rhetoric that's coming out of their, their own political circles? What are they saying and what are we doing or prepared to do to, to, to support those values that, that you just said are in our national interest? Right, thanks. So I'll, I'll maybe reference uh, the countries that you just mentioned, obviously, including uh, in India in, in response. And so, look, uh, I am you know, going to be clear that India is a very close partner of the United States, uh, has been for quite some time. And actually, that's a pretty bipartisan uh, a, a relationship that's that's uh, been strengthened and advanced over a, a few decades uh, now. One of the few areas in which our, our foreign policy has not actually veered all that much uh, in different directions as we've uh, shifted from Democratic to Republican administrations. And that is a strategic uh, relationship. It is also, uh, I think we would make the case, very much based on on values, on, on the fact, uh, obviously, that India is the largest, most populous democracy in the world. That is not to say, by any stretch of the imagination, that we don't have some fundamental differences uh, on issues of, of governance uh, with India, including differences uh, that, that we raise. You know, the United States has been a global champion in promoting and defending freedom of religion uh, and freedom of belief uh, for all people. That is a vital piece of our overall efforts to advance uh, human rights. I think you all uh, know, everybody at this conference knows uh, that we have named uh, Rashad Hussein as our, our first ambassador at large, uh, first Muslim American ambassador at large uh, for national religious freedom. We're very close with Rashad here uh, at the White House, also uh, in the Obama administration. And I want to point out that on India specifically, just last week, uh, Secretary Blinken rolled out the latest version of the International Religious Freedom Report. And at that rollout, he said uh, both that India is home to a great diversity of faiths, which is undeniably uh, true, uh, but also that we've seen rising attacks on people and places of worship and expressed concern about that. Rashad also, in some follow-up comments, expressed concern about government officials' uh, awareness of and, and uh, failure to take action against those sorts of attacks. Uh, so this is an issue that we uh, talk about bilaterally uh, with the Indians. Uh, e even if it is not always uh, the first thing that we talk about in our public remarks about India, but it is also something that we talk about publicly when we talk about India. And the International Religious Freedom Report is a, is a good example of this. So again, this is a, a good example of where I sort of started, or where I guess I ended my opening remarks, which this is a big, complicated strategic relationship. We have security issues with Indians. We have economic issues with Indians. We also have human rights issues that we raise uh, with our fellow uh, democracy. 
And we don't shy away from doing that just because of these other uh, issues that we're trying to advance. I could do Saudi Arabia and Egypt too, but I feel like I talked for a long time on India, so I want to give you a chance to have something else if you'd rather. I mean, since you mentioned Saudi Arabia, and, and again, the relationship is it's complicated, it's not clear cut or simple, but you know, uh, we're hearing that the president has made a decision to uh, to meet with MBS. Uh, candidate Biden had a lot of choice words to say about uh, the crown prince uh, following the, the very gruesome uh, kidnapping and, and killing of, of uh, Jamal, Jamal Khashoggi. Yeah. Uh, and, and it's something that still is 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 shocking, even when we reflect upon it. What's the what's the reason behind the, this perceived turnabout, and and what assurances do we all have that business will not continue as usual with the Saudi government, and just to kind of ignore and forget this horrific and many other episodes, even though the United States is uh, a close ally of, of the Saudi government, and it, particularly because we are. Uh, what can we do to not only keep the memory, but also seek some real justice and change in behavior over the long, over the short, or if not, the long term? So I'll say a few things in response to this. First and, and, and foremost, I think all of us in, in this administration were, were shocked, were appalled, were outraged by the murder of Jamal Khashoggi. We don't shy away from that. President was very clear about it. Uh, back before he he took office, because obviously it took place in a, in a different administration, and that fundamental view has not changed, uh, uh, will not change. Second, I think you know, <laughs> you were catching me with this question at a slightly uh, awkward time, because we have not announced uh, any sort of travel uh, to Saudi Arabia or any sort of meeting uh, with Mohammed bin Salman. So I won't uh, uh, take this opportunity to, to speak to a, a meeting that at this point is just notional and hypothetical and in the press, but not uh, something that we have confirmed or are ready uh, uh, to confirm. What I will say, though, is, um, you know, fundamentally, I, I think we have taken an approach to Saudi Arabia in this administration that has kept faith with uh, how the president views issues of human rights and foreign policy in the way that I described. We came to office and uh, we took a report that had begun under the previous administration, but that had not been published about what actually happened uh, in the Khashoggi killing, and we put it out publicly. We didn't have to do that. There was no requirement uh, that we do that. The president made the decision to do that. We knew that would not exactly make things easier or more comfortable uh, with our, our Saudi partners. Second, uh, we put into place uh, this Khashoggi ban, visa ban, essentially, for people who uh, perpetrate or um, uh, uh, commit acts of transnational repression along the lines of what was perpetrated against uh, Jamal uh, Khashoggi, uh, which we think was an important step. And we've actually you know, uh, designated people under, under that ban. We put sanctions in place uh, related to the killing of, of Jamal uh, Khashoggi, which we think uh, was also quite important. And, and I would say without characterizing the relationship up till now, uh, you know, th this has certainly not been from the perspective of the Saudis, and, and they will be the first ones to tell you this, uh, exactly a, a situation of a warm embrace by our administration. We have worked with them uh, on issues of mutual interest, and we have significant issues of, of mutual interest. And, you know, while you know these uh, better than I do, uh, but they range from, from security uh, uh, issues uh, and, and to, to things like economic uh, issues and, and obviously energy is where uh, people often come back. So we have worked with the Saudis on that, but I don't think you could find a Saudi official to give you an interview who would say that uh, this has been a totally business as usual relationship uh, with the Saudis up till now, and I think that's why. Now, what have been the results of this? Because I think that's also uh, quite important to point out. And I'll, and I'll just mention one of them that has real human rights implications. We are now in the uh, second 60-day period of a ceasefire in the Yemen conflict, one that has gone on uh, far too long, uh, and just a horrible uh, situation uh, for the people of Yemen and really for the people of, of the region, uh, food insecurity uh, and, and death and destruction for you know years dating back to a while when you served in, in government with me. Now, I'm not saying that this conflict is over or that this couldn't backslide, but we are now in a situation where for the first time really since the beginning, we have an extended period of calm where humanitarian uh, relief supplies are getting in, where the full, uh, fuel and food crises are being a bit abated. And some of that, I'm not going to say all of it, but some of that relates to our ability to engage a difficult partner in spite of our differences when it's in our interest to do so, and, and that's Saudi Arabia. I have a question that may sound rudimentary, but there's some fundamentals that we have to 
uh, address. Uh, and I'll give you an illustration. I was at a conference in the Middle East and they had uh, President Zelensky come and speak uh, over Zoom. And um, I was with some US officials and they were, con they were quite curious that the audience wasn't that enthusiastic as uh, they had expected them to be. And I was trying to explain to them that, you know, while the US is supporting the Ukraine and is against uh, invasion and, and aggression, uh, the people in the region feel that they've been victims of European invasion, you know, from 100 years ago, of colonialism, of so many wars uh, in the region. And, and what struck me, it's not about the policy issue per se, but what struck me is that I felt that the level of acumen uh, of the sentiment of the people by these U.S. officials is, is at an all-time low. In my 30 years working with the U.S. government, I, I, I would think that the level of understanding would be increasing uh, in these past few years, but it seems that they did not get it. They, they are not connecting with the sentiment of the Muslim peoples. How can we work with you to improve, increase that level uh, of understanding so, uh, so that uh, our policies are more educated uh, from, uh, from that standpoint, so that we have uh, a, a better way of connecting with the in both so uh Salam, i want to make sure you guys can still hear me because i i you cut out at the end of your comments can you hear me yes we can hear you oh okay good all right so look it's a it's a really good question um, and I think uh, one of the things that we have learned as we have gone around the world engaging on Russia and Ukraine is that uh, while it can feel sometimes uh, when we're talking to our European partners in particular, and even when we are talking to some of our uh, East Asian allies who've gotten kind of more involved and invested in the Russia-Ukraine conflict than we might have expected, uh, like we are in this community of like-minded people with a very clear kind of right and wrong and a perpetrator and a victim. Uh, when it comes to this conflict, that is not uh, as clear cut of view in much of the rest of the world. And by the way, I don't think that's just limited uh, to much of uh, what you guys refer to as the Muslim world. I think that is true, you know, in many parts of our own hemisphere, uh, here in the Western Hemisphere. I think that is true in, in large uh, swaths of, of Africa as well. Uh, and we cannot take for granted uh, as much, again, as it is very clear to us that we are and Ukraine is on the right side of this conflict, that, that is exactly how the rest of the world will see it. Now, why is that? Uh, and what can we do about it? For one thing, I think Russia, and, and, and I think you all know this, is extremely effective at putting out its own uh, narrative, uh, what we would often consider to be disinformation. You know, for example, claiming that the food insecurity crisis or high energy prices are actually the result of U.S. sanctions, as opposed to as a result of a conflict that has taken you know, enormous uh, food production off the market and significant energy supplies uh, off the market. Uh, and so that is an area that we need to do a better job of pushing back on and, and fighting against. But Russia is, is effective in, in that space. I think there is some inherent distrust of U.S. policy. I think that is something that we wrestle with, you know, going back quite some time. And so when the U.S. US is out at the, the head of a, a coalition making the case uh, that what we're doing is right and what others are doing is wrong, there are going to be uh, uh, views uh, that will sort of knee-jerk react to the contrary of that, and that is going to be the case almost no matter what we're advocating for. But we need to understand that that's going to be the case and be ready uh, to take it on, take those arguments on, on, on the merits. Uh, and then I will acknowledge that I think there are some people that see the great lengths that the United States is going to to support and help Ukraine and believe that there is a degree of disparate treatment. That we have not done that same thing for other populations, and they will read into those decisions, uh, you know, uh, all sorts of, of kind of nefarious intentions for why people were not maybe helping populations that are more that are more like uh, whoever the person is who's making this judgment. And I think that is something that we have to be aware of. It's something we were acutely aware of when we established uh, the program to try to help Ukrainians who had fled to, to third countries, uh, given uh, you know, some of the issues we face at our own border with migration, some of the issues that we dealt with in the aftermath of the drawdown 
uh, from Afghanistan on migration, where, by the way, we did bring uh, 75,000 Afghans, uh, more than 75,000 now, into the United States. But this disparate treatment, you know, going the extra mile for Ukrainians, but not for every population on Earth. And by the way, we I think we have very good reasons for why we have done as much as we have on Ukraine. But I think that's another piece of this uh, argument that we have to do a better job of explaining and taking into account. I have a follow-up question to that. How can we be of help? Uh, you know, when President Obama first took office, he went to speak to Muslims, except he had to go to Istanbul and Cairo to talk to Muslims, even though American Muslims are, you know, literally in his backyard from the White House. And he waited until the last six months of his eighth year uh, as president to finally meet with American Muslims. We don't want to make the same mistake uh, with this administration. And we feel that we have a lot to offer uh, in terms of uh, in, improving the understanding and engaging and raising awareness of why these issues are important, not just to the American Muslim community, but to U.S. interests uh, as a whole. How can we be of help in moving the, the dialogue and engagement forward? Uh, thank you again for that, that question. Uh, let me start by saying <laughs> I hope we don't wait uh, that long for the president to engage uh, these communities, uh, although I do uh, hope, God willing, we do get eight years, uh, although you know, too, too early to tell on, on, on that. Um, I'm very grateful that you all invited me to come here and talk about these things. You know, they're not the easiest issues that we've got on our foreign policy uh, agenda, but we do think that we have, uh, if not a case that everyone will agree with, a, a case that is coherent, that is defensible, that we feel very comfortable uh, putting out publicly, describing and engaging, e even in a, in a sort of spirited debate about it. So some of this is just creating a forum, like the one that you created uh, with this conference, Having people like me, although I uh, hopefully could do a bit better next time and get the president or somebody else to come in and talk to you, uh, but, but people like us who work on these issues come in and explain where we're coming from. I think that will help break down uh, some of the barriers, whatever barriers there are uh, that exist, because I think it is not lost on us that this is an incredibly important constituency for this president, uh, an incredibly important community in, in the United States, and one that has an acute and intense interest in some of the policy uh, areas that we spend the most time on and the, that are the most challenging uh, for us, both to, to make good decisions, but also to explain them. Uh, so we also welcome, in that regard, really in good faith, uh, your feedback on the substance, on how we talk about these things. Uh, and it doesn't have to be in a big venue like this. Uh, you know, you know that we're also open to, to smaller uh, exchanges when things come up uh, along the way. Uh, thank you, John, so much for taking the time to join us. We literally just scratched the surface here in terms of the issues that the community prioritizes and cares about. We really uh, want to take you up on the offer in terms of having various uh, ways of engaging with the administration, uh, small groups, big groups, public private and, and bringing the right interlocutors, the credible interlocutors from our very diverse communities to have these conversations. So I wanna thank you uh, for taking the time to join us. I wanna thank our audience for their participation and their questions. We really look forward to continuing this dialogue with you. Thank, thank you very much, Mr. Pine. We really appreciate your participation and engagement and we look forward to continuing the dialogue with you and the administration. Thank you both, really good to be with you and uh, appreciate the invitation. Thank you. Thank you, John. I want to thank uh, Wiles Ayat to uh, engage for bringing Mr. Feiner and, and many of our panelists. And also just want to end thank you too. Uh, to support the Million Muslim Vote campaign. I think there's a launch coming up Thursday. You know, we, we keep talking about these issues. And as was stated repeatedly, unless we make it into an issue and, and force our public officials to take a stand on, on them, it's not going to happen. If, if not us, then nobody will do it. Absolutely. Support the Million Muslim Vote campaign. and. I want to thank uh, all of our uh, co-sponsors for, for this wonderful inaugural conference. Thank you so much, everyone. Uh, we're going to have concluding remarks for this incredible conference in just a minute. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Mohammed Abdul Kader, founder and, co and principal of Radio Global Advisory. I'm also a board member for the Muslim Public Affairs Council. I'm happy to be, be with you all today. Thank you all for tuning in. This has been such a great day. Great to connect with everyone. I'm so excited to see all these organizations from around the country doing great work and really engaging their communities. January 21st, January 20th, excuse me, 1961 was a cold day in Washington, D.C. The temperature was about 20 degrees Fahrenheit, very frigid.
killed in Vietnam in very large numbers and come home in body bags. This war was bloody, was vicious, and seemingly had no end. It was demoralizing for the American public. A global crisis continued with the Soviet Union teetering on nuclear war. Our children would hide under their desks at schools in anticipation of an attack. Here at home, America continued to struggle with the challenges of racism and inequality, prompting African-Americans to protest and engage over and over in sit-in after sit-in, demanding their seat at the table. It was far from a tranquil time in the United States. Later that afternoon of January 20th, 1961, John F. Kennedy took the oath of office to become our nation's 35th president. More than 20,000 people huddled in the cold that morning, that afternoon, on the east side of the US Capitol, just a few blocks from this very building where we're all gathered today. They were there to be part of a historic inauguration. This man who, yes, was part of a political dynasty, had also been looked at with suspicion because of his faith, but he aspired to represent all Americans, regardless of his personal commitment to God. His audience reached far beyond those gathered before him on the mall. There were people listening in from Pittsburgh to Los Angeles, to Austin, to Columbia, South Carolina, and even overseas in Cairo, in London, in Mumbai, and elsewhere. In preparing for this, this historic moment, he sought to both inspire the nation and to send a message, a clear message abroad, signaling the challenges of the Cold War and his hope for peace in this nuclear age. During his speech, President Kennedy created one of the most, most enduring and memorable moments in American history. And Americans, all Americans, to commit themselves to public service and the well-being of the country. Many of us know the quote, and so my fellow Americans, I ask, I ask not what your ask not what your country can do for you, ask what you can do for your country. President Kennedy addressed listeners around the world when he followed up by saying, my fellow citizens of the world, ask not what America can do for you, but what together we can do for the freedom of man. Not only are these words about civic sacrifice and service, they're really about the greater good and also about the fundamental principle that the sum of all of America's parts are great. America is the, is, excuse me, the fundamental perspective that America is greater than the sum of its parts, its people, all of its people, every creed, every color, every race, and from every zip code. I'm gonna cite the words of Joe Kennedy because I feel like they captured this so eloquently. When he referred to this, this idea of service to the country, he said that her crowning achievements are ours to wear when referring to America. Her flaws and failings are ours to bear. The greatness of this country depends on the willingness of all, not just to do our part, but to hold ourselves, our government, our leaders accountable to the promises that we've made to the world. That's the ongoing work of an imperfect union. These words are about our collective action, our collective responsibility, our collective power, and our resilience during challenging times. These challenging times are not something that we have just faced now. But as many of you who have studied history know that history does repeat itself. And these cycles of challenge and resilience continue. Many historians will draw similarities from the turmoil of the 60s to today, the geopolitical challenges, as we've seen with the Russian invasion of Ukraine recently. We're contending with the rise of a more assertive China the continuing racial reckoning here in the United States and continuing conversations about inequality, racial inequality, income inequality, and so on and so forth. And more recently, we're all subjected to the challenges and the scourges, to the scourge of this global climate change will affect every single one of us. It'll affect our food, our water, and our basic human security. Let's not talk about gun violence. In the last few weeks, 
we've seen so many young people, so many young people taken away from us far too early in every corner of the country and without any discrimination. We, as we look at the news, we can find it to be quite discouraging. It can get deflating. It can be depressing to see so many problems. It seems so great. But also to see a political system mired in gridlock. To see public discourse that's gone off the rails and is unproductive. And to see so many Americans disengaged and apathetic about the political process, about basic civic engagement in their communities. So many have given up. But what's given me hope, what's given me great hope, is in every corner of the country, we've seen people doing work in their communities, hand in hand, across community boundaries, across religious lines, across racial lines, with partners, with allies, to bring about the change that we all wish to see. They're all working towards the communities that we all want, where everyone feels like they have a seat at the table with dignity, with safety. Today, You've heard from experts from several amazing organizations who work in every corner of this, these United States. And they're working on your behalf, the American people. And they're working on the disparities in our healthcare system and innovative efforts to bring about better wellness outcomes for all Americans, not just for the Muslim community. You've heard about the dangers of racism and bigotry facing our communities. And you've heard from experts who are working to combat that. You've heard rich, rich conversations about justice and human rights and organizing in an inclusive way on the ground to make sure that everyone has their voice. We've heard from folks working on more representation in the census so our schools can be pro properly funded, so our streets can be properly maintained, so our water system can be taken care of in a way that serves all communities equitably and fairly. You can learn more about these organizations in the link that will be dropped in the chat boxes. So make sure to check that out. I'm sure you'll be impressed. I'm sure you'll be excited to see what they do and I hope you'll get involved. These folks are leading at every level. The leadership is not easy. And I wanna dig into that a little bit. We've glorified leadership in our textbooks and in our films. Leadership really involves long hours, very difficult decisions, and often intense sacrifice that no one person or organization should have to bear alone. Each and every one of you, each and every one of us, can be a part of this effort by supporting these organizations and others to help America realize her aspiration, her ongoing aspiration of becoming a more perfect union, where all pieces of this mosaic are integrated and are integral to the whole picture's richness. This is our history. And this was the intent of our founding fathers. We see it on our coins, on our currency. We see it on the seal of the United States, our motto, e pluribus unum, out of many, we are one. So don't worry, this isn't a fundraising pitch, although if you do want to make a gift, I'm sure uh, several of the folks in the room here today and online would very much welcome your financial support because it is critical to keeping the lights on, to hiring the best talent and to retain that talent and make sure they are supported as they represent us. I hope that you'll continue to support the organizations that you heard from here today with your time, with your talent, with your treasure, but with your, also with your ideas and with your mind and with your voice. Reach out to your elected representatives because that's on your shoulders as well. That's on all of our shoulders as Americans to participate in the democratic process by reaching out to our elective representatives, not just here in Washington, DC, but in your local communities and in your state capitals. And I'm talking about your city council members, your school board members, your local sheriff, every single person that is elected that represents our communities, reach out to them, engage with them, let them know who you are and let them know you care and what issues will make a difference in your life. Stay engaged in voting, not just every four years in the presidential election that dominates our TV coverage, but in every boring state and local and midterm election because they matter too. And those decisions at a local level affect all of our lives. They affect the curriculum in our kids' schools, to the cleanliness of the water that we drink, to the cleanliness of the air that we breathe. 
that process is fundamental to our well-being and it's our responsibility to engage in it, all aspects of it, holistically. I wanna come back to President Kennedy's timeless words. Ask not what your country can do for you, ask what you can do for your country. This country has given all of us so much with all of its blemishes and imperfections. This imperfect union has given us all so much and so many opportunities. We are a part of this fabric. It's our responsibility to engage with it and make that imperfect union realize its vision of serving all of its people. We mustn't take it for granted. We mustn't take our democracy for granted. Recent events have shown that that's a reality that we have to all contend with as Americans. This is a work in progress. We must all together work for this imperfect union every single day. Thank you so much. I wish you all. Well.